Well, first of all, welcome to Castrea online and on site, and it's really great to have you here. Uh, and I will just talk a little bit about the event, some housekeeping rules, and you know, just introduce what we will be doing in the next two days. Um, and then we will just start with the program. Uh, for, for technical purposes, this thing is recording and the sound, it, it only gets sound from this side. So if you want to ask a question, just wait for me to turn it to you uh, because it is a directional sound. So the event is called Responsible Content Technologies uh, 2023 because we have been organizing this for the last uh, well, basically three years since 2021. And uh, so this is the welcoming speech. I will just welcome you and eat us uh, very briefly. So welcome, but also I will introduce you uh, some facts about ethos. Uh, I will briefly talk about our project called QTech uh, at ethos. Uh, I will go over the program uh, for Rescue Team 2023 and some housekeeping rules. And if you have any questions or if you want to send me your slides, I you know, just use my email address. So, it in figures. Uh, we have an approximate budget of 9 million euros per year uh, with a 50 percent, you know, approximately 50 percent uh, third party funding. Uh, we have almost 40 ongoing projects. The number changes because the projects conclude, some projects start. Uh, there are uh, 135 employees. Approximately 30 PhD students, you know, around uh, people from uh, 20 nations and so on. So, ITAS is a highly uh, international place. Uh, and the tasks and goals of the Institute is uh, to, you know, research into the consequences of new scientific and technological developments and their science based evaluation, analysis of complex interrelationships between technology, science, and society, policy advice, public debate, and advancement of concepts and methodology and methods and methodologies in TA and systems assessment. So the name is rather self-explanatory. It's an Institute for Technology Assessment and Systems Analysis. Um, so we also have a lot of uh, brochures lying around. So if you're interested about ETAS, you can get them. Uh, the idea is problem-oriented research. So we do knowledge for action. You know, value based, uh, scientific independence, claim to excellence. You know, you can all also read this in our uh, very finely printed brochures. Uh, we have some priority topics like data information knowledge, sustainability, transformation of the energy system, mobility, uh, participation and governance, life and technology, which is our group, the life group that we are organizing this event, and vision and ethics. Um, so we have multiple addresses, which this building is one of them, but we also have an office uh, at Berlin at, uh, for the German Bundestag, uh, at Brussels for the European Parliament. Uh, we have connections with several uh, ministries, uh, some federal authorities, some state authorities. So it has is represented on uh, multiple levels. And uh, we are always open to networking and cooperation. And you can see some of the some of the partners we have in local, national, and international levels. Uh, so there are some achievements in recent years. One of them was to organize uh, last year's ETAC, uh, and you know, founding of the Global TA Network, a uh, couple of prizes and awards, and. Uh, yeah, so we are still, we still have uh, some people coming. You can get your name checked. Top has been around since 1990 and the Institute has been around since 1995. So top technically predates our Institute. Um, and at top we have a uh, different kind of, uh, you know, uh, tasks. You know, being a technology radar, pointing out consequences, providing orientation, communicating science, stimulating dialogue, and network. Um, and here is a brief story with us, which also you can find at the foyer uh, downstairs. So there's a really cool uh, you know, picture on the wall with all these in more detail. But primarily, you can see that the Institute has been around for more than uh, well, nearly 30 years. 
uh, and uh, Armin Gurumov has been the Institute of Bad since 1998. And so this is just the brochure that I'm talking about. You can get some, I think, there, and we have some on the outside. Uh, we have, uh, well, apparently it's 11 now. We have 11 research groups uh, on digital technology and societal change, radioactive waste management, research for sustainable energy technologies, life, innovation, health, and technology, which is this group that we are organizing as well. Uh, you know, uh, Castro Transformation Center, Mobility Future, Sustainable Bioeconomy, Philosophy of Engineering, TA and Science, Socio-Technical Energy Future, Socio-Technical Futures and Policies, and uh, we had a great group of Silvanos, which are focusing on uh, forest transformations during climate change. Uh, we also have uh, Tatu, which is our uh, journal. Uh, I, if you are interested in the latest edition or one of the previous editions, you can find some in the foyer. You can just get them. Uh, and there's also, I don't know why. Yeah, you can see it, but there's also a call for papers going on, uh, and the deadline is September, and you can just look at the look at the graph. Uh, we also have Global TA, which I think a lot of you already know, but uh, it is a, a global network of TA uh, organizations and groups. And if you're more interested, you can just ask me during the break, so you can uh, scan this QR. So what about the project? Uh, this, uh, you know, we named it Quantum Technology Innovations for Society, uh, purposefully vague because, uh, you know, we want to do whatever we want. Uh, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, and three main topics that we are focusing are landscaping of the QT ecosystems, education and outreach research in quantum technologies, and you know, conceptual exploration and operationalization for as a research on QT. Um, this has been going on since mid 2021. Uh, I'm the project coordinator and uh, Christopher Kernan, which you will meet today and a lot of you already know him, uh, is the project leader. So we have some publications, uh, one of which is the Democratization of Quantum Technologies, which came out this year. So if you're interested, just uh, I would recommend you to read it. Uh, we have one on patent analysis uh, for quantum technologies, uh, which is which is a kind of a novel uh, methodology. We use some AI assisted classifier tools to actually identify what quantum technologies, which which patents are actually classified in quantum technologies. Uh, we have one on quantum games and interactive tools for education and outreach, uh, which came out uh, last year and. I think tomorrow Marilu will also talk about this beautiful picture, which is the Quantum Jungle Art Exhibition, uh, which also made the cover. And uh, we have the landscape of the Quantum Startup Ecosystem, uh, uh, which also came out last year. And you know, if you're interested, I would strongly, strongly recommend you to read that. And now, uh, oh yeah, and also we organized some events uh, in Karlsruhe uh, as part of the Effecta Festival. So last year uh, we organized a, a public panel uh, with some professors from KIT uh, and Armin Zulumont was the, was the moderator. And uh, we organized this uh, quantum games exhibition at uh, the place called Triangle, which is open to public, you know, people can come and visit and uh, see what's going on with quantum games. Uh, and also we have a call for papers uh, in the journal Nanoethics. So if you're interested in uh, the concept of the second quantum revolution or primarily anything related to quantum technologies, you can just reach out to me or uh, send it directly to Nanoethics by saying that this is for uh, a special collection for quantum technologies. And yeah, last but not least, we have been organizing these events uh, since 2021. You can find the recordings of these events uh, in our YouTube channel. And the, the recordings of this event will also be put on the YouTube channel. So what about the program? 
I will continue blabbing about like for 10 minutes. Uh, and then we will start with our first uh, session on responsible innovation in quantum technologies. I see that all of our speakers are here, which is great. Uh, <laughs> and then we will have a short break. And while that break, we will also have online break rooms so that people can uh, network online as well. Uh, and then we will continue with the research and industry perspectives on responsible innovation and beauty, which will be a panel. And in that panel, uh, you know, the panelists will discuss the, uh, their perspectives on uh, responsible innovation. We will have lunch, which will be here, you know, just, just outside of this room. Uh, so you don't have to leave uh, this place but anyway. If you want to, you can. We are not holding you here hostage, but you know, the yeah. lunch will be free and it's here. So it's up to you. Uh, in the afternoon, we will continue uh, with uh, inclusion education and outreach uh, session, which will be a session that will be talks. Again, it will be followed by a break. There will be a panel on elitism, inclusion, and public good in quantum futures, uh, which will be followed by another panel on interoperability of languages, narratives, and the question of, you know, can we all really understand each other? Uh, some of the speakers for these panels uh, will be online or the panelists, and some of the speakers for the sessions will also be online. So it will be, we hope that it will truly be a hybrid experience. Uh, and in the evening, we will have the conference dinner, which is just, just down this road. So it's three minutes walk. Uh, and then you're of course free. <laughs> Until tomorrow morning. And then in, at tomorrow morning at nine, we start again um, with yet another panel on going wide or going tall, you know, how to responsibly approach the quantum race question, which I'm really curious about. Uh, and then we will have some speakers uh, to, to talk to you about, talk to us about the, the new and emerging topics in quantum technologies, which will be technical talks on uh, quantum thermodynamics, quantum biology, uh, uh, space quantum technologies, QKD. So in this in the session, it will be uh, a little bit technical. Uh, then we will continue with the question of what if we fail? Uh, you know, consequences of failing the efforts in responsible QT and ethics. Uh, again, lunch will be here. And then there will be uh, a session on community-led efforts, which I think are rather uh, important. At least, I think so, because I come from these community-led efforts as well, and there are so many around the globe that you know, just popping up with grassroots movements and certain organizations leading certain communities. Uh, and then we will conclude with um, another session on imaginaries of QT in the public domain, art and science interaction in public technologies. And in the end, uh, we will have a roundup uh, of the second day, and uh, hopefully we will discuss our future plans regarding the 2024 edition of this event and you know, what else we want to do. And some housekeeping rules. So this is an active uh, you know, working place. So if you want to explore the building, please do so quietly because people are working. Um, the, I mean, you already know this, but the entrance door requires uh, some card access. So please inform us if you need to leave the building and plan to come back. Uh, so the presentations are being recorded and will be made public afterwards. So if you don't want to be uh, recorded, just let us know uh, so that we can edit you out. Um, which may be a bit difficult, but, you know, we can manage it. Uh, and for all online participants, you know, please mute yourself when you're not asking questions. Uh, there will be Zoom breakout rooms during the breaks. And please, please, please write to us uh, that if you lose the sound, if you lose the, if you, uh, the visual, and you know, if there are any technical problems. That being said, welcome at Quantum Ethos, which you can see because of the Zoom, but, you know, that uh, and we still have eight minutes. Any questions, any comments, uh, any, uh, you know, additions to what was just said? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, 
My name is Rebecca Coates. I'm very pleased to be here in Charles Zero today and participating in this important workshop. But today I'm going to talk about my research in responsible quantum technologies and my observations on responsible innovation in practice um, before briefly um, discussing the Australian context. So I'm not going to present paper as such or an overview of, of my work and observations. But uh, before I get started on that, I thought I'd briefly introduce myself. I feel like it's important to know where someone's coming from in such an interdisciplinary topic. It helps to understand. Um, so my background and uh, training is in sociology. Um, I was awarded my PhD in uh, 2014 by the University of Queensland. And uh, in 2017, I joined the CSIRO, which is the Commonwealth Industrial um, scientific research organization in Australia. And for the first few years there, I worked as a human research ethics coordinator before moving to a full-time research scientist role last year. Uh, one of the highlights from it over the past, past few years has been contributing to the World Economic Forum on Computing Governance Principles, where I am here. here. Um, and my present research on quantum and responsible innovation can be divided into two areas. So First is empirical research that I do on quantum computing and RI, um, mostly in the area of cybersecurity, where I recently completed a project on the technical and ethical risks of quantum computing for cybersecurity. Um, and this project has grown into uh, a, a, a new piece of work on quantum readiness across Australian sectors. And the aim of that project is to understand um, the Australian ecosystem's level of awareness and preparedness for the impacts of quantum in their sector. Uh, and the other type of work I do is um, theoretical work on quantum ethics, which I'll also talk about later in the presentation. So for those who are familiar with who the CSIRO is, uh, where are you need to go? Oh, sorry. I'll try and talk loud. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Really. Okay, I'll try, and, I'll try and talk a bit louder. Okay. Um, so CSIRO is a unique organisation in Australia. It's independent and federally funded um, and is mandated to be the trusted advisor to the Australian government. It's driven by the motto uh, to solve the greatest challenges to innovative science and technology. Uh, so CSIRO has a long history of scientific innovation and some of its most well-known inventions are uh, fast Wi-Fi, the polymer banknote, extended wear contact lenses and AeroGuard and several others that you can see there on the screen. Okay, <coughs> so it's the Responsible Innovation Future Science platform where I work in the CSIRO that was um, commenced in 2017 and the Future Science platforms are uh, um, targeted programs that have funding specifically on uh, Horizon 3 science and they're really fun to work in because there's no external client pressures and it's just about um, uh, you know, applied science and new, new discoveries. It's, it's really interesting. So the RIFSP as it's commonly known there, has three core innovation areas that guide the direction of its research. One is digital emerging technologies, second environmental scale interventions, and socially responsive genetic technologies. And there's another piece of work that I'm involved in, which is like a fundamental project that focuses specifically on responsible innovation, and that's this one on public perceptions. Um, so this is a longitudinal study where we've been collecting data from the Australian public on what their perceptions of responsible innovation are. And we've used this survey to empirically investigate the factors that contribute to the public perceptions of RI and to build a model of what RI um, looks to the Australian public. And to our knowledge, it's the first data set and model of its kind. And we have a report that uh, you can access on the CSIRO website. So back to quantum. Um, as I mentioned, I recently completed a project where my team and I conducted a survey and interviews with professionals on their understanding of technical and ethical risk of quantum computing uh, to cybersecurity. 
So we measured technical risks using the risks identified in the World Economic Forum uh, Governance Principles document under the cybersecurity theme. And we measured ethical risks using cybersecurity ethics principles identified by a group of Australian researchers. So these researchers led by Paul Formosa, they use a principalist approach and identified um, these principles here that made up uh, what they call the cybersecurity um, ethics. And so we asked participants how concerned were they about quantum computing either breaking a particular ethical principle or how concerned were they about technical risks threatening cybersecurity? And so to, in the interest of time, just to provide a brief summary of what we found, we identified four main themes from the data that was both from the qualitative and the quantitative data um, that are important and significant for their insights. So the first one was around cross-domain deep knowledge. We found that many of the participants either identified in their field that there was a lack of cross-domain deep knowledge, or we identified that through their responses. And usually it was the CISOs, the Chief Information Security Officers, that were most um, ready to identify this lack, and they considered that to be a very big security risk, um, we, we, and also due to a lack of sort of communication between people that were trained in quantum computing and people that were trained in cybersecurity not coming together to address the imminent risks. Uh, and people though were very um, uh, quick to identify that what needed to be done to rectify this, which was targeted awareness, raising and education. Uh, the second um, insight or conclusion was around quantum attacks. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is a sort of a unique finding because I'm pretty sure most people have some sort of prediction about when cryptographic solutions are going to fail. But in our survey, participants thought, most participants thought it would happen within the next five years, which seems quite soon because I'm pretty, I think a lot of the current predictions are a bit longer than five years. Um, and the next one was ethical risks. Unsurprisingly, most of the participants thought that ethical risks were not as important as, te as technical risks, and there was a lack of knowledge about ethical risks. So for a lot of people, they just didn't even consider it, which, you know, I thought that's what I was going to find, but it's good to have the empirical data to support your assumptions. And lastly, uh, multiple barriers. The main barriers um, people identified that may hinder appropriate action were lack of awareness, technical incompatibility, inadequate technology, and insufficient workforce capability. So to link this study back to responsible innovation theory, this project drew on the air dimensions, the anticipation, positive operation, responsiveness, and reflectivity um, approach uh, to guide, okay, thank you, guide the, um, the design of the study and the contact Conduct. We particularly drew on the anticipation dimension, we see with it being, you know, sort of like a foresighting activity. So this project led to the development of my next one on quantum, quantum readiness across Australian sectors. Um, so Australia has had an important time in its quantum technology uh, journey, with the Australian government recently uh, announcing its national quantum strategy. So my current project takes advantage of that, but also draws on the findings from the, original, the first study. Um, and it should help to inform sector stakeholders and hopefully generate higher levels of awareness on what needs to be done by different sectors to be ready for quantum com computing, both in terms of access to technology, but also in terms of readiness for the cyber risks or cyber attacks. So this project, like all my work, it's a collaborative multidisciplinary project working with the Responsible Innovation FSP, Data61, which is like the data science unit at CSIRO, and the Quantum Technologies FSP, which is where all the quantum physicists are. So I'm really excited about this work. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting. We're not going to focus on like every sector, just a few, but these will be further refined because it's only for two years. So 
we um, will have to be targeted. Okay, so moving over to the other aspect of my work, um, which is on the ethics of quantum computing. Um, and while it's, it's sort of separate in the terms of doing this paper, it still informs my empirical work that I just discussed. Um, so drawing on the tradition of applied ethics in this space, I'm working to use responsible innovation theory and concepts to inform my approach on the ethics of quantum computing. So I'm working on a paper on this topic with my colleagues, ethicist David Douglas and quantum physicist Mahalo Appert uh, on an argument that quantum computing ethics uh, should be considered different from AI ethics. So this paper was born from my observations in Australia of a common perception that AI ethics had laid the groundwork or paved the way for quantum ethics and that there need um, to be no difference between the two ethical approaches, according to people who said this. However, in this paper, we argue that there are significant differences between AI technologies and quantum computing that warrant a separate ethics. So I won't go into um, huge detail here because we're yet to publish the manuscript, but I can share the basis of the paper and why I think this is an important topic. So first, as we all know, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, of which quantum is one of the most important and impactful emerging technologies, which will profoundly transform our institutions, industries, individuals, and our whole society, according to Genevieve um, Teraguay. And because of these profound changes, uh, special attention to an ethics of quantum computing is needed to ensure uh, a safe and um, as less risky transition as possible. This goes to my second point, um, why this topic is important, is concerns that over the implementation of quantum computing and these uh, risks um, that could happen if uh, the potential threats are not mitigated and managed, uh, as this could impact on our values, the way of life that we care about in society. Third, um, existing AI ethical principles are still being tested and were designed for AI and not for all types of computing. So there's plenty of AI ethics frameworks out there, but for my perspective and understanding, not very many of them actually, actually being tested and proven to work um, very well. And not to mention, they're not actually made for quantum computers. And fourth, um, a lack of awareness <coughs> makes ethical development of technology difficult. This is a really important point, particularly when we're talking about trying to engage with the public. If there's such a lack of awareness that they're not familiar with their technology or they don't understand it, you're not going to be able to have a meaningful dialogue that would equate to um, uh, I would say like consent, yeah, but, but more than consent, but actual full in, you know, yeah, full consent for society. Um, so having said that, uh, this creates a dilemma of uh, when to act, which is known as like, the Coleridge dilemma in ethics. So um, as Ingolstadt uh, and others writes recently, you can get to the situation where you're just asleep at the wheel because you still don't know what to do. It's a bit complicated. Okay, I've got five minutes. So I'll just go on to my next slide. So the paper is really fun and I'm really enjoying writing it. Um, so responsible innovation in practice. So my empirical work on quantum computing risks and readiness and my theoretical work on quantum computing ethics has been conducted with the guidance of responsible innovation. I've used RI theory in a number of targeted specific ways and no sorts of like hand waviness about putting the theory into practice. I'm actually trying to do it with intent. So the first way I do this is I choose to be deliberate in my use of an RI approach in work, my work. I try to consciously justify to myself and to my colleagues how my interpretation of RI is different from simply doing social science research, which can be a trap people can fall in. They can just go about doing social science research, but call it responsible innovation, um, which is not really the same thing. Maybe the method's the same, but it's different. So second, uh, this deliberate approach meant for my approach to quantum technology does not happen in a silo. Rather than doing a call-in of experts, 
once my research aims and objectives are set. I've worked with my colleagues from cybersecurity, quantum physics and ethics right throughout the research conduct. I believe this is one way that we can enact RI through meaningful engagement or inclusive collaboration um, with our scientists and professionals and other stakeholders in the quantum ecosystem. And so I try to see that term of inclusive deliberation, not something that we use just when we're trying to engage with the public, when we are also engaging with our peers from other disciplines or from other sectors uh, in the quantum ecosystem. And third, in my work, I consider responsible innovation as both a theory and an action. It can be an objective and an outcome at the same time. And by having a non-binary um, duality approach to RI theory, I believe we are able to make the most use of it and in the most practical way. So I learned when I was working as an ethics coordinator that you can have the best ethics guidelines for research, but it would be meaningless unless the people who are actually conducting the science know how to use it. And this is where I think RI comes into play and is able to bridge the gap between ethical principles and guidelines and ethical practice. So whatever your take is on RI, whether you're using a top-down approach, as is more prevalent in Europe, or a more deinstitutionalized institutionalized one-off approach, as I would argue is common in Australia, using responsible innovation in a way that encourages scientists and technologists to consider the societal impact of the technology they are working on, or ask them to ensure ongoing meaningful engagement with stakeholders is vitally essential. I've got two minutes left, so I will um, just very quickly talk about this. So this is the last slide. Uh, I just wanted to point out what where the Australian context is. Um, so I'm really hopeful at the moment with the, um, the Australian position for responsible innovation. So Australia had been lagging behind other OECD nations in terms of their investment in quantum technologies. The federal government, as I said earlier, recently released a national quantum strategy, which is really encouraging. And even more encouraging is the clear identification in one of the themes of the need for a trusted, ethical, and inclusive quantum ecosystem, which they draw on the World Economic Forum governance principles to uh, write that theme. So that, I think, is really great. Um, so, in conclusion, my vision for Australia's quantum technology ecosystem is that we continue to grow our use of responsible innovation as a guide and facilitator of ethical de technology development and use. And so while we're at this crucial stage of quantum development, it's imperative to ask the questions about stakeholder awareness, uh, what the public want and what are the impacts, and to have that dialogue with intent to shape the future development and hope that it will indeed be trusted, ethical and inclusive. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention and um, I take any questions. Okay, so we have one minute, which means we can have one quick question. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering how much you are considering kind of having a a set of guidelines for researchers, both within the sort of quantum cryptography computing sector and outside, in terms of how they can sort of, how they can implement RRI in their proposals in their day to day research, et cetera, et cetera. Like, is that something that you're considering, or is it kind of like a, a broader, more umbrella approach? Uh, it's a good idea. We we don't have that as such yet, but part of my approach to work is I'm trying to um, partner with researchers like in the cybersecurity space, for example, to work with them to develop their own RI practice. Um, but that is something that we should be looking to do. So it is, on, it is sort of on my um, to-do list, I guess to uh, help people do that. But at the moment, we're just trying to work, have the um, quantum future science platform and the RI um, future science platform work, work together. And trying to like, when I'm working with a, a cybersecurity scientist, for example, who hasn't got that experience, um, they're very interested to learn. So just 
working with them so they can then learn what they need to go on a bit further and do more of their own. But we, we use the web principles at the moment. That's, yeah, they're pretty good. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And, you know, thank you. Thank you. So hello everyone, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and also thank you very much for being here and listening to what I have to say. Um, my name is Svento Maynard. And just to give you a brief background, what I'm uh, coming from. So I have a background in future studies, but also in cultural studies and media studies. Uh, so what I'm working on and what I do is I look at visions of emerging technologies and how those visions shape the development of those technologies. Uh, I'm not, I would say I'm fairly new to the field of quantum, but I had the opportunity over the last, uh, let's say a month or two months to dig deeper into this field and also to uh, come in contact with people that work in the field and also share and hear their visions of how the technology might evolve. Um, one of those visions I want to talk about is uh, the visions of the bad actors. I call it the bad actor narrative. And um, Actually, this talks about why I'm puzzled with this narrative, and I hope that maybe I can share my puzzlement with you and uh, you can help me find a solution to that. Um, just so you know, the picture is a depiction of villains from Spider-Man. I took this not because of entanglement, you know, that's not the case. Uh, there is a bigger arc in this one, and you, for those who like comics, we will come back to Spider-Man at the end. Um, and last but not least, this is in collaboration with Peter Remmers. Peter Remmers is a colleague of mine from the Technical University of Berlin, which brings me to my last point I want to make in the introduction. <laughs> I'm working at the AIT, the Austrian Institute of Technology in Vienna, but also at the Technical University of Berlin, where I'm part of the Berlin Ethics Lab, and we look at ethical considerations and ethical implications of new and emerging technology. So, um, what do we find in the realm of uh, and the realm of quantum, and also when talking about ethical considerations of uh, quantum technologies, that is one vision that is circling around the bad actor. Uh, we see it here, there are two uh, blog posts from 2022, one is from Rand Corporation, the other one from Deloitte. Uh, and they're both saying like a large scale quantum computer may eventually be able to quickly break the encryption used to secure today's internet traffic. And the other one over there says quantum computers could be used by hackers in hostile nation states to break existing encryption protocols. So this is a bad, this is a, this is a dystopian vision circulating around quantum technologies. And I would say it's a rather prominent. So to just wrap this up, when I'm talking about bad actors, I'm not talking about uh, this guy over here. What I mean is, <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a while, so. Uh, it, it actually came up as I was Googling bad actors and then, well, they showed me the skip. Anyways, what I'm talking about are in the terminology of cybersecurity, cyber criminals, so uh, hacktivism, but also insiders that come from the business, government state sponsors. So, for example, we talk, think about China um, and also, of course, cyber terrorism. All of these uh, potentialities or potential uh, risks are circulated around the idea of bad actors. And as I said before, uh, I was on several symposiums over the last month. And uh, when I was asking participants, where do you see future pitfalls of uh, uh, quantum technologies? These are usually the answers that I received. So it's a, it's a two-step uh, argumentation. The first argumentation is when talking to researchers that work at the beginning. Uh, it's, they usually say it's too early to say, as we do not have the applications yet. The technology itself is simply still too young to say anything about it. And then usually it's followed by the second argumentation that says, even if there is an application we can anticipate, there are always bad actors that will misuse the technology in ways that is not intended by us, by either the researchers or the developers. So again, what I want, the point I want to make is when talking to people that work in the field of quantum technologies about ethical applications, this is usually the argumentation that comes up. And I'm not talking about specific areas such as quantum ethics or where people that already work on the ethic, uh, ethical considerations of this, but I'm rather talking about something like um, public symposia where people on stage that do have some work to do that have something to do with quantum technology. So this is kind of a, the general uh, public discourse around that. Um, I have a problem with this, and basically I have three problems with this, and I want to go through those problems uh, one by one. 
The first one is that the argumentation is focusing on misuse, but it's not reflecting the intended use of the technology. Um, so my question instead would be, what if the technology works as intended? And with what we know from, uh, for example, uh, STS, or study of technology, uh, science of technologies, no, sorry, uh, study of technologies and science, science and technology studies, I always get it wrong, yeah. sorry. Uh, science and technology studies, what we know is that there are implications of emerging technologies, especially uh, one of them is, for example, a scaling effect. You can think about the car, the car does what it does, it works as it works, but it's also, if everybody's driving a car, it creates something like a traffic jam. So we have to consider what are potential issues when thinking about the scaling effect of quantum technologies. And here, especially talking about quantum internet, quantum cryptography. We could accept that in this vision, there is a necessary evil that we call the bad actor. But then we would also have to accept that when we work on this, we need a solution for that. So how do we deal with the bad actor? One in this storyline of, uh, of the bad actor narrative is the post-quantum cryptography. So we have a technology that's kind of counteracting the cryptography issues that have come up with quantum technology. The question here is, is the problem solved by that? Uh, law professor Jane Van Bauer from Arizona says, no, actually not, because this is just creating an equity problem. So her argumentation basically is that we said that if we rely on something like a post-quantum cryptography as the main source for security, we cannot guarantee that this will also be scalable to everyone, as we have places based on topography, for example, of the Earth, where we cannot implement those technologies. So just as today we have slow internet on some areas, we might have faster internet in other areas. So it's kind of, it's, it becomes a problem to, when thinking about the implementation of this new generation of internet to uh, roll it out globally and to every uh, to, to every participant. So basically it would mean if we follow the idea of the quantum internet here that for some time we might have the problem that we leave out some people and take for granted that they will not be secured under this umbrella of the post quantum cryptography uh, yeah umbrella. Um, so again here this narrative shifts a little bit as we are now thinking about scalability and what potential issues we might encounter when we think about enrolling such a quantum internet. Uh, at, at the end. Um, the second problem that I have with the, uh, with the bad actor narrative is that it actually shifts responsibility. So basically what the bad actor narrative does is the researcher says, well, it's not our responsibility because we are just working at the very, very beginning of this whole chain. So we are just working on the basic research. Uh, we need to look at the applications. So they shift responsibility to the developers. The developers say, well, we are just building the technology. We don't know what it's going to be used for. So they are shifting the responsibility to the users. Um, and at the end, then, of course, there's this mythical figure of the bad actor, of this hacker that might, may or may not use the technology for that. Again, looking into STS, what we know from, for example, uh, Wiener here, um, he asked to have the effects of politics, and he is basically counteracting and bringing arguments against this idea that technology in itself is a neutral technology. He says, in everyday thinking, technologies are seen to be neutral tools, but every given device might be designed and built in such a way that it produces a set of consequences logically and temporarily prior to any of its professed use. It basically, what he says is that technologies create a new framework for a public order, thus they have politics and they can be regarded as, as he says in another part here, uh, as we can, they can be regarded as um, a shift in social power relations. And he brings this example of the bridge that we see here, it's a famous example from SDS. Um, the bridge here was built by Robert Moses, and basically, the bridge is so low that it only allows certain cars to pass. On the other side of the bridge, what you see is it's a bridge somewhere in Long Island in New York, close to New York. Uh, on the other side of the bridge is a beach. And what this bridge allows is that small cars, private cars, which can only be afforded by rich and wealthy people, are allowed to pass. But uh, however, things like public buses, for example, which are usually used by poor and black people, were kept off the roads. So they would not allow to pass. What we see here is that through this technological artifact of the bridge, there's something created that's like, it's, it's, a, a, it's a power dynamic that is created and through this technology. So again, 
where we can say is that new technological artifacts create social dynamics and they enable something for someone, but at the same time, they also disable something for some or for others. Eckridge also uh, seconds that by saying technical objects define a framework of action together with the actors and the space in which they are supposed to act. So this responsibility, uh, the sharing or um, this distribution of responsibility, basically, we can also say the other way around, namely that every time a technology goes or is used by the user, it allows certain or affords certain actions that are, and those actions are already inscribed in technology. This goes not only for the developers, this is not only relevant for the developers, but also for the researchers itself at the very beginning. There are certain values inscribed in technologies, and those values allow certain actions or do not allow others. Um, and I think my problem with this in the context of uh, the bad actor narrative and quantum technology is that the bad actor narrative does not look at that, but rather it does not acknowledge the responsibility that either the researchers or the developer have, but it just passes it on and says, well, it's not my responsibility, it's somebody else. So it's not acknowledged. This is just the point that I want to make at this point. The third problem that I have with the bad actor narrative is that it colonizes the reflection space as it becomes a very prominent and very dominant narrative in the field of ethical reflections on emerging technologies, especially in quantum technologies. Thus, it overshadows other issues. And this brings me back to the talk that we had before from uh, Rebecca, uh, where she was, and I'm here, we are, uh, where you were talking about there is a lack of ethical reflection, and we need to raise awareness on those ethical reflection. Because if we don't do it, then we cannot figure out the questions. We cannot figure out the awareness points that we need to take care of. And there are several, the ones that I'm presenting here, they are debatable and we need to debate them, but they are just here just to make examples. But I think the point that I wanna make is that we have to debate those ethical issues and we have to find places where we can. If we only follow this bad actor narrative, then we do not have those ethical debates because we're saying, yeah, there are bad actors, we know about that, but come on, let's go on, let's do development. So, um, as I said, this, the power of this network vision is basically that it colonizes the reflection space and oversights other issues. And here I come back to the value neutrality thesis of technology. And I want to work here with uh, uh, Herbert Marcuse, who's building on, on, on Max Weber, and who says that technology projects what a society and the interests that dominate the society intend to do with people and with things. And he also says that technical reason and the prevailing social reasons. Uh, technical reason is the prevailing social reason at any given time. Thus, there is no such thing as a neutral technical logic or that technology is very objective and anything. Technology is always, and also the reasoning behind technology is always just a representation of social culture and social values. And we need to be aware of that because those values are sometimes very, very obvious to us. They are so obvious to us that we don't even talk about them. The problem with those values, the social values that we have at the current state, and here I'm talking about things like um, a global pandemic that we just lived through, potential wars that we have in the east of Europe, climate crisis that is knocking on our doors. The problem is that the current values, they curse, they also cause the current crisis. Thank you. Um, thus, we need to critically reflect on the values that we as society have and that we inscribe into quantum technologies if we want to do uh, an ethical reflection on those technologies. Um, the question then is, how can we identify the values and, that are inscribed in those promises? One aspect would be to look, for example, at the beneficiaries of those technologies and what is value to them? What is the so-called customer value promise? Um, McKinsey here, the two reports from 2021-23, what they say is there's mainly on the right, we have Alibaba, Amazon, IBM, Google and Microsoft, so big tech companies that will be beneficiaries from quantum technologies. On the left, in another report, they say the automotive, chemical, and financial industry, they will be the big beneficiaries of quantum technologies. I think this is an interesting point and an important point to make out here. And uh, Joanne Arrow even brings this a step further and connects this to a very, I would say at the moment, a, an, an important point uh, when talking about quantum technologies, as they say, the problem here with quantum technologies is that the technology is centralized at a certain company or a certain point, as for example, Google. 
if you now have two companies that work on quantum technologies for two different reasons. So on the one hand, they bring the example of creating advanced materials on the right. And on the left, you have Zork Finance. I don't know if it actually still exists. However, this is a company representing interest from the financing industry, uh, from the finance industry. So thinking about how to, for example, improve hedge funds and improve investments. And both of these actors are now trying to use the uh, capacities that Google offers or might offer with the quantum technology computer, this basically boils down to the question of funding and money. Who of those actors has more money to use the machine? And uh, they pointed out here that the once material is, is, a, is a, um, a roundabout budget of 41 billion, while hedge fund industry has run about a budget of 3.8 trillion. That's what we can see here that the how uh, the, those actors with the most power, meaning most money, will also be the one that can use the technology. Thus, at the end, one ethical issue that we can see here and that we need to debate is, are we actually developing a technology that will make the rich only richer and that will only foster current trajectories, while at the same time, those current trajectories cause social, environmental, and political challenges for society? And do we not need to rethink quantum technologies? That we not reimagine futures of quantum technologies. Thank you, two minutes. It's great. So, to wrap this up, where I want to go to is again my three problems with the bad actor narrative. The first one is a focus on the question of misuse and ignores the question of use. It shifts the moral burden from the researcher to the developer and to the user and does not acknowledge the responsibility that each of those actors has uh, in brackets. I'm fully aware and I'm not blaming or putting responsibility only on technology developers. I know that doing responsible technology is a work of all participants. We need politicians, stakeholders, developers, et cetera, on board as well. So I'm not only focusing on them. However, what I say is I'm asking for acknowledgement of this responsibility because otherwise we cannot go forward. And last, as I said before, third point, it's this bad actor narrative colonizes ethical rainbow protection, thus creating, as Rebecca, nicely put out, uh, pointed out, uh, creating a lack of ethical reflection. And we now we come back to Spider-Man. Um, I want to see this as kind of empowering statement in the sense of that I want, that I'm asking for acknowledging the responsibility because as uh, <clears throat> Uncle Ben from Peter Parker said, with great power comes great responsibility. We can also turn this around with great responsibility comes great power. So with quantum technology, we have the chance to create a better world, whatever that means, uh, that seeks potential for change. And, and, and with this, it's also an invitation to reimagine the future of quantum technology, to seek potential for change and for making the world a better place that is going beyond the current trajectories that we are already on. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we have uh, time for maybe two questions. And I think it was first Mira. So now, <laughs> this will look at you, but you need to ask your question rather loud. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, Wendell, for the presentation. And um, I think that's a lot to dig into from my talk with dig into, but I just wanted to focus on one clarification. When you are talking of quantum cryptography and also the professor you're referencing, can you elaborate on what they mean by quantum cryptography? Because I think so maybe the commonly accepted sort of definition is that quantum or quantum safe cryptography is actually classical algorithms that are safeguarding our computer, HPC computers against attacks by quantum computers. That's no quantum in there. So the argument of it being inaccessible or it being sort of in inequitable is actually misplaced in that case because it's open source, open source classic algorithms mm -hmm. that are very, you, I mean, you you kind of, you still need cybersecurity knowledge to integrate them, but there's no quantum. So I felt when you were talking about it that there might be some confusion of what's actually meant by uh, quantum cryptography. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for to, I think to ask this question, I would definitely refer you to Jane Bambara and her YouTube talk on that. And she points out several ethical issues with quantum technologies. One of them, as I understand her argumentation is the following that she says, quantum technology allows 
to hack into computers because of the faster uh, calculation power and also hack passwords and also hack uh, privacy da private data, which causes an ethical issue. Uh, the solution for that would be post-quantum cryptography, but in her argumentation, she says that post-quantum cryptography will not be available for everyone, thus we willingly take into account that uh, we will have this one generation of internet where you are safe, and then we have this other generation of internet where you're not safe. That's her argumentation, and I guess you would uh, disagree, and I'm happy to hear more about this. Uh, the and one question from Doug, which should be our final question. Yeah, it's a question of clarification and then maybe an opening for you to say a few things. Um, you should give Uncle Ben some citation marks. You quote oh. Spider-Man, not Uncle Ben, so uh, give, him, <laughs> give him the right quote. Um, about scripting value, um, <laughs> just for Uncle Ben. Um, scripting values into quantum technology, you use this as a kind of key element of, of what you're interested in. Am I right? Yeah. Thing. And you look at um, identifying or articulating benefits and beneficiaries in that scripting. Um, so that was the clarification, so you're nodding. So the question is, um, what about rescripting the values in quantum? Where do you see the locations for doing that? For us, if we're pra practice oriented, action oriented, mm -hmm. which um, locations and forms is a big question on uh, rescripting values, deciding which are the right values for quantum. Um, what is your approach? What, what do you think would be a proactive way of doing that? And well, what? that's a good question. Thank you for that. And also, for, yeah, as, as you said, for giving the opportunity to reflect on that. Um, so the way that I'm currently doing those activities, which, uh, as I said, I'm working at the Technical University in the Berlin Ethics Lab. And what we do there is we work together with developers of AI application. There is a difference, as we have said before, before, there's a difference between quantum and AI, though, but I think from the approaches, it might, it might be the same. It might uh, also help. So um, one approach here would be to first uh, acknowledge responsibility so that we bring actors to the table and that they're willing to, to do and work on this. A second one would be to um, go through scenario developments and think about what potential uh, what the future, what the preferable future of quantum technology we want to see. And then reflecting on those visions of the preferable future, make them not as a goal, but rather as a as a uh, as an object for debating. Deconstruct them, have to do vision assessment and also hermeneutical work as is prominent here at the at the ETAS. Um, maybe also bring in stakeholders. This is what we did with um, in, in the project that I'm working in, that we uh, co-created visions of AI technologies together with several stakeholders from uh, certain fields where the AI will be implemented. This helps, and, and always doing those processes together with the developers. So not doing it solely, because the developers need to interchange, the developers need to come in contact with, and also the other way around, uh, come in contact with the stakeholders so that they can uh, discuss as the, uh, the values at stake and the values at stake. That would be my approach to deal with that. Can I just respond? Uh, maybe in the in uh, the coffee break because we have one question from the online audience, okay. which I also want to accept. And uh, yes, okay, this is from Robert, who will also be a speaker. So, question is: societal values defines bad actors. These values do not currently include rich people getting richer as bad. Can we change that in quantum tech alone, or does it require more general societal uh, changes? Values? Um, I wouldn't say particularly that the first point is true. I didn't see the question again. Because it, basically what I'm looking here is uh, what I'm looking at is the discourse on ethical implications, and this this bad actor narrative is coming up from this discourse. Um, but again, I think the second question is more interesting. Can we change the quantum tech alone? Um, no, but we can change it into quantum tech, and we have to, I would say. Of course, these are uh, bigger issues, but when we talk, I think the vision that I'm 
trying to promote here is that when we are following the promise that quantum technology is a, has a disruptive power, what is the camera? Has a disruptive power and has the power to disrupt society, we need to articulate how this disruption might look like and who will be the beneficiaries at the end after those moments of disruption. Um, yeah, and we have to do this for quantum tech, definitely. I think this would be the proof of the answer. Good, thank you. Thank you. The University of Oxford. Um, great, thank you very much, Natasha, that you're here with us on board. Thank you. Uh, we have next to Natasha, Bart Carstens. He has a background in both AI and history and philosophy of science. He wrote his PhD thesis on the conceptualization of errors and science and is currently affiliated to the Rathenau Institute, meaning what's basically the Dutch Eaters, as I've heard of it. It's uh, in The Hague, and he is a senior researcher on digital society. In this capacity, he studies various topics such as smart cities, digitalization, education, explainability of AI systems, and of course, quantum technology. So, Bart, thank you very much. Uh, next to Bart, we have Jan Trautmann. Jan studied physics at the Heidelberg University, where he focused on quantum mechanics and atom physics. After his master's, he did a PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Göring by Munich under the supervision of Immanuel Bloch. During his PhD, he was working on an experimental quantum simulation of quantum many-body systems with neutral atoms trapped in a laser field. Wow, that's sci-fi, isn't it? <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, in, in February, he joined the Kipu Quantum as quantum algorithm engineer, where they work on bringing quantum advantage to noisy intermediate-scale quantum computing hardware in the near future. That actually is sci-fi. He's responsible for the scalability and hardware integration of their algorithms. Thank you very much, Jan, and welcome to the panel. And last but not least, to the very left, we have uh, Alexandra Beckstein. She is co-founder of High Ventures, a company focused on ecosystem building by providing investment and acceleration of quantum and AI startups. She is leading the investment activities and is also heading the company. In quantum based projects, out of which the company was born, she was responsible for the strategy development as well as building the startup ecosystem. A geoscientist by training with advanced education and business and leadership, she has worked in her professional career for both startups, SMEs and government. She was founder of her own company in Berlin in the field of renewable energy and is author of the book Bossing It, The Future Belongs to the Boat. Uh, she is driving by the conviction that technology is a key to solving many global challenges and that ecosystem must replace the traditional ecosystem. That's a nice statement. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. So, as you can see from the biographies, Zeki did not uh, spare any work to bring us an interesting uh, mix of people to the table, coming from very, very different disciplines like philosophy, also uh, quantum physics, and also in industry. Um, I would, as I said, in the first round, address questions to each one of you specifically based on the uh, things that you sent me before. But this is, of course, an open question. So if anybody of you wants to respond to the answer you heard before, uh, please feel free to do so. I will address my first question to Jan. And uh, would ask you, Jan, so as someone who comes from the development side and the CP, sorry, Entangled in the quantum world. <laughs> it's weird I use this term often, but now it has a different connotation. Uh, where do you where do you uh, where do you the, see the current stage of development and how do you look at the current debates on potential applications or this talk of disruptivity, basically all those visions that are uh, in the discourse at the moment? Do you think those quantum technology futures are overhyped promises or plausible scenarios or both at the same time? What's your take on that? Thank you for this excellent question. So from my perspective, um, we are really early stage of quantum development and quantum technologies. This means for me that we are already know about possible applications, we're already testing them um, in the labs and also um, in various companies and research groups. So we have like small scale problems, we are testing them that could be later when we scale them up relevant for, for industry. Um, but so far, nobody has um, ever 
shown with a quantum computer that it can at the moment outperform um, these, these, these applications um, over classical machines for industry scale size. So we are here also still really early, uh, but nevertheless, we have very fast developments in, in the in, in hardware and also algorithms that I think we will approach um, this usefulness of quantum technologies very soon. However, at the same time, it's not so clear yet in, in which use cases, for example, Miro you know, uh, already mentioned in her talk, like we have several use cases like reaching from life science to um, optimization. It's not so clear yet which of these use cases we will reach um, the, the quantum computing first, or we reach the quantum advantage first. Um, at the same time, this is then also a bit challenging for to address this question of um, disruptivity, because if you don't know yet where we will first have um, a new technology and a quantum advantage for new technologies, it's also really challenging to think about which disruptions and which changes it may bring. At the same point, also as Mira also already said, and as other uh, speakers before, it's also a good thing that we are so early because now we can think about um, what maybe what frameworks we can maybe bring up, and also we can start um, to educate the society um, how changes may come and also what possible possible changes and disruptions may occur. So that's also very good, and maybe you can start this course also now already. With Regards to the discourse and the, the kind of overhypedness, maybe the overhypedness that's currently going on, would you say as a developer coming from the field, is this moment and this hype around quantum, is it more pain or gain? Do you think it's it's something that's it's, do you see it as a good thing or do you see it as a well mm, potentially it's, it's it has both good and bad sides? Uh, one side get a lot which is hype, we get a lot of attention on the field. We can draw investment, we can draw also uh, many talents. We can also um, focus really on research there. At the same point, it also raises expectations. So, for example, the, the general expectation would be that we reach quantum advantage in half a year, and we could not fulfill that, uh, which is also close to impossible. Um, so, yeah, this is also the bad side of it. Um, my next question goes to Natasha. With quantum technologies, Natasha, it seems as if we are at an interesting moment in time. We have EU-funded research on research, uh, responsible research and innovation uh, for the past, I think, more than 20 years now. Um, for example, in the field of AI ethics, we saw how guidelines can be developed and turned into regulations, talking about the AI Act. Uh, one could say that as a society in general and as a specific scientific community, uh, we have lessons learned which we can build up. What do you think, in your opinion, what are the most important takeaways that we learn from other technologies? And I think we also addressed this in the talk that we had, uh, in, the, in the presentation that we had before. Um, are there actually lessons learned that we can take from those technologies and that will they become important in QT? Or do we have a completely new field and we have to relearn everything that we learned? Yeah, and I think, as you said, we've already um, had some really interesting comments on that from, from Rebecca and from Mira about what we can what we can take from these existing emerging technologies. And I think, as Mira pointed out, a lot of the principles um, or a lot of the values are going to remain the same across technologies. And it's more about understanding what those values mean when it's applied to a specific sector, a specific application, or a specific domain of quantum technologies. Um, but I think really that the headline lesson for me from other emerging technologies is that we need to act earlier, and we have the opportunity to act earlier. Um, I mean, there's a few different things that we can be doing now. So um, uh, we've already raised the point of, of kind of the managing expectations, avoiding the hype, and I think there's there's a responsibility that comes along with managing those expectations. So um, at a conference I was at recently, somebody mentioned that um, researchers in pharmaceutical applications are sometimes hesitant to say that um, quantum technology is gonna bring this huge advantage and solve all our medical problems because we just don't know that they are yet. We really hope they are. And it's a lot of ongoing efforts going into uh, those applications, but, but just being realistic and um, acting as a, as, as a trusted authority on what the potential might be. Um, another lesson learned around managing expectations, I think is avoiding an AI winter, avoiding a quantum winter. Um, 
and again being realistic about what we expect to happen and being re realistic about the time frames in which we might expect that to happen I think is really key to maintaining interest and investment um, and kind of prolonging research. Um, I think we also had the opportunity, as we've been mentioned before, to start understanding now what the implications are going to be um, and to have those uh, things like tools like the ECTA, um, we, could, we can start to define those tools so that as new applications come along, we can start to have frameworks to understand their impact. Um, I think also around regulations, you mentioned the EU AI Act. Um, I think there's a tendency with these emerging technologies to say, well, things are happening so fast, they're developing so fast, that by the time new regulation comes in, it's too late. So we might as well just wait and see what the implications are and regulate then. But I think actually we can, we can be agile with our regulation and it involves a lot of education for policymakers and for regulators to understand how the technology is evolving. But I think that is possible. And I think we shouldn't use the rapid development as an excuse to delay regulating. And um, finally, and again, I think I think this speaks to, um, to the point made earlier around um, the workforce and outreach. I think beyond, we're hearing time and time again, that uh, we're expecting the quantum workforce to be a potential significant barrier to how quickly we can enable a quantum ecosystem. So I think we really need to be taking the initiative to act now to inspire young people to get involved with quantum technology to communicate about the um, potential impact it could bring. But I think there's also beyond that, there's, there's further motivation to make sure um, that the workforce is actually representative of society. But this is a huge learning point from AI ethics. We've seen that so often we just don't have the right people in the room. We don't have the people in the room that are representative of society as a whole uh, to bring in those diversity of perspectives. And I think by um, engaging in inclusive outreach is that opportunity to have a really truly representative quantum workforce. And I think that will really help shape the trajectory towards common good. Cool, thank you. I picked up this term agile here in, mm -hmm. in your book because like, knowing from uh, so at AIT we're also working for uh, policymakers and helping them to define guidelines for emerging technologies and I feel that those both systems so development and policy making it's just working at two totally different speeds so where do you see the potential here for becoming more agile and and, and those are the policy makers were orient themselves more on the speed of the developers? Is this, is this actually a potential or are there examples for that? Um, I think I think what's need, I think there's a few things needed for that. So there's the upskilling of policymakers in, in quantum technologies, in the state of the art, in, um, in road mapping um, and understanding the ecosystem. And I think there's also an upskilling of uh, technical people in what the societal impact might be so that they're able to speak the right language to communicate with with policy makers and I think I think that's something that we'll be hearing about later on today um, and I think there's also an opportunity for more communication between the technical um, side and the, the policy and societal impacts and etc side of things. This actually brings it right to um, Alexandra uh, because you are working in uh, quantum ecosystems and you're trying to bring all those different actors together to the table and share or create communication between them. Uh, so my question would be, when it comes to responsible development of quantum technology, I think we all agree it's fair to say that it's not a one-man job, but that rather, you know, you the metaphor, it needs a village to raise a quantum computer or quantum technology responsible. Yeah. Um, knowing that you're working on creating a quantum ecosystem, where do you see the importance of interdisciplinarity when it comes to developing standards, regulations, or also frameworks for quantum technology? It's a very good question because like maybe I should explain also what we do and why we do it. So what we do is we develop a quantum ecosystem um, to connect all the players that develop already quantum technology. And uh, we base our development on startups because we think that startups are the innovative part of this ecosystem and that startups are the ones that need all the players in the ecosystem, which is the universities which is the corporate partners to develop or to, to try the, the, the technologies they are developing. 
they need the venture capital, so the capital that is invested in the development of the technology, think tanks, think tanks, and so on. So what I see in my daily work is that it needs this ecosystem alone to develop the technology, only the technology. So I see brilliant researchers that have no idea how to commercialize their ideas. I see all the hardware companies that approach us to find startups to develop algorithms. And uh, all the knowledge that is needed, it's of course not, uh, not comprised or not unified in only one person. And I think the same is for regulations. All these players, they have so many different views on the topic and we should take them um, with us. And um, uh, what I see our role now as an ecosystem player is to give them a platform to exchange, to give them a voice and to, to make them meeting each other. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I only like we refer a lot to the to the European AI Act. So there were some researchers heard, but still as soon as it was in the in the German Parliament, there was a lot of discussions going on that a lot of parties were not heard. And that, that there will come out a lot of problems when deciding in the way it was uh, it was proposed. So I see our duty really to really to raise awareness in uh, for within the different players. And also it was pointed out before. Of course, we have the money to invest into the startups, but also I would not say that we can decide right now what is the right technology, right? We, we of course, we have our values, how we, uh, how we uh, support technology, how we invest in the technology, but um, who knows, who decides if it's right or wrong right at this yeah. moment. Um, what I also want to um, point out is that, um, Development also comes with a fear. Technical development also always comes with a fear. And we realize this when we have the discussions also with the startups in our, uh, in our, in our uh, daily work, that they are maybe not aware of what the society is afraid of, right? So I would not sign the statement, statement that was uh, made before that the, that the developers or the researchers in the laboratory really think about what they are developing on. I see that a lot of, Development is driven by curiosity and not really by this impact. It might be both, but there is both. And we have to raise the awareness also for the for the for the startups that are developing pure technology. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it's also fair to say that what developers do is developing. I mean, this is why I, I remember at this panel in the uh, beginning of the year where I was talking with uh, AI, people coming from AI ethics. And uh, it was a woman, she was a programmer and she was telling me actually, she started programming because she did not want to deal with people. And now she has to, because somehow it's putting this ethics on their, on the table. And so, to, so I think it's totally understandable to, to follow this path. Um, but then I wonder in this ecosystem that you're describing, where does society come in? And maybe my question would be, how are your experiences when working with policymakers, for example, on the, on the question of quantum technology? Because I can imagine that oftentimes the other side or the people that should or the side that should represent maybe societal interest they are just lacking the knowledge of the technology or they are following some overhyped fears of bad actors for example we don't see this right now on as our task we really were just an open plan mm -hmm. we foster um we foster exchange so we invite the people to discuss with us that we did last week. We opened the discussion with the startups, actually with Ben um, um the discussion on what is actually, what are you actually working on? What could be an impact? But we ourselves, we don't see our role to talk to the policy makers to make decisions. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And we come to um, the fourth speaker on the panel, Bart. I know Bart from your background that Values and tech development is a topic you are concerned with. And one of these promises that inscribed in current visions of quantum technology is that quantum computing, for example, will solve problems more efficient and faster and also help to reduce energy consumption. Are these, um, are these values, I think now that I'm reading it, it goes a little bit towards the question that I had at the end of my talk. Yeah. Are these values that are shared among our societies or would you say we are considering wrong values or are the values we, for some reason, do not pay enough attention to? Yeah, thank you very, very much for the question. I think it allows me to uh, 
highlight a bit this public value approach that we use at the Rappenau Institute as a kind of analytical tool to assess the new technology and uh, many digital technologies that we uh, use it for. First of all, considering any value is right. You cannot consider a value. If you consider a value, that's a good thing. <laughs> it just has to be done in the right way. And that's a bit behind your question, I think, that these public or social values are often pitted against economic values like uh, monetization, efficiency gains. And what's the price we pay for that? We pay for that in, 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 uh, in, in infringement of uh, public values like privacy and security and so on. I think that's not the correct way uh, to go about the value framework. Mm -hmm. I think the value framework should be as broad as possible. And on all these values, you can have positive and negative effects of a new technology. For example, this sustainability or energy question in, in relation to quantum technology. So often, sometimes you can read phrases on the internet that quantum computing will save the planet, for example. Because it promises to have more efficient batteries, uh, faster calculation, which means less energy consumption, um, um, the solar cells uh, uh, working, uh, getting more energy from the, the energy from the sun, uh, optimizing the whole electricity grid. There are a lot of benefits affected, but there are also uh, things to worry about. Um, perhaps the very amount of calculation will increase, which will cost more energy, uh, pooling uh, quantum computers to the, uh, this very cold uh, temperature is the cost of energy con uh, consuming. Uh, new encryption techniques also cost a lot of energy. So it's not entirely clear at the moment yeah, whether it will be uh, 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 <coughs> good for sustainability, quantum technology or not. So it's really something that we have an agile mind to towards. But we should have the right um, uh, the questions on the table and know what to look for. And that's the other point I wanted to make uh, uh, in the full picture of all these uh, values. I mean, we just saw the, the World Economic Forum list of values. They sometimes feel a bit random, like, okay, there's this list of values, that list of values. I mean, in the work, World Economic Forum list, I didn't find important values like autonomy, for example, or uh, humanity or human dignity, uh, which are core values in the framework that we are working on. And we are trying to uh, also create some kind of hierarchy of values that, that has a few core values at the left, so to speak, and then instrumental values. And then you can come to a kind of practical implementation via norms, for example. And I think that. Uh, to follow what Mira said, we are just trying to look for something that goes in between, let's say, a deontological approach and a, a more consequentialist approach. I think the public value uh, framework that we are developing, so we already have something that we are still in perfectly developing further, is actually exact such middle way because it has some generic normative force, but it is also amenable to various contexts and, and, and circumstances and let's say more contextual norms. So, but the point is to use all these values and, and, and consider them at, at the same time. And what you often see now in quantum uh, uh, debate on, on quantum technology, the most attention goes to the security problem. And also politicians in the Netherlands only worry about that problem. And well, just to wind the debate with a good value framework, I think is very, very useful and can be used on many levels, on policy level, but also on the company's level. Mm -hmm. And would you say with the maybe uh, to ask a little bit more about this public value framework that you're using? Yes. Um, and when I hear uh, when I hear the, the way that you describe it, it seems to me as if there are public common values that are shared among society, and we need to adopt, include, reflect those values, all of those values in with every technology. Or yes. would you rather say that? Isn't it possible that some technologies bring their own values to the table or that it's more? I think the question is, do we have a general set of value or is it rather specific and comes from the technology mm -hmm. itself? I think you can work towards general set of values, including everything. But in any specific case or uh, in some technology, asking more questions is more uh, pertinent to one value and that's the flexibility of it. But there is somehow some general model that seems to work and it can be used very effectively to get a lot of issues in focus that otherwise remain uh, yeah, outside your, your, your scope. 
that's my you know, point I really wanted to make. But we have a kind of preliminary version, version of it. I'm still working on, let's say, the, 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 to get the whole argumentation, because there are a lot of arguments you can bring against it, like you are already starting to do. Yeah. So we, we are drafting a paper to, to get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's safe to say that in this field there is no, there's not the one fits all solution, and everybody's trying to think the solution. Now there are a lot of counter arguments against the value framework, like it's too big, uh, anything can, anything yeah. goes. Uh, nobody can be against them. It's too generalistic. Uh, it, it doesn't have a real bite, and I think they can all be be answered pretty uh, pretty well actually. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Bert. So. Um, it was a short round of introduction to the speakers we have on the panel, and we will let each of them has had the chance to uh, give their idea and to state where they're working on and how they approach the topic. I would now open up the round for discussions here in the audience or also to the people online. I already see two hands raising, and Zeki, if I can ask you to take care of the online community. Yes, and I was. Okay. Um, Mira. Um, for, for hierarchy of values. Um, because of course the question I think you alluded to that as well is that who whose hierarchy um and how do you prioritize? So I think um to kind of maybe give a little bit of context to the um I, I very much uh, agree and I'm curious for Rebecca that the EU would agree as well that the values is somewhat random in the in the world economic forum one but um it is uh or not but and one has to realize that this is a um very multi multilateral uh, effort and sort of super visual which has the venus and uh, take all those look i probably about 50 percent who hadn't heard about values before we we did this effort so that just to kind of contextualize where the, that none of them had or Maybe a handful of them had a like normative background, um, and we still want to jump values in there. Um, so I'm, I'm curious then when you say like a hierarchy, um, there's a, something I think we consciously shied away from, like who decides on that hierarchy and how how will we establish the hierarchy and according to sort of what principles. So, Anza, would you like to collect the questions and then? No, I think we can answer it. Okay, so next is. Uh, oh, yeah. One minute from Alexander, I think you raised a hand before me. No, I think we go through one at one at a time. I can give, let me give a short answer and give an example. One of our core values is justice. And justice in itself cannot really be, uh, well, given uh, an, an instrumental, uh, let's say, uh, follow up. So, Equal opportunity, inclusivity, uh, well, um, kind of values of justice. And if you think about inclusivity, uh, you can think about accessibility. And then you already move towards like a really instrumental thing, like some kind of platform, or let's say a cloud for quantum computing. Who gets access and who does not? In some cases, you want everyone to have access. In other cases, you you want uh, you want some restrictions. But it starts, let's say, from kind of core abstract value. You can move to, to in this hier hierarchical thinking uh, towards, let's say, uh, instrumental solutions. And I think that's a very useful way of thinking. And that's we have more of these, let's say, uh, uh, um, uh, steps you can you can take. But it goes too far to go in to into, let's say, philosophical underpinnings of the, what why those core values hold for everyone. And that they are not subjective, but they have carry some uh, kind of uh, a general objective force. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have some responses here from the panel, and then Alex, did you want to? Okay. A quick clarificatory question. So, you, I, I'm wondering if this is if we're talking about a kind of logical hierarchy here, where some values might necessarily follow from other values or whether we're talking about a kind of normative hierarchy that some values should be considered prior to other values in that they kind of occupy a higher importance to satisfy or meet those values before we can move on to considering a kind of a less uh, important layer of values. 
So whether it's a whether it's a kind of logical or normative hierarchy that we're talking about. Yeah, well, uh, I think there's a kind of I think the normative force uh, follows from you first you have to uh, think about the reaction between the values and then the norms are in not always uh, a straightforward process, norms are connected to each other. So that's mm -hmm. those are two different things. Um, yeah, for example, in the education sector, I wrote a report on digital digitalization in education. And we work with three core values there. They are just as uh, um, we call it uh, mental kind of that is uh, humanity is not fully good translation and uh, autonomy. And the intuitive thing there is that people go to school to learn to develop themselves as a person, like an autonomous being. So that's an individual uh, level as a social person in for the social relations and for society and kind of uh, uh, yeah, societal uh, thing. So, and just as it's most related to that, like equal opportunity, uh, um, um, humanity is most related to the, the direct social respect and things like that, and uh, autonomy is most related to uh, the sacred freedom to, to develop yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have an intuitive understanding of the school values, and through this hierarchy framework, we manage to get all these uh, issues in, in, in perspective we want to think about in the new technology. That was also kind of empirical proof, and hey, we are on the right track with this. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just to make a really quick comment. Yeah. Uh, just before we start, there was a question from the online audience what the question was. The question was how to prioritize our hierarchy, how to create a hierarchy of values. Thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to follow up on what Mira said, and then what also Bart said about why the values appear to be random and why they're not sort of categorized under justice or something. And the reason being is, um, as Mira said, we're trying to create something that can be used by the stakeholders, by the ecosystem. And when the majority of people either have a very strong deference to ethics or hadn't heard about values before, if you use a concept like justice, it's really difficult to put that into practice. It's just this sort of soft, floaty concept and also can be a bit scary as well because if you're not quite sure what it means and you, you say happy you have to enforce justice, it sounds a bit difficult. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the values were written in a way that could be implemented and could be sort of matched to the different themes so that the document wasn't just something useless sitting on the shelf. Well, that's something that stakeholders and the ecosystem could actually use. That's that's the reason. And I think that's a good reason. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I would like to go on with or maybe give the word to our panelists, but then I would like to go on to the list of other questions I had on my uh, table. Um, just quickly add to that, I think one thing we can take away from the learnings before that there's still a principle to practice gap, and we will also turn it come to this gap with quantum technology. Alex, last comment on the question well, of values. My question would be um, exactly this, how to put then the value into practice. Do you also have a recommendation for this, for the industry, for the researchers? How should this be? If you start from scratch, you start with a reflection. What is this new technology going to bring? Which impact will it have? What kind of questions should we ask? Then you can use the value framework in a very general sense. Once you have this kind of impression, and of course you do this with all, kind of, all stakeholders like you are doing, you're, you're, you're talking with a lot of partners and people and then they bring, everyone brings something to the table, but then you can start reflecting, okay, what, what's the next step? And you can move in the direction of, uh, let's say, uh, more instrument. But you can also think about trade-offs. I mean, some values bite each other. And mm -hmm. what's the trade-off we, we're going to going to choose? That's also a very interesting topic. Yeah. But maybe enough about values. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, uh, I know from the first uh, raise of hands, we have yeah. hundred speakers from the, uh, the audience as well, or other people that want to raise questions. Uh, I have Günther, sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Anna. Anna, okay, we have Günther, Anna, then uh, Douglas, and if there's people, what's your name again? Tell me your name again. Me? Oh, sorry, Kerry. Uh, so, uh, good. Yes. Uh, but you so need good. to. You need to be loud. Oh, I can try. Try. <laughs> so, um, 
My question to already came up with is the presentation of Renzel when you pointed out that there's a little bit of flaw in the description of a bad actor, what is a bad actor, and then later on the, the, the commercial use of uh, biocomputing and also like the term responsible is a little bit problematic from the perspective of an artist. But my question is this, um, uh, does anyone consider that the responsible or let me say the, the normal use of quantum computing could become or is actually the problem, like an analogy to maybe our environmental problems like climate change and, and species extinction and others. That's not so much that like the leaking oil tanker or the deep water horizon incident, that those incidents are kind of the problem we have, but uh, our very daily existence, how we responsibly as a responsible citizen live our lives, responsible for the family, responsible for the company, responsible for the society, that this uh, adds up to those kinds of problems we are facing right now. Thank you very much for the question. I think it's a question on the panel. Who of you has an uh, idea or what your answer to that? Have a go. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, we live in a capitalist society, right? And I'm, I'm not sure that quantum computing specifically prevents um, distinct risks around that than other forms of computing. I think we might see exacerbated risks in some particular areas. Um, they think have, have already been highlighted. I'm sure we'll hear more about. So around uh, privacy um, and uh, digital divides and, and those kinds of questions. And also we had the energy usage, but as Bart said, that still we're still understanding how exactly that will play out, whether we'll expect to see reduced or um, uh, more in energy efficiency or whether we'll expect to see um, greater usage. So I think, I suppose my answer is that I, I don't think quantum computing presents a particular new challenge around that, uh, but it might exacerbate existing challenges. Yeah, and also I would say you cannot forbid the development of a new technology just because you see risk in it, right? I think it's just not possible. I think it's on us to take a decision on how to use it. There is a daily use case, which is saw it before, or yeah, daily use cases uh, where quantum computing could, uh, could uh, advance how we live a lot, uh, uh, enhance how we live a lot. And uh, we just discussed when we came here, about the development of electricity. When electricity was invented in 1888, then there was this big media uh, uh, media announcement and this big uh, policy uh, politics being said uh, death by wire because there were so many accidents with the electricity when it just came. So just imagine we would have followed this path that electricity is dangerous and just because of this we would have stopped the development. I think it's not it's not possible. This should not be the question. It's a decision on how we develop the digital us. The misunderstanding was not about forbidding the technology, but about assessing, which, which is like, uh, which I didn't see in this discussion right now. It's just like the normal application, application for material stuff, the application for finding novel medicine, that this could add up to now unseen problems. It's not about forbidding the technology, you know, cannot do this. Yeah, I think it's actually in a globalized world, you know, somebody will develop it in the end of the day. So I think actually the example that you gave Alexandra with the electricity is a very good example because if we would have we would have if we would have not been aware of the problem that we can get electrified by electricity, then we wouldn't have all those safety measures that are now installed around the technology. So I think it's exactly as uh, Günther also says to raise awareness of ethical issues. Thus, we can not forbid the technology, and I here totally agree, but rather that we find security measures of how to avoid them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for me, there's also like a discussion about secondary effects that, that occur when you really start to scale something. Yeah. Um, but you also have you can also have positive secondary effects. Mm. For example, the development or the theoretical work at CERN at the end, it turned out they also developed on the side internet. So they could also be positive side effects, not only negative ones. At the moment, we see many positive direct effects of, of quantum computing. But yeah, who knows what, what can happen on the second the second side with with when we scale up, like as, as you mentioned, maybe then everybody wants to use a quantum computer and at the end we just 
use many more um, computing resources than we at the moment have, and then we, we increase again mm -hmm. energy consumption. But these are things, uh, yeah, probably also the society has to has to adapt to that and also maybe give guidelines in total. But this is this is like a slow process, I would say, that has to be developed over time. Okay. Um, I would like to come to the next question of the board. Yeah, quick comment. Yeah, maybe I can just note the obvious that uh, it's a whole new way of calculation, computation, basically, and that's the same with neural networks right now. They, they, it's a totally different way of calculating or uh, thinking, and you don't know in advance what all this will bring. Like this whole chat GPT uh, buzz that's going on. Now. Is there something on steroids that uh, that we already could do, or is it really something new? I think time still has to tell, but um, yeah, we cannot foresee everything, of course. Uh, it's good to have the right question, but there's also an element of trial and error, of course. Uh, before we come to the next question, I want to point out a comment by Claire. Um, she wrote in the chat, just a comment about forbidding a technology application. If we were to implement our RI and ethics seriously, we should have the opportunity to say, we need to stop now or follow another pathway. I think this is a good comment and we, uh, to, to be considered. Um, it also shows, I think, how far and how complicated it is to take RI seriously on that level for many reasons. Um, thank you, Claire. So, Anna, yes, please. Yeah, it would be good if you come. Or you can just ask and I can repeat it. Yeah. Oh, Yeah, it's very dynamic panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, like the camera. Uh, so, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Anna. I don't know whether people introduced themselves in the beginning. Maybe I should just add that I have a more technical background. Um, so I just finished my master's in Canada, and there I've been working with uh, Joan Arrow on the quantum ethics project. Um, and so I, I have a very simple question. Uh, I just want to make sure I really understand what people here mean when they say, we expect you know, sustainable applications. We expect there to be energy uh, efficient uh, benefits, et cetera, because um, yeah, I get the impression there's a strong belief in that. And for sure when technical researchers write their motivations, they, they also say we expect these, these applications. Um, but let's say when I now go and talk to potential PhD supervisors about projects at that intersection, you know, I get the reaction, oh, that's, that's great. And, and then a long, long pause of hesitancy and you know, maybe you, you start off with a, something else perhaps. Um, and that may have many reasons, right? Like you're a technical researcher, it's on you to actually build the solution. So you just wanna be a bit more hesitant about promising something. Uh, there's also like the supervisor student relationship, et cetera. So um, you know, you're not talking about the high level necessarily, more about smaller projects, but I just wanna make uh, sure, I understand when you say we expect, how strong is your belief in that that will actually materialize? Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's a, a question. Thank you very much for the question, by the way. That's a question of uh, what will happen in the long term, what will happen in the short term. I think in the short term, uh, quantum computing will not be one of the most uh, uh, yeah, fast uh, applications, for example. I think Samsung with Microscopy, uh, uh, seismology, uh, gravity, and time measurement will have uh, the earliest, let's say, applications. But maybe in the long run, it might be that quantum computing will be the most uh, impact and full uh, application within the short run. If you want to have PhD now, you have to have a result in, in four years. Perhaps you should focus on quantum sensing or quantum computing and not so much in, uh, and quantum communication, not so much in quantum computing. So it's more like, what, what time scale are we thinking? I mean, that's how I, how, how I inter interpret your question. But maybe there are other, other things. Uh, yeah, I, I also, I also yeah. in principle, agree with you. Yeah. I mean, at the end, we are pretty confident there are problems out there that we cannot solve any more classical methods anymore. The question is now just, when can we, when are quantum computers able to solve this problem? So is it like a goal in three years, 10 years, 20 years? But at the same time, we also have to think about at the, at the full time of this development, we're also developing new, better classical methods. So it's always like we are, we are shooting at a running target. Like classical methods are better, quantum methods getting better. 
So that's all in, in a total improvement of the system. So it depends a bit what you see. Are you strictly speaking, can quantum computing be better than classic computing next year? Probably not. Can it be better in 10 years? Yeah. Can it be better in 20 years? I probably, uh, the, the, the probability is very, very high, I would say. But also depends on to which state you are comparing. I mean, at the moment, it's also not completely clear from theory. If, for example, always discussing about these non uh, NP hard problems, at the moment, it's not clear if NP equals P. So there's no, no mathematical proof that actually all problems that we at the moment solving cannot be solved in polynomial time. I mean, as long as this question is not answered from, from math, it's, it's a strong hope or it's, it's a strong guess. Thank you. I have uh, two more questions on, on my list. If I can just follow up very briefly. Very so briefly. Brief, just when you say time scales, how does then in your discussions, you know, because on the one hand you say it has a, will have a huge impact down the road, but then, right, these problems that we're talking about are on very short term, right, that we want a solution to it now. So how high is the impact of quantum for the short term solution? But it can also be saved for later if you want. Yeah, I think it's a very, very good point that you bring out there, that, that somehow the hype and the development and the problem is here. And so it's all on different time scales. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, regarding time scales, I just that my time is shortly running out. So I will give the word to Douglas. For okay. a question, and then we come to you. Yeah, so, so two very short points, very short. One is to echo this point on values. I raised my hand ages ago, so it was about that. But the OECD were also developing something similar um, called values, instrumental and practice. So we should okay. talk a little yeah. bit. Um, we see the same same issue. It's about all emerging technologies. Um, we see the same issue that you guys in the West saw about practical approaches. And so we have this whole idea of shared values and then the instrumental, the practical ones, how do we make that work? And so I think there might be a reason for many of us to discuss on that and exchange on our experiences of building value-based approaches. But my question will be um, about agility. So Natasha, you mentioned agility, agile um, regulation. One of your responses, Alexandra, you mentioned about the ecosystem, the information exchange, so my question is, if you want agile policy or agile ecosystems, um, what kind of information should be shared and who should be providing it? That can be something answered throughout the day. We don't have to answer it now for time, but it's a, it's a big question for us at the OECD is how can we support agile policy? Because there's a recognition that regulation is said to move slowly, so why not have agile regulation? But what information do we need and how do we engage with ecosystems? To make them agile as well. I think I think it, it part of it comes back to um, to the answers we just heard around time scales. So I think understanding what to expect first is probably a good place to start. Um, what uh, yeah, so what are the early applications and what kind of time frame are we expecting? Them? in expecting the word again <laughs> um because we think they'll happen um and i think i think there's i think part of what responsible innovation entails is is this recognition that people are experts in their domain and that actually and again going back to that point about our developers um who developers think about the societal impact and i think well there's a question of whether they do and there's a question of whether they should and what might be stopping them what the barriers might be um so i think um that kind of that kind of information as well that that recognition that developers will be often be able to spot issues and spot potentials and opportunities where um, policymakers might not be able to. So I think I think that kind of communication is really valuable. Maybe can I just say very quickly because I wanted to um, I wanted to add this earlier. This this point about developers again, developers maybe not wanting to think about the societal impacts. So we ran a hackathon um, in the last two days. I'll wrap this up quickly. Um, but we asked, and it was master students, people from industry, etc. And we asked um, the hackers to think about the societal impacts. Of their use cases we had real world use cases provided by industry and actually they did an incredible job of thinking through what the implications might be and understanding what they might be able to do and what they might ask other decision makers 
do. So I think it's partly about empowering them and encouraging developers to do that. And I think that can also be really powerful. Yeah, it's a good statement. Alex. No, I think um, to your question, back to your question, um, I think we're still in the very beginning of uh, creating all this knowledge of creating the ecosystems. But um, for us working to build up an ecosystem, we are also very much uh, involved in other ecosystems worldwide. And I think this maybe is the right uh, groups or networks to go to because they spread very widely. So I think it's all about uh, communication and creating awareness. So there is not yet any just uh, like one university or one organization you can go to to spread what you really do. You really have to reach out to this ecosystem. And this is what I see as our daily work as well. This is what an ecosystem is about. Yeah, and I think you you do the same. And, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for the questions. I think we have a few minutes left, so I will come to the closing round. Again, thank you for the questions. Um, for the closing round, I have a, a short question, and I would like to give each of you the opportunity to uh, give a short answer to that. Um, let's think 20 years from now, the pathetic future, but will you still be working in the field of quantum technology? <laughs> and who would like to start? I think yes, and I think we will all. <laughs> I mean, as a developer, I also think that we're still working in, 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 in continued development because there are probably new things that we didn't foresee now. So there are many more things to discover, many more things to continue working on. Yeah. I think it's a topic which will be broadly, uh, broadly in the economy. So there is possibilities to still work on it. Me personally, I hope I will not work then anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think uh, it's not a topic that is um, that is readily developed, but it is still developing. So, yes, I'm sure it uh, will impact us all still in 20 years. I hope I hope so. I hope that quantum technology has progressed to that to that point where, as you said, that we all will be working on it. I think maybe for me, I hope that there is more of a, a shared responsibility around these kinds of questions of the ethical and societal impact, and so I hope that it's not just us in this room that are thinking about these things, but the broader point of view. No, thank you very much. Um, that was our final discussion. I asked before. Round of applause. I like this. I get applauded and I've done absolutely nothing yet. So yeah, you're going to regret that. Um, I am uh, going to be a harsh dictator in terms of time. Uh, so all the speakers, you've got 20 minutes after which uh, you shall be headed. Um, so that's not going to be the case, uh, but I will glare at you with increasing ferocity. Um, okay, so it's my pleasure to chair this session. Um, I, you don't need to hear me talk. Uh, so I'm going to only talk at my panel next, so that you know, don't have to hear my opinion. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Arsev Adinoju, uh, who is here from the Middle East Technical University, which is in Turkey. Uh, he's a social scientist who has worked on a variety of science and technology studies, uh, has done a bunch of work in the U.S., and is the founder of the Turkish Science and Technology Studies uh, Network and is going to tell us about the need for science communication in quantum technologies, so, which I very much agree with. Take it away. Well, thank you for being here after delicious lunch. Probably you're already feeling stuff in your stomach, your eyes, eyelids are coming down maybe. So I will keep this as light as possible. Uh, because of the microphone works, please keep your questions to the end, but I would love to have back and forth. So maybe Zeki could uh, mend this machine. So feel free to jump in with your questions. <laughs> uh, the reason we are here is, uh, like, well, one single reason we are here. Oh, wow. Do you know this movie? I mean, if you know, how unfortunate are you? Yeah, that's the reason we are here today. <laughs> okay, they us. 
There are lots of stuff you don't know, even though you're the experts regarding the quantum and quantum realm and stuff. And why is that? Is the reason I'm here and what can we do about it? Is the reason I'm talking. But, you know, don't forget, there's quantum people in the quantum realm. Okay? So, uh, there will be three acts in my play. Quantum mania. We just started with that one. I'm going to talk about briefly about science communication and the difference between science communication and scholarly communication. And then I'm going to talk about how we can integrate this communication activity into the scientific conduct. Because generally it's an afterthought. And generally it's too late. And in the morning session, we talk about how fortunate we are in regards to this problem. It's still in the early stage where we can intervene. No. So we've seen that. But have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? I mean, you don't exist here. You're here because you can only uh, think that you're here. You, you, know, you create your body through your consciousness. That's why you're here. It's the New York Times bestseller. I mean, all of our publications combined probably uh, could have not reached that many people. You know, some people's ignorance or stupidity doesn't change the problem we have at our hands. I want to read you, not from this book, another one. I mean, this is the most famous guy. This is a bunch of dentists that I'm going to read. Most of all diseases start in mind, ends in mind. Blah, blah, blah. Mind has a blueprint of human body. Body tries to rebuild each time when it oscillates between energy and particle 1044 times. Did you know that? It's not 1043. <laughs> okay, this is called quantum healing. Uh, we are doing a work with Zeki and another friend, Ali, about all the tweets regarding quantum healing and responses and stuff. I mean, it is, again, such a big topic, reaching a lot of people, you know, outreach. Who are these scientists reaching? It's mostly what we do is scholarly communication. We communicate among scholars. And not even all scholars. We, are, we live in our isolated disciplines. I'm not going to talk about interdisciplinary outreach. That's another topic, and there is a session for that. But, you know, this is one of the problems. Do you know why I have a belly? Not because of the delicious food you provided, Ziki, but because I have no notion of quantum weight loss. If I can only, you know, do that, you know, get these pills, because these pills, and let me read that to you. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> quantum infused or using quantum vibrations to stimulate weight loss. Since I'm not using quantum vibrations, I'm not losing weight. I didn't know that before, but you know, after this presentation, I promise you, this belly will vanish. Oh my God. Let's talk about quantum information technologies. Do you know this uh, quantum code? <clears throat> it uses some quantum algorithms together with some quantum computers, and you can make $50,000 in a week. You just have to invest 250 bucks, and they will turn your money around. Uh, it is obviously a scam, but since 2016, we know that it's a scam, but it's up there, and some people are making shitloads of money. I don't know how much you make, but generally, academics don't make a lot of money. Some of you, maybe in industry, IBM, maybe pay a lot of money. But you know, at the end of this session, I'm going to give you two options: either create our own scam and be rich, or do something about this. Okay. My favorite is this: quantum pendant. I mean, you wear this; it's like secret. Things go very well for you. And they're saying that don't buy the fake ones. <laughs> I mean, you know, 
I love ignorance. You know, I know the dare they have. Don't buy the fake ones. You really need the real ones. And do you know the real ones are different? Because the real ones actually they have they've been uh, actually forbidden. You cannot buy them in Netherlands, for instance, because it emits uh, ionizing radiation. It really fucks up with your health. These are the real ones, though, so don't buy the fake ones. And you know, with this thing, you think that okay, we are done with it. I mean, we solved the problem, right? We communicated this message is wrong, and we solved the problem. Well, we may have solved the problem for pendants, but not for necklaces or mugs, because this is a quantum mug. Yes, it is. And this is a quantum blanket. If you feel cold at night, because you're not wearing any, you're not uh, sleeping under quantum blankets. Here comes my favorite, quantum socks. So Ziki in his opening slide, are we going to put quantum in front of every word? Well, if you have some uh, entrepreneur split, you can and make shitloads of money instead of you know pursuing a PhD in front of a computer in a boring life. I don't think anyone is wearing quantum socks. And there are many more. The law of attraction, think positive, positive will find you. Your consciousness will create some reality. I mean, I can't talk forever. I will not because I don't want to antagonize Sherry. I'm scared of her a little bit. <laughs> well, my hypothesis is that nature was vacuumed. Horror, wakui, right? Well, scientists are not talking about their science. There's an empty space. People don't know about it. In these elite circles right now here at ITAS, we talk about it, but outside these walls, nobody heard about these concepts or very few. And you know, it's ripe for exploitation because energy, health, I mean, these are the stuff people are striving for. We have science that is ruining everything since Hepler's time, even earlier. But still, people are following these ridiculous ideas. Because science and communication are two separate stuff. We're not promoting our science to Joe on the street. Uh, simply, this is the definition of science communication. Uh, I'll give you a moment to read. So I don't want to read slides. Because I have a slide about not reading slides. Yeah, it's going to come in a couple of slides later. The benefits are many. I mean, it's good for science. You, most of you belong to different disciplines. And people only follow people in their own discipline. But this thing is great. If you promote your science to people in other departments, science will advance. Economies will get better. It's also soft power. Everybody knows CERN. Everybody knows NASA. Everybody knows ITAS in the circle. <laughs> so it's good when you do science communication, people know about your stuff. It's good for household decisions. I mean, when I graduated from high school, the curriculums cannot uh, follow the advances in science and technology. When I graduated, there were no uh, personal data protection. There were no Facebook metaverse and stuff. How am I going to learn the information I need from whom? It's good for democracy and society and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> How much time do I have? At least. Oh, and I can talk about this blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. This is important. So we talk about democracy and society. Uh, the values and stuff. And we had a wonderful uh, lunch discussion with Alexandra. I, I can see her right now. Maybe that wasn't that wonderful and she ran away. <laughs> yeah, these things happen sometimes. I thought, uh, but means us here. So we talk about how system is not functioning. And at the end, you know, all these discussions and like capitalism is really bad and you know, freedom, sustainability, blah, blah, blah. But for it, 
society to function, you need informed citizens. Okay, what are we? What are we saying? What you are saying this morning and rest of the day tomorrow is really important. But at the end of the day, you are going to communicate with someone who votes for Trump or equivalent of that mindset. How are you going to inform these people? You know, how are you going to inform flat earthers, anti-vaccination folks? They need to be informed. They need to be informed about quantum as well, so that they do not follow quantum healing or quantum coding investment scheme, unless at the end of the session, we are creating our own scheme, okay? That option is still open, okay? Let's keep that in mind. Who knows? Um, I love money. What can I say? So, for all of these things, science has to, communication has to be integrated into scientific conduct. It is not something we do in an isolated laboratory. Okay? The days of creating Frankenstein in an isolated chateau has passed many years ago. Now you need to convince the uh, taxpayers because you're asking for their money. I mean, you you show me a beautiful maps, graphs of uh, quantum investments, country by country, but that money is not coming out of thin air. S someone has to convince other people so that they fund your research in quantum or something. We were talking with Zeki yesterday how people are running towards AI related research and leaving quantum computational research because that's where people are convinced they're throwing money, they're sending dollars. So you have to convince people in order to sustain your existence. And of course you need the ethics, whether your science is really relevant and benefiting society or not. But, you know, I spend enough time on this one. I really calling my message. So what can we do about this? Well, the very first thing is to have communication be a part of science. Okay, it's a forethought, not an after. Oh, we found this, let's send the press release out there. That is not inclusive. That is not reflexive. That is also not transparent. You know, it, it doesn't hold well, but that's how we do science. You know, because we are scared of being scooped and that's a very valid uh, concern, but I'm not going to talk about why academic research, performance metrics matter, how should they be, that's, you know, uh, you can get me drunk in the evening and we can talk about that if you want. Getting back here, I mean, we do, science is a black box. Especially quantum science, because you know the quantum scientists don't know what they're doing most of the time. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it's a black box. People don't know about it, and nature abhors vacuum. And they don't know about it. They come up with their own explanations because we are sense-making beings. When there is something we cannot make sense of it, we create something imaginary to fill that void in our understanding. So it should be out there beforehand so that it can be inclusive, it can be reflective. Maybe we'll learn stuff from other people. I mean, talk about CTA and some other uh, collaborative design, inclusive design principles. And it seems like we've been talking forever since yesterday. So I think in my mind, confusing. And we've, we've done that. If you are familiar with your research data management practices, uh, data sharing, data management, that type of stuff. It was an afterthought and maybe still in a lot of circles. But now, if you apply for a EU grant, you should have a research data management plan beforehand. It's already built upon your science. It's built upon into your proposal. It's not an afterthought anymore. Same for uh, in EU, you have six months. In the United States, when you're applying to NSF, for instance, it's already should be within the proposal. Data one is a good example. I can talk more about that later. 
Another topic is scientists generally don't have a vision about their science. I mean, they have to think outside of their lab, outside, what's happening outside their laboratory, how people are impacted by stuff. You are very familiar with this literature, so I'm going to keep this short and move on to the next one. Another one is they don't know how to write for multiple audiences. See, why did I say manipulation? You know, I have these, I have five minutes, excellent. I have these variables. I manipulate one variable so that I can see its effect on the dependent variable. The term is manipulate. But for a person on the street, when you use manipulate, you become the you know big corporate evil, you know, umbrella. Do you know umbrella corporation? You watch any zombie movies and stuff, I see heads nodding and I, you know, I recognize my fellow nerds. Uh, so it's like when you use terms like manipulation, you become umbrella corporation, you know, only caring for profits and stuff. Or if you say uncertainty, it, it sounds like you're ignorant. Should we wear masks or not? Well, the data is not there yet. At the beginning, it was like that, if you remember. It, even Fauci said, the American guy uh, said, you know, masks don't protect at the beginning because it's uncertain. I mean, science is a different process. It, it doesn't give us the absolutes the people want. So they will think that, oh, well, Zeki doesn't know anything. I say, no shit. That is, you know, because we talk about probabilities, it's uncertain, but it sounds like we are ignorant. So we cannot convey our message to the public. So when you're writing for different audiences, that's it we can convince you to uh, communicate with wider audiences, that is. You have to change your writing. And who's going to pay for that? You need to learn a new skill set. You need to invest uh, cognitively. You need time. Who's going to do that? Who's going to pay for that? Along the same lines, uh, we also don't know how to talk. That's why I didn't read that slide in order not to contradict with myself. But again, I'm not talking about you. You're all wonderful, beautiful, best scientists. But I'm sure you know a lot of scientists I criticize on these slides. Because especially for a certain age, they don't know how to engage social media. Now I have a TikTok account because, you know, I'm out of touch with my students. Even Twitter is like, not like Facebook. I mean, Facebook is for nanas, grannies, grandmas, granddads, but even Twitter is for middle-aged, you know, bold, fat guys. So I'm on TikTok. I have no idea what I'm doing there. But if you want to communicate with these folks, you need to find the right medium. Again, who's going to teach us that? We don't even know traditional media. I mean, most of our institutions, especially in academia, they have public information offices. If you, I don't know if you ever contacted these people. Unless you have a groundbreaking uh, solution, probably not. Because if you have a groundbreaking something, they will find you give you some uh, speaking notes, writing notes, and, you know, they say, don't tell this, don't say this. They have good know-how on how to communicate with media, but we generally, scientists don't utilize that type of stuff because scientists know everything. You know, that's an uh, occupational hazard. Long story short, we need science communication to be a part of scientific conduct. It's our responsibility if we are conducting science. We need to understand the bigger picture there, not only the, our science, but it is consequences among different stakeholders and stuff. And in order to function in this realm I just described, we need additional skill set. Someone has to pay for it. Someone has to provide us time, Maybe they should count our in our tenor packages, blah, 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 whatever. We need to be trained in that because for some people it comes natural, but for most of us, we need training. And I'm done. And I hope you didn't fall asleep after that big lunch.
We have time for one question, and I admit I saw you first. So, uh, that's my democratized science. A little bit weird, but you've, I've been I've been in this field. I've been in the, as a public information officer. I've worked in science communication, and I'm a researcher, so I understand all points of view that you explained here. And in this utopian society that you would like to see, where scientists are getting their research out, who is communicating it? Why? And what is the motivation? Because we have a lot of you. You explained the benefits. You didn't explain the potential issues here and where we would have to go. So, and there's also, of course, these, a lot of these layers of career choices that do exist that are there to make life easier for everybody involved. So I'm wondering where you see the solution to it. I don't see the solution. You know, I, I, I try to give you the hype, but I don't expect this to be solved easily soon, probably not in my lifetime. But I'm going to keep the hype, so I will talk about my talk more. Uh, like uh, data management, uh, science communication should be included in the, within the curriculum when you are in grad school, something like that. So people will develop that muscle over time. Because uh, we couldn't convert data science, uh, we couldn't convert scientists who produce lots of data. We provided incentives and lots of stuff. And at the end of the day, it was their master's students or graduates, other graduate students in their lab who curated that data, put into a repository and deal with that stuff. However, after a decade, these master's students, doctoral students developed that habit. And in their own research projects, they already included that in their uh, scientific processes. So I'm copying from them. I don't know whether it's going to work or not, and no one's going to fund me for that anyway, so I can easily tell my uh, imaginary story. If science communication type of uh, additional courses, which will increase the workload of these poor graduate students, but it's there. But again, that's another topic. I'm not going to get into that. So if that is built into the, their scientific conduct, maybe in the long run, they will develop that sensitivity to these issues. And over time, this will become a less of a problem. So internal motivation primarily is internal motivation and like taking away from research time? Uh, yes, okay. yes. I'm okay with taking away from research time. I can make the same argument for interdisciplinary research as well. Absolutely. Yeah, let, 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 let's let's move this one offline. Okay. Um, although, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. That's the that's the thing we need to keep going. Otherwise, I'm going to start. Being, um. Yeah. But let's thank ourselves again. Thank you. Okay. So. Shaima uh, is a quantum physicist, a science communicator based in Denmark, uh, got her PhD in quantum physics from uh, Aarhus University, and then went on to found more than one company, I think, at this point, Shaima. Um, but one in particular that I believe you'll be talking about today is uh, the Science Melting Pot, uh, which is a, uh, you know, uh, in, in, provides inclusion, uh, science communication and inclusion services for the scientific community. So without further ado, Shema, I think you should be able to share your screen now. Take it away. You've got 20 minutes. And I'll just wave wildly when you've got five minutes left. Okay. All right. I guess you can see my screen. And <laughs> thank you, Shema. Yes. All right. I will just close some windows here. Um, yes. Okay. I'm ready to start now. Um, thank you so much for for having me um, uh, at this workshop. I'm really excited to give my talk. And it really actually is a good bridge after uh, Arsif's talk about science communication and the question that was asked about what is the solution? So, so I'm going to try to um, talk about those things. Yeah. Uh, I'm Shaima um, and I am going to take you through a little bit about uh, me, my company, how uh, my company is um, uh, 
uh, is a collaborator with uh, different research groups and universities where our services and products are used in the field of education, inclusion, and, and outreach. Um, so I'll just go through some services and products, some latest uh, um, examples of our work that we've done, and then I'm going to um, sort of go in a little bit more detail about the quantum technology master, which is called uh, DigiQ, and how um, we are a part of the um, of the consortium partner uh, of, of of the network as a, as a co consortium partner. Uh, yes, so like I mentioned, Science Melting Pot is um, we are we provide services and products in physics education, outreach, and inclusion for both universities and schools. Uh, and um, so our main focus area is uh, quantum uh, quantum physics. Uh, that's because my background also has. I did my PhD in quantum physics. Before that, I was in India where I did my master's in astrophysics. Then I worked in a science communication company. This is where sort of my love for science communication grew. Um, and then after that, I moved uh, I moved to Aarhus University uh, in Denmark to do my PhD in quantum games. After my PhD, I must say I was a little bit clueless on what should I do, a postdoc or do something of my own. And I had these ideas and I was like, okay, uh, let me use some of my ideas that I've been having all my, during my PhD and after to to uh, to begin um, something of my own. So so that's when I um, started my company called Science Melting Pot. And now I'm part of the Aarhus University Business Incubator. So so we're based here uh, at the kitchen, at, at this place called uh, The Kitchen, which is in uh, Aarhus. Um, very briefly, the mission and science melting pot is that we want to reach out at all levels from school, from school, university, and also engage the public and uh, primarily in two areas. One is in science communication. So how can we increase student intake? How do we uh, help university um, master students and PhD students to be good at science communication and then also involving the public through community events? So these are these are sort of the overarching goals and mission. Um, these are the services we have right now for universities. So I collaborate a lot with universities, both either in a format which is outsourcing, uh, uh, where research groups and universities outsource um, some, some, some science communication uh, responsibilities to me, or we also do it as a partnership. Uh, these are primarily the four services we have right now. Um, and I'm just going to give a few examples of each one of them. This one is on scientific content creation. Um, this content creation can happen in the form of websites. So as a researcher, if, you're, if you want to have, you have a research group and you want to have your own website about your research groups. So we help you do that um, because the language needs to be in an in a understandable way. For example, if you're attracting uh, bachelor students who are just very new um, uh, in university, so you still have to break it down into something that's uh, simpler to understand. So we help you do that. Um, then right now I have a collaboration with the physics department at Aarhus University where we write scientific highlights. So each month, every month, I pick a scientific paper, a research paper and write a popular science article, uh, which goes on the website, goes on social media and so on. So this, these are also some examples. Um, yes, this was a paper by, uh, Simon uh, Wall from physics department. He and his paper was about quantum materials. And then this is this is the second service we have, which is science communication training. This uh, this training is targeted towards mostly masters and PhD students, but it's clearly it's really open for everyone. Like also for postdocs or um, or uh, younger researchers, like whoever's interested. Um, so this is one example. We did a workshop with. QSTEC, which is the quantum science and technology. It's a group of different universities. And uh, they uh, in one of their PhD summer schools, uh, we did this workshop of how do you communicate your research in three minutes? So how do you do a pitch? Uh, and often with researchers, there is a lot that they want to say, but how do you say what to which audience? So this is basically um, the, 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 um, uh, the training that we gave. Um, then this one was, uh, we also have a workshop, which is a SciComp toolkit. So it's a toolkit. So you get um, a template, which you need to fill out that helps you to organize your information of what is my research about? Who will this impact? Who am I? To, and based on each um, canvas that they fill out is based on different uh, 
um, audiences that they're talking to, either high school student or a journalist or a policymaker. So we have like a, a, a toolkit workshop that we have. Um, then, so uh, those were services that we sort of contact research groups and universities saying that, oh, hey, you have a conference, you have a summer school, would you like a workshop uh, uh, on science communication for your PhD students? And and usually this is how we uh, we uh, we have these uh, 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 partnerships where we come in. The other side is also the being part of an EU network, so becoming an EU consortium partner. And this is uh, right now Science Melting Pot is part of this uh, DGQ um, European uh, consortium partner, where there are 22 universities and two companies. And uh, so um, in, in the two companies, one is our Science Melting Pot and another one from Romania called Quox uh, Interactive. And in this consortium, we are providing training modules on science communication and, and inclusion. And the diff these modules are uh, online workshops, also on-site workshops, and also some self-learning uh, video material. So we have a combination of uh, different kinds of uh, learning material. We're also providing inclusion training. And for inclusion training, we're actually collaborating with a group called Human Lab, and they actually um, specialize on um, human uh, relations, emotions, how do you collaborate in a team. So um, we, in, um, the idea is to use theater to show and talk about uh, um, diversity and inclusion. We're also, if you're coming to the Hanover uh, conference, uh, we're also going to be doing a session there, a uh, one and a half hour session on diversity and inclusion. So uh, yeah, so you'll get a sneak peek of our entire uh, four hour workshop in that in that conference. These are, uh, these are the workshops we're doing with uh, DigiQ, the science communication in quantum technology and giving it a career perspective. I think in the talk before there was a question about, you know, to um, that there are so many careers out there. So this is actually one of the focus, how, what are the different careers out there? Because, you know, to shift the focus about having science communication just as a hobby or, uh, you know, something that you just do, uh, do on the side and actually connecting it with the skills that you get from a science communication training workshop. It actually are the skills that are actually also listed out in the uh, quantum uh, uh, framework where you need to have networking communication skills. So we're really trying to uh, build this um, uh, aspect of science communication that, of course, it can be a hobby, but if you really want to have a career, you can also actually um, look for the uh, different kind of roles where science communication is required. And for this, we actually did a, a couple of interviews. Um, and these interviews were done with communicators and quantum physicists, uh, I think, some of you I can also see in the list of uh, participants, I, I can see maybe some of you have been interviewed. Um, Nina, who works with me, has been doing the interviews. Uh, so we're basically trying to just uh, collect all this information from all these people who are in different careers where science communication is used in their daily job as a, as a full-time job or even just on the side, you know, while teaching or when you just meet people where you want to explain your science. Um, so all these workshops that we are uh, designing for DGQ, of course, it's it's part of the training program, but we're also taking it outside and saying it, you can use this workshop as a training event of, in your university, in a PhD summer school, in a conference, and uh, it's also been used in different um, networks uh, in, uh, in these uh, master programs. This is the other one, which is the quantum outreach training. This is basic level where the focus is really um, give them basic skills on how to clearly talk about parts of your science, depending on who you're talking to and really breaking it and really removing this whole idea of, you know, science communication is about, oh, I would like to make you, um, uh, making it simpler. It is, it, the focus should be more on what you want to talk about, of um, which parts of your science you are talking about, and the audience is also very important. So, you know, bringing up um, skills like that and also um, making, giving it a career aspect to it. Like you get these skills, which you can actually use in a career path in, in quantum technology. So we have workshops like tailored science communication, science policy writing, where the main goal is how do you assess the target audience? What is their prior knowledge? And based on their prior knowledge, how do you... Ex 
uh, give explanations based uh, based on the target audience. And here it could be a journalist, a policymaker, or a high school student, and so on. For science policy writing, I mean, um, the policy space for quantum technology is really building up now. And I, I can see a lot of white papers coming out and a lot of uh, uh, where there is a collaboration between quantum physicists and science policymakers. And I, so I think the space is also going to grow. Um, this is also one of the skills that are listed out in the uh, European framework um, where we need to have, uh, again, uh, um, uh, responsible research and innovation and policymaking and so on. Um, and then now we come to the inclusion part, diversity in, in, and inclusion. Here we are building awareness and giving them uh, giving them training. I mean, with diversity and inclusion, of course, one training workshop will uh, it, it doesn't really solve the the problem or the, or the challenges we have in the quantum technology regarding diversity and inclusion. But it's really to first even explain, uh, beginning to explain the importance of diversity and then how to be an active ally. So we'll have workshop both using um, uh, theater and also some more interactive uh, workshop uh, style. Uh, so we're also using uh, data from the surveys that were uh, that have been done by the Gender Equality Working Group. So sort of also using that research in building our workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the use cases are also integrating it into courses like Responsible Research and Innovation. For example, ICFO in Barcelona has a course on entrepreneurship and innovation, and they've been very interested in these workshops uh, uh, that they want to include in their in their courses. This is the part with schools. So, so initially they were all into one, and now I have a second company which is called Case Tech. Uh, that's because I wanted to keep the university part separate, and then the school part separate is just more to you know have. Uh, it's just easy to uh, communicate the focus. So the second company is called Case Tech, which stands for Quantum and Astronomy Science Education. Uh, we're building a product now, uh, so we officially launch or we start selling the product next year. Um, and it's a mix of both quantum and astronomy. So the first one is actually on astronomy, which is a space radio communication kit. Uh, since we're based in Denmark and uh, Danish astronaut is going to the International Space Station. So, so we, we think it's a, it's a good time to launch the astronomy kit. Uh, next year. And the kit is basically, it comes with everything uh, where students assemble the kit themselves in groups. It comes with a, uh, with uh, software, hardware, with uh, an entire manual, both for the students and for the teachers to, to use in the classroom. And this is this has been designed for high schools uh, at the moment. Um, so th that was university schools. Uh, we also do some community events where some are also outside uh, quantum physics uh, and technology um, and you know just to also make them understand where you where do you use uh, science in your daily life and food is a very good uh, binding factor so so and this is one of our most successful workshops it was a lot of fun it was a little bit outside the quantum stuff that I usually do um, then we have uh, pub quizzes um, and uh, Recently in May, uh, we also got uh, Pint of Science to Denmark. So I think most of you might already know about Pint of Science. It's this global science festival that happens in 400 plus cities, but it, it had never happened in Aarhus. So, so it was the first time we got it. Uh, so there, there were these series of talks uh, where people met up in cafes and bars and we discussed and talked about science. Um, and this is a brief introduction of my team. So currently we are four uh, sort of full time, and then I have a, I have a group of freelancers and uh, collaborators who also work on different projects. And I think, yeah, that was it. This was my last slide. I thought, okay, I'll just keep a LinkedIn contact QR code. Uh, it would be nice to get in touch if you'd be interested in general, just to talk about what I presented now or even later, just uh, if you have any questions. So yeah. Uh, that was it for me. Thank you very much. Very good. Let's thank China. Okay. One thing I did notice is that somebody's going to have to yell at me if there are online questions because I can't see. But we've got time for a couple of questions. Fabio, I saw you first. So hold on. I have to get the robot in the direction. 
Okay, first of all, thanks, thanks a lot for, for the talk. It was interesting. Uh, I will talk about similar stuff that are kind of uh, match my my uh, my interests also my focus. One question is a little bit provocative because you mentioned a lot of activities in terms of outreach and education and uh, science communication, which is a little bit what the previous speaker was talking about. You mentioned specifically uh, that a lot of activities are focusing on young scientists, the students, PhDs. So the provocative part of the question is, uh, yes, indeed, there is a need also for the, the, the young folks, but also for the experienced folks, there is definitely room for improvement. And uh, it's definitely harder uh, to reach out and to really convince uh, a different part of uh, the audience about what would be, is it, for, first of all, of your uh, interest for you? What would be your tactics and methods for actually reaching out to those, those people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, um, for the first part, yes, I am actually very interested to also provide training for more uh, senior staff. And, uh, but I think the problem has happened, like I've tried to contact, um, some just don't have the time. So I think it's about priorities from, from the senior uh, and uh, because, but what I've, when I see in the younger part, which is the master students and PhD students, they're in that phase where they want to explore new things and they want to build their career. So, so when I approach them, they're much more like, oh yeah, we're willing to do it and we have time and uh, yeah. So I think um, the answer to that of why senior staff or more established researchers and professors are, don't, are not giving in, I mean, universities have no incentives when you actually take part in science communication. So I think we also need a structural change where universities actually provide incentives for staff to take part in science communication training. Um, and I, I'm, I have found a few people interested and I think maybe this group that we're hanging out here who might be interested, but then, you know, it's always then we're talking to the same people in the same room and it's just difficult to go out. So we need a structural change at some point where universities start supporting and saying, okay, science communication training is important. This is, you, these are sort of some incentives you get when you, when you participate in training. Yeah. Okay. One more question. You're going to have to be loud there in the back. Uh, sure. Just to follow up on that. Uh, do you really see that very broadly across all universities or are you referring to like a specific type of university just because in my university experience um, science communication was valued as something positive um, for example at ETH I felt there were certainly calls for oh participate in making this video for example like there's a lot of stuff grad students make a three minute video about your research or their organizations or companies like yours that you do hear about on an increasingly regular basis. So I would say it has started, but perhaps you, you're referring to broader picture. Uh, yes. So right now I've contacted mostly universities in Denmark and in Germany. I think those are the um, two so I've been in contact with Munich Quantum Valley and they've been very, very interested. Uh, so we are actually exploring some collaboration uh, eventually. Um, I think ETH, I've been actually thinking of approaching ETH and I haven't yet. So it's nice to hear that you, um, you're from ETH and there is a lot of focus there. Yeah, I, I, I have seen, I mean, some universities really want to support, um, uh, but there are also logistical issues like the... At the, uh, when do I contact them? Because they have a yearly budget, how much money they want to keep aside for training. And uh, and each university might have a different timeline of the budget and planning. So uh, it's a difficult space to navigate, uh, but it's it's ongoing. Yeah. And for ETH, it, it, it would be really great if I could get in touch with you and if you want to do something together. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Shaima again. Thank you. Other questions. Um, so Shaima has put her uh, um, um, contact info up on the last slide. Please reach out to her. Um, I can vouch for her that she's awesome. So I can vouch for all of you. You're awesome. Um, but uh, Shaima had to deal with me for a lot longer than I used to do. <laughs>
Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Shaima. Our next speaker, as I said, the uh, Ilga Did I get that? Yeah. All right. Thank you for the uh, Who I have already introduced, um, <laughs> but we'll introduce again. So, very good. We've got 20 minutes. Take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Vicky. And my apologies for the transition. So, um, uh, as Carrie introduced me, I'm, a, um, I'm an associate professor at the my Department of Microelectronics. So I have a little bit of a different background, I think, from you. Uh, and uh, I am the chair of the electrical engineering education section. And within electrical engineering at TU Delft, we have three different departments. One of them is microelectronics, but there's also the quantum uh, and computer engineering department. So we are a bit like different departments, but the students I train go to that department for a master's program. Uh, so I'm kind of like the bridge in between, and I'm also involved in the quantum information science and technology master's program that's being launched uh, as of this September, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, so uh, a little bit about my background. I had formal training in both physics and philosophy of science, but then later I uh, transitioned to electrical and computer engineering. I have worked in, uh, in, in like four different countries and in several institutions with both liberal arts and sciences and technical university background. And what I'm trying to do right now is to uh, bring the best of both worlds together with liberal arts and technical university. Uh, approach. I'm not going to get into details. Uh, based on the diversity and inclusion and education part, I want to draw from the past experiences that I've had. For example, when I was teaching at uh, in Istanbul, uh, a group of students approached me based on the, the, the gender discrimination that they were going through. They wanted to launch an IEEE Women in Engineering initiative, and that was all like their initiative in a way. And I said, like, yeah, sure, I'm here to help. I can do whatever is necessary. So we started as like this little group, and in a year, with the, the first set of like funding that we got from IEEE, uh, companies were so interested and we found sponsors in this, in two years time, it turned into this uh, like massive uh, series of, of organizations like where uh, we had recruitment events, we had companies paying for it and it was mostly oriented towards um, mostly recruiting women plus, let's say. And uh, uh, at TU Delft, we also, we are suffering from some of the, the gender imbalance, particularly in electrical engineering. So when I started working at uh, the Department of Microelectronics, we have launched a, a similar initiative in a way. Uh, and in the, unfortunately, in, the, in Europe, the way this, these uh, affinity groups are working is slightly different uh, in the US and in, even in Turkey as well. For instance, when we started the Women in Engineering in Istanbul, in the whole of the Middle East, um, there were 16, I think, initiatives. Alone in Istanbul right now, there are 12. Uh, it picks up and uh, like it provides budget. Uh, but in the, in the whole of the Netherlands, there is one, and that's at the UDL right now, and that's our initiative, and, uh, and we became the Benelux uh, chair right now. The reason for that is that there are already existing student associations uh, like the uh, ATV Electrotechnic uh, Association for the students, or the, the university itself promotes diversity and inclusion from a gender point of view from these um, uh, faculty networks. And then we also have a another network uh, for graduates, like recent alumni. Uh, what we are doing with the IEEE Women in Engineering is that we are actually uh supporting this ecosystem in a way that it's not just for the student or just for the faculty we are organizing events that brings together um both faculty and and students you know and um this is just to give you a sense of the numbers in our uh, department in the electrical engineer unfortunately in the master's program it's slightly better uh but this is i'm taking like one example just to to give you a sense of why it's needed um, so we started out in our like small group again, uh, this was the first meeting that we had earlier last year. Uh, we believe in co-creating with the community, so we uh, reached out to them, like, well, we want to start this up, but like, do you really need this? What should we do? One of the first remarks that we've heard, but actually, why uh, about the, speaking of like the pronouns, for example, speaking of the challenges, um, they, they brought up that how, uh, how not very inclusive just women in engineering initiatives are. So we changed our name to Women Plus in Engineering, if that helps a little bit. Uh, and they raised concerns such as how uh, uncomfortable they felt in online lectures, particularly if you're at an institution that uses Teams, for example, because Teams doesn't allow you to add pronouns. So we started to engage in these conversations, which I thought I was a bit sensitive about, about these issues, but apparently not enough. 
So I've learned a lot and we learned a lot uh, from the community and we started, um, we decided that it's really of paramount importance that like we need occasions to sit down and talk in a previous presentation, coffee moments or food being a good instigator for that. And we said like, well, oh, how about we play games? Uh, one of our first events when we launched our Women in Engineering Initiative was to play uh, Dilemma Games. This is a, a kind of app created by uh, Erasmus University in Rotterdam. It has a wide range of dilemmas from uh, scientific, academic, and also including uh, sexual harassment related ones. So uh, we also had a company, uh, Corgo, visiting us. They launched the Women in Technology within the company. So they came to like to have a discussion with us, share their experiences of what was uh, challenging for them and what helped them overcome those challenges. And then we sat down and play a game. And there we have heard more about their experiences in the lab space, for example, and how they were feeling like it wasn't a safe space for them. So it was... Uh, this conversation, this this games that that we played, that led us to create some tools. And one of the tools that uh, we created, this is uh, again credit. Uh, I can give some credit to Zeki here too, when he uh, got me to involved in Q World, for example. In most of the conferences, they have a code of conduct, which I found super helpful. And I actually sat down with the um, Teyu Delft's uh, social integrity officer and wrote a, a social code of conduct for one of the biggest education labs. This is a space where over 100 students spend at least a day of their week. And we see more and more of students uh, of underrepresented backgrounds, uh, gender minorities drifting away from the lab space towards the end of the year, not just because like they're not enjoying it, it's just that they're not feeling safe. We had these incidences where uh, one of the, well, the women uh, could, couldn't complete her circuit building. Actually, it's, it's like not directly related to a quantum, but these like this is elect hardcore electrical engineering training that we hope that these students will go into uh, quantum technology at some point. So she wasn't sure if she, uh, her, um, her friend prevented her from doing the soldering because was he trying to hit on her? Like, oh, let me do the soldering for you. Or was he discriminating against her? Like, oh, you can't do, let me do it for you, kind of. Even those kind of things were not clear. So this is a code of conduct where we listed the um, values and the encouraged behavior and prohibited behaviors in the sense that even um, the act like intentionally and repeatedly disregarding someone's preferred pronoun is, is not, uh, uh, allowed in the lab. And these are, I, um, I've i been working at Teuda for two and a half years now. In my first year, I observed the students and the patterns, and then I literally listed these things based on the things that I've observed. And this is a working document. I can like circulate it if you would like to like take a look at it. Um, and I consulted uh, a um, I consulted a, an organization that I'm going to talk more about also, BHTO, BHTO, it's an uh, organization within the Netherlands that's for uh, STEM education, girls in STEM. And they suggested that uh, in addition to the contact people that you can list uh, for, uh, for certain cases to report, we can also have some code of conduct champions, for example, like I'm a, I'm a former bully who's aware of uh, his or her or there's a participation in the social injustice. Uh, but I've learned uh, from my past experiences and I can actually like, maybe reach out to other bullies because this is a social code of conduct that's integrated in the first years students, for example, when they come in, like the academic integrity, like, like they're not going to plagiarize or cheat. They also sign this. And we had students rejecting to sign this, saying that, well, I joke about women and trans people, I will be lying. So we actually have honest people who are declaring that they are not up to signing this. Uh, so we also need conversations around that. And so far it's being uh, solved by like man to man talks. And um, as I've recently been promoted as a chair, one of the things that I mentioned to the um, management is that I don't have the equipment to have like man to man talks. Maybe it's helpful to have rules and regulations. So that's one example uh, that we do. And then as we started doing this, we had companies reaching out to us. Um, Uber sent a message saying that like, oh, we have this campus in Amsterdam, we want to recruit more uh, like students with like more like diversity background, let's say. Uh, can we come have like, can we sponsor your events? So we started having these events, uh, including ASML, for example, one of the biggest chip uh, companies in the world. Their vice presidents joined our like uh, Christmas uh, event. And then later on during March 8th, 
uh, we had other scientists from ASML coming and motivating our students to study uh, and collaborate with them. So it's picking up. Uh, and then there's also uh, uh, a lot of initiative from the government as well. The Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences conducted this uh, research on social safety in academia in general, and they have this 88 page long uh, report. Unfortunately, the report is only focusing on uh, faculty and staff. So we thought we should maybe look into students as well, but just to hear from them. So we had the social safety in academia uh, survey in our first year, which we're going to turn this into an annual thing uh, as soon as we work out the data management uh, issues. Um, and it was really interesting to hear from what, what it is really like the biggest problem, what draws people away from uh, this, the, like both uh, the lab environment or their education. Uh, it helped us see this was initially based on like uh, from women plus point of view. Uh, but is there anything else you would like to share with us? Part was very helpful that they started telling more about the racism that they're being subject to. Or can you just stop with the Asian jokes like, oh, like those uh, um, from, uh, from underrepresented backgrounds, students uh, raised other uh, concerns. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, VHDO is one of the companies that we are working with. We are asking for help on how to conduct these surveys and what to make out of the, the data that we get from there. Um, so, which uh, brings me to my point about the um, the importance of community and the importance of reaching out, because in academia, we are mostly working in silos. So, uh, in, at TU Duff, we are very lucky to have this initiative that's um, a teaching academy is an overarching entity within campus that helps us connect between different faculties. Uh, there are podcasts, I'm one of the like research and education fellows there, and then also in the women in engineering uh, conferences, we uh, have a lot of interesting discussions on that. Um, and also the VHDO has chosen us as one of the, the good examples, uh, bringing uh, theory or suggestions like policies to practice with the, the examples that we have given. Um, and the way that it's, uh, that, uh, the way that I carry this to uh, master's education is now through my involvement in the uh, quantum information science and technology master's program that is going to start in this September. Uh, I am the, uh, the responsible instructor for the whole of the homologation content and the homologation is where we are going to be spending one quarter uh, bringing students uh, from different backgrounds up to speed. Uh, for instance, we have uh, computer science, electrical engineering, mathematics and physics students joining the program. I'm the person responsible from uh, teaching uh, electrical engineering to computer science, math and physics students, for example. Uh, but one interesting thing is that we are accredited by uh, the Dutch Association, NBAO, or, uh, N -N -B -B -A -O. and uh, I was in the accreditation committee, and one of the questions that we received from the accreditation committee was about diversity and inclusion, and this was something we were not prepared for, like, luckily that I was there at the panel, and I gave draw examples from the, the previous points I mentioned to you, uh, so they do put a lot of emphasis on, on making sure that uh, people uh, of all genders are accepted in these programs and uh, with all backgrounds. Um, moving on, uh, connecting this to outreach, the, uh, the teaching academy, as I mentioned, at TEDOF, uh, has given me this, this um, fellowship that allows me to bridge the gaps in electrical engineering education, and that applies to also applications to quantum uh, electronics and quantum computing in general. Interestingly, when we have um, uh, high school students applying for our department, we ask about their motivation, uh, like what brings them there, what motivates them to study electrical engineering. And the two most common answers are uh, quantum computing and robotics, uh, neither of which we have in our department. <laughs> so, so in the Department of Microelectronics, we do hardcore, like more uh, conventional electronics, but we are connected with the quantum uh, and computer engineering. And robotics is mostly done in the uh, mechanical engineering department, so you can infer. Uh, but we do uh, have a lot of demand uh, from incoming students on the quantum uh, education as well. Um, my last point, hopefully I'm still good on time. Uh, this initiative, for example, that I was very happy to be a part of, thanks to Zeki's uh, invitation, the, we are doing uh, some work in terms of like how to do the outreach, but my 
hope and wish is that that doesn't stay on paper and that we can actually go out uh, to do something about quantum technology education for everyone, uh, not just in terms of the informing people, but also giving them hands-on experiences. Uh, in conventional electronics, that's fairly easy because I have a makerspace, for example. I can um, create projects and go to uh, secondary schools and primary schools. But in quantum, it's slightly more different, so difficult. So that's one of the things that I'm excited about, that I'm hopeful that we can, we can do it. But uh, to wrap up, my point being is that uh, conventional existing um, old school, let's say maybe in curriculums are, uh, are very much in need of like drawing these connections to cutting edge fields and interdisciplinary educational programs like the KIST one that I mentioned is helping with that. But that's not enough uh, extracurricular initiatives uh, like the education outreach and the teaching fellowship that I'm pursuing is really helping with that. Uh, and we see that uh, building a community, networking with uh, similar initiatives is, is uh, very enriching us significantly. The, the synergy is actually helping us uh, build uh, things that we couldn't foresee by ourselves. And outreach um, is uh, one of the critical aspects of the outreach is like the, the co-creation aspect, uh, hearing from the students and the community about what they really need. And um, Many thanks for the uh, for your attention and uh, for the invitation. Okay, one second. Gotta do robot maneuvering. No sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> right. Did, I Did I really do that in public? <laughs> Sorry. Go for it. Thank you very much for your talk. I find this really very inspiring. I actually have um, well, maybe it's a one and a half questions. Um, I'm just curious. Is that allowed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it fills the quota. <laughs> so um, I'm much kind of interested in terms of outreach to um, potentially underprivileged groups because we are always focused, like for instance, in STEM to like more like high achievers. Yep. So what about the underachiever? You know, because I heard yep. stories of how women who would never have seen themselves in science because they were underachieving in science in school, you know, right? with not very good grades. And I think not just women, I think a lot of minorities suffer from that. Mm -hmm. How do you reach out to yeah. them to show them that, you know, they matter as well and they can have ambition in science, even though they are not doing very well? That's, so, a, so that's that, a fantastic question. And that's one of the uh, focuses. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, of course, yes. Like, let me get both yeah. of them. <laughs> Well, yes, as more like a citizen science uh, yeah. related question. Let's say, for instance, like I might have interest in quantum mm -hmm. technology, right? But yeah. I have no background in physics, but I want to be part of this, mm -hmm. right? As a member of the public. So, how would you also reach out to this group of people who might feel I'm too old to be doing, so I can go back to a formal education? Mm -hmm. How would I participate? You mean different exactly. age groups? So, like, for instance, there may be members of the public who are the amateurs, mm -hmm. right? Who's very interested in kind of amateur. As an amateur, yep. but they, I mean, they probably have very limited mm -hmm. uh, background in, in a particular topic, but they have very strong interests. And maybe most of their interests came from reading uh, popular science materials, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you also bring that sort of inclusion of this group of people who may feel inadequate to participate yeah. actively? So yeah. it's not connected. I think that's more than one and a half questions, but <laughs> let me see how many answers I'll come up with. The first one, in terms of the underrepresented minorities and reaching out to them, one of the things that I'm lucky with at say Udelph Diversity and Inclusion Office recently hired someone just for the purposes of like a community science education and like reach out for the underrepresented groups. And they're helping us identify these schools uh, that are uh, for uh, for families of like who immigrated to the Netherlands because in the Netherlands the the uh, the sort of like um, the distinction is being made very early on so the secondary school high school age is a bit late actually to motivate them but by the time someone someone has already decided for them so um, uh, for example the science center at the Udelf, they have the like uh, makers pairs for instance and I got the opportunity to interact with uh, STEM education, actually STEAM even, artists and, and engineers. Uh, so that's how we are trying to overcome that barrier, both using the Diversity and Inclusion Office's help, reaching out to underrepresented, underprivileged schools and motivating them. So that's first step. The other one is that in your half question, you said something, oh, I'm not a, like a physicist, for example. That's also like something sensitive because uh, more and more I hear like mostly quantum computing or quantum technologies being associated with physics. Mm -hmm. And that's actually 
drawing away uh, like electrical engineers do. One of the challenges in my field is that I think electrical engineers too are essential to quantum realization of quantum technologies. Uh, so the first thing would be to communicate perhaps how interdisciplinary uh, quantum technologies are and how from different backgrounds, different layers of education, people can contribute in their own ways. And that, as you pointed out, it could be a citizen science project, for example. But the first step I would like clarify the physics or like computer science or EE, that they're all a part of this. Um, and I think electrical engineering is in a way unique in that sense that they maybe EE people are like putting themselves aside from the, uh, the, the rest, because I can see based on my observation, computer science students or like physics, they're intermingling more easily. If that answers your question and I'm happy to talk more. <laughs> Okay, yep. with that one and a half to two questions, there's some error bars there. Uh, very good questions. Um, we will move on to the next and final speaker. But first, let's thank you again. Welcome to the second session slash panel in the afternoon of the first day. Uh, I also kind of realized that this is a little packed in terms of the program, but you know, every year I kind of realize it and then again, we do the same because there are so much uh, cool stuff to talk about. And well, I'm uh, not as good as Benzel, uh, obviously. So yeah, for no, no, as, a, as, a, as a moderator. So what I will do is I will give each of our panelists uh, like, uh, three to five minutes to make a really short introduction, uh, just, you know, introduce themselves a little bit, and then, you know, just kind of guess why they are a part of this panel. Uh, yeah, because, uh, so let me start by asking, uh, what is the title of this panel? <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, and this yeah. is an inclusion in public good. Yes. Quantum Inclusion Forum or something. Right? Yeah. So it is. It's a little bit complicated uh, title. Elitism, Inclusion, and Public Good in Quantum Futures. Quantum by who and for whom? So the story behind this panel is a couple of months ago when I started, you know, sending out forms uh, for topics to talk about in this event. We received some really cool questions, and one of them was Quantum by who and for whom, and the other one was Elitism and Inclusion, and we decided to merge them into a single panel and have these wonderful panelists to you know just share their thoughts and experiences and expertise on the topics uh so without further uh, you know blabbing i will just uh leave the floor to our panelists and let's start with yakim who is joining us uh online from where i don't know but uh yeah and yeah, yeah. yes Right now, he's probably nothing. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what I will do is I will mute ourselves because I suspect you will hear yourself twice if we don't. Uh, and you have three to five minutes to introduce yourself. And the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me again. Uh, it's a pleasure to to take part in this event, even though that I would have wished that I could have been there in person. Uh, at the moment, I'm in Denmark, uh, but I'm always uh, sort of like in between Germany and Denmark uh, due to that I work at uh, at TUM, uh, but I have my family here in, in Copenhagen. Uh, so that that's sort of like on, on the personal side. So uh, my interest in quantum computing stems from uh, that I have been working on issues of, of innovation uh, from an STS point of view. And uh, quantum is, in that view, I think, particularly interesting because it's, uh, it, it's, it's not a new phenomenon as such, but the commercial interest and the political interest in quantum computing has skyrocketed uh, if we look at the last five years. Um, and that's an interesting phenomenon in the sense that uh, commercial applications and other things that normally are associated with innovation uh, are not necessarily so close. Uh, so it's it's an investment and it's, it's a thing that appears to be something that is a little bit difficult to define um, because in some ways it seems more like an arms race. On other parts, it seems like it's a new economic uh, 
you can say um, potential. Um, and when we look at how uh, different regions invest in quantum, uh, then we also see a very particular uh, elite uh, network of places like Boston, Copenhagen, Munich, uh, places in China and so on, uh, Quantum Valley in the Netherlands. Um, so we see a quite a particular pattern about how particular regions um, who are used to also, um, you can say, uh, brand themselves uh, as being uh, in the lead uh, are also investing heavily now. And it seems to have certain um, aspirations to not only necessarily what will come out of quantum, but also how regions wants to be part of a certain elite, uh, elite uh, region of of, um, of of places where uh, technology is especially well developed. Um, so the things that we look at uh, it, at TUM uh, is partly uh, both what goes on in some of these uh, innovation networks, but we're also looking at uh, public policy and how different states and regions are uh, investing in quantum, why they're doing so, uh, what sort of public perceptions of quantum that then circulate in the wide population. Um, and then, of course, we have some collaborations where we are also looking at, uh, you can say, the public outreach. So how is it that quantum is also being uh, served for the public? And what are the kind of potential pitfalls in terms of what quantum might lead to, but also how do we ask questions about governance uh, in the first place. Uh, so this is a little bit about uh, my interest, uh, which I think in some ways are quite broad, uh, but it's coming from this uh, ident uh, identifying quantum as a very unique innovation uh, as it seems at the moment. Thanks, it was great and it was great on time. So let's continue with Kerry, who was our, uh, you know, strict uh, chair at the previous uh, session. <laughs> and now as a panelist, you can be relaxed and we'll just take 55 minutes to just... Yeah, I will be so rest, rest of the power now. Um, turned out to be that bad. Um, so my name is Kerry Widener. I'm a lecturer in the Quantum Engineering Technologies Labs at the University of Bristol. Um, I got involved in kind of this group of people through my postdoc time at Aarhus University, uh, where I was involved in various um, initiatives, including the QT EDGEVIEW, uh, with, you know, sort of the initial discussions that spawned DigiQ and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I moved up to DigiQ, and that stopped. Um, and um, basically, I... Uh, I kind of, I was like, okay, why am I here, right? And I, I, I thought a little bit about, like, I, I joked that I'm here because I can be kind of American and loud and obnoxious but, and, and opinionated, um, and why not? Um, but I, uh, I'm here because this is, this is a topic that I, that I care a lot about. Um, I'm trained as a cold atom experimental physicist. Um, I still do that. That's my day job, primarily. Um, but I am also very involved and have been very involved since my PhD time in education and outreach um, in sort of questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion, in questions of equity of access. Um, and I just, I, I know that like taking my own example, like 50 years ago, nobody would have let me into a lab because of the plumbing that I have, and that just seemed really stupid. Um, and so there are people around the world that like, don't have access to aspects of, that are like very, very interesting to me. I took a quantum mechanics unit back in like, I don't know, 20, 2008 or something. It was like, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. And lo and behold, I've been able to do that. But like, that's because I'm a white woman from a first world country, at least as far as you could call the US a first world country. And so, um, like that, that sort of that the, the questions of equity of access, um, and you talk about, I mean, the the slide that was put up in terms of the countries that have national quantum strategies and that have made, you know, investments in quantum communities. Um, that you know, it's great. I'm in one that just said we're going to spend five billion pounds or some ridiculous number in the next five years. And I, you know, I get to sit there and, you know, oh, please, sir, can I have some more? 
like so that I can buy big scary lasers and do cool stuff. But at the same time, like what about the people that are, you know, talented, driven, motivated, you know, these people that apply for the doctoral programs that I'm a part of who come from not the states, right? Like that, sh there should be something there. And I think that's an important part of like the quantum ethics and RRI conversation. Done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's that's perfect. And now let's uh, continue with. We already spoke in the previous session, so let's continue with that. Um, so my name is uh, Alexandre Marteau. So I'm a, I've just been appointed as an assistant professor at the TU Delft in the Netherlands. So I'm a I'm a physicist by training. So I was trained in France and various universities, and then I moved on uh, in my career to the Netherlands. And so now I'm interested in the ethics of quantum technologies uh, as a lecturer, as a teacher. So I'm involved in the master program that Ilke introduced uh, during her talk. So the quiz master program. And in that program, we need to have some course that addresses ethical reflection, uh, professional development, uh, reflection in general. And this is uh, where I got hired to basically develop a course that does all of that. So I read the, the literature that people such as you uh, have written and got an interest in ethics and tried to conceive something that is not only relevant to, uh, you know, ethical reflection, but that is also engaging for a group of master students who are not necessarily very interested in, in ethics. Thank you. Yeah, that was very clear. And now, last but not least, you have Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will be short since I gave the last talk, and I think most of you have heard uh, who I am. But in short, uh, I'm a physicist as well by training. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, experimental uh, quantum optics, so, so a little bit different. And I moved on, and I. I was hired by IBM Quantum, so I started to be more and more interested and involved in quantum computing. And in particular, um, at IBM, we have uh, um, a, a team of people that are really focusing on uh, education and outreach. So this what became my focus. At the beginning, I was um, building some content, and then uh, soon I, I grew as the whole team was growing and getting more and more responsibility. And, uh, and now my role is uh, leading a small team uh, to develop the community and keep training people uh, um, across uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and, and the Middle East. And um, what I just want to add maybe as a last sentence uh, is that uh, we do this in, in several, several ways. I mentioned already the creation of content, but we also, uh, organize events uh, as IBM or together with partners and we try to engage uh, different type of so the, the broad community which has different uh, uh, target groups uh, in it in a, in a different in different ways with different methodology so um, I, I, I gave uh, before an overview but yeah that's in short uh, what uh, what I'm what I'm doing and what I'm interested in, interested in yeah, and you know, thanks, thanks again for being here and sharing your experience and expertise with us. So I, uh, I don't want to hug the or uh, the panels too much. I will okay. ask a couple of questions and then leave the floor to you for your questions because we have been. Uh, this is the fourth session, so I assume you will have some questions for for this topic. But I want to ask initially uh, when we say you know this. Elitism, inclusion. Do we understand the same thing, or are there different layers of different types of elitisms? Or, you know, of course, there are different types of inclusion, but you know, within countries, in certain countries, within certain regions, with different backgrounds, education, age, gender. So there, it's a very multi, multifaceted issue. Uh, and when we connect this to what is public good or what's a public good can we make a connection or is the is the connection obvious or do we need to you know just work hard to actually build that bridge between these two concepts and these two approaches 
This is a general question. If anybody wants to be the first, be my guest. This also includes you, Yakif. I can yeah, sure. Sure, that would be great. So I had a, I think it's a very good question because I had a hard time wrapping my head around the topic. There are so many words, this title. <laughs> and the, the main problem I had was around the definition of public good. Like, what do we talk about when we say public good? And I think it's safe to say that we all think of something slightly different in this room when we think of public good. Um, so to that extent, I think the, the paper of Tara Robertson uh, published three years ago on that very topic is, is really instructive because um, basically she says that uh, we all see something slightly different and so we can all push for something slightly different. So it relates to different agendas, different visions, different imaginaries that are mobilized in order to make a quantum happen, so to say. So, and this is where I think we can bridge this question to elitism and inclusion, is that who are the people who get to have a say on what is going to be the narrative for quantum technologies? And while it's easy to point fingers, like I guess we all think of physicists who are rather secluded community who don't like to take criticisms from, from philosophers and ethicists, but at the same time, what the philosophers tell us is that we, the way we develop the technologies is going to put values in these technologies. So it is the moment to discuss what narrative we need to, to put in place. So I guess this is where inclusion and elitism need to be addressed. Thanks. And I see that Kim is as we stand up. I will mute ourselves and... Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I I totally agree. I think elitism and, and public good uh, are basically two sides of the same coin in some, in some ways. So I think on the one hand, there is the, the problem of inclusion, which I think at an epistemic level, uh, we can say that who actually knows what is going on with quantum, what are, where are the big questions, where are the big problems. And as far as I understand, I don't have a physics degree in quantum. I'm only an, a regular engineer, so I, <laughs> I, I cannot assess uh, the, the, the technical insight in the same way. Um, but my understanding from what I hear is that we don't know exactly what kind of quantum technology that might end up being the dominant one. So it's, it's kind of all on the table. And there's a lot of questions about how this uh, may even uh, appear to look like. So I think that we have a lot of uh, epistemic uncertainty around the technology and the potential ways that it might uh, come through on, or not. Uh, and that means that we have a natural way of turning to people inside the lab who may know something about this. But the problem is that they are not actually making the decisions that, as it seems. So those who are allocating the big money uh, are oftentimes not uh, actually in tune with what is being said and done in the lab. Uh, so we have a, a quite large disconnect between how policy is being done, how it's being promoted, what kind of, of things are being promised also uh, towards uh, whatever public good that, that are being articulated. Um, so I think we, we have a quite weird uh, system going on at the moment where it's certainly not sound uh, science leads to sound policy, uh, but rather we have a lot of poli political interest and that seems to pave the way for hopefully interesting science. Um, but uh, exactly how, I think, is very difficult to assess at the moment. Uh, so the elitism seems to be both an epistemic one, but also uh, a political one, and seems to be not really well connected, other than mutual interest about funding. Obviously, if you work in quantum, it's nice to get a paycheck. So obviously... <laughs> Uh, it, you would not say that, of course, don't give us money because we cannot deliver. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, we do have some issues, I think, in that regard, in terms of figuring out, is it the right thing to invest in? For whom? Uh, what are the stakes? Uh, and then again, if we succeed, uh, then who will be the ones to actually distribute the goods? Who will own it, so to speak? Uh, and then leads to the other question of not only inclusion, but also how do we discuss public good and there is not one public good as uh, Alexandra just said uh, it's would that will be a continual discussion about where is it that we want to go with society so quantum for what society quantum for what future 
and who is invited to actually be, take part in that discussion. And I think at the moment, I don't really see the huge kind of democratic inclusion of this. And it might also be very difficult to do. But nevertheless, we have to figure out a process through which that we uh, cannot ensure that things are not going bad, but at least we can try to figure out ways to get people involved in such a way so that whatever might come out of, of quantum uh, could hopefully go towards uh, the good side, the kind of things that people want, the kind of lives that people want, and not so much the other side. Um, but at the moment, this is more like a philosophical position because I think that we have a lot of problematic questions about the, the technology itself. Um, but And then we run into this Collingridge dilemma which is basically that at the moment we don't have enough knowledge to know what the big problems will become, uh, but we also have the potential to do something now with relatively low stakes that could mean a lot for what the technology might come to, to be. Um, so if we turn to responsible research and innovation, uh, the core idea is to see it as a process where we have to somehow figure out how to engage with it. It doesn't really necessarily say exactly how we, we can do that successfully. So I think that 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 will be the big question. And Harry, Fabio, yeah. Say a little something. I mean, it's there there have been a lot of really nice points brought up, you know, especially with regards to like the disconnect between politics and what happens in the lab and the disconnect between what does public good mean. You know, if you ask us, you know, we're 50 people in a room, you might get 100 different answers or so. Um, but then there's, I think there's also a, a lot to be said about where, you know, like, what, what is it, quantum by whom and for whom? Like, you know, quantum so far is the playground of the rich for the rich, right? And like, that's, and, and they say, oh, no, but it's the public good, like quantum computing for, you know, sustainability. And like, yes, okay, there are potential applications in sustainability. The, those are a long way down the road. Anybody saying that quantum technologies is sustainable is feeding you the biggest line of crap um, because it's not. Um, and I mean, I say this as somebody who happily buys big scary lasers, plugs them in and uses them to do stuff that may or may not ever be useful and actually may be used to actively kill people. I don't like that part of it, but it's something that I have to sort of reconcile with myself, both when I like write grants to get funded so I can buy my big scary lasers, but also like, so I can stand up here in front of you people. Like, I just want to put my cards on the table. I'm a huge hypocrite. Um, but I'm, you know, I guess the first step to correcting that is awareness, right? But like, there are ways I think that we can, that we can bridge that gap. Um, right now it, probably looks a lot like making sure that folks from places um, and from circumstances, right, uh, you know, like socioeconomic circumstances where you might as well be in the, you know, middle of Appalachia in the U.S. in terms of opportunities being about on par with, you know, insert other place here that doesn't have great opportunities. But, um, you know, there are a lot of, so that, that's me just kind of complaining about it. But one thing that I really see that's really cool are uh, I read applications for PhD students. I read like 150 a year. Um, and that's me being lazy and not reading all of them. So my coworkers have to pick up some of the slack. And uh, I see a lot of folks applying from, you know, insert Central African country here that I could probably not find on a map because Americans don't get great geography training. Um, but they come in and they've got very little background in, in quantum. Their degree is in engineering because that's where they can actually make money, right? And they say, okay, I'm super interested in quantum mechanics. Why? Because I've gone through QWorld. I have all of these QWorld um, uh, certifications. I've, uh, you know, I'm basically a kids kit developer. I've, been, I've done this, I've done this. I've remotely followed these MIT courses. I'm like, these people have more of a quantum background than I do. Um, and it's because they've had the, the ability to sort of seek out these sort of democratized efforts. And so I see this and I just, I'm like, this is incredibly cool. 
And so like quantum by whom and for whom, like how do I, how do we, how do we get the word out to that, to the, to these populations? But then also how do we train them in the skills that we need, right? Like the people that are going to be turning the bolts. Like one thing I can't train you over a computer to do is to like actually come and work in my lab. Like you can understand all the physics underneath it, all of the electrical engineering underneath it, all the computer science underneath it. But like until you actually touch a knob, like you still you're still missing that key crux, right? Like how do we do this? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. And Fabio? yeah, I think um, so I, I agree with most of what has been said. I will pick one uh, comment from from Kerry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think you started with this uh, with a statement: so quantum is uh, uh, by the rich for the rich, but then you ended up taking some examples or bringing up some example of uh, where it was clearly a uh, democratization of mm -hmm. some, at least access to some quantum resources. And uh, so I think the question uh, is at which level we're talking about for specifically what? So there are parts of what we call quantum, uh, which includes everything, resources, something that uh, we've been discussing not only I was presenting, but also other speakers, they are accessible for everyone. That's the most democratized things in the world, right? If you see a, a YouTube video, uh, almost, almost everyone can watch also YouTube as policies, of course, but almost everyone can watch it. So this is extremely democratized. So there are, um, there are a lot of resources which are uh, very, very open and inclusive in almost the largest sense possible, almost. Again, policies are everywhere, but almost in the largest sense possible. On the other hand, uh, as, as soon as you, of course, you go deeper and deeper in the technology, there are uh, resources, let's call it, or part of this quantum, whatever quantum means as a single word, um, that are accessible only to, to certain type of people. So rich, the rich, whatever, again, rich means, but it's a more, uh, uh, an, an elite premium thing. Uh, this is, I think, something that, uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, is not going to change, and uh, or at least anytime soon, as soon as you develop some, something new where people have invested money, there must be a return, and return is made on profit, and profit is made on someone who's going to pay. And who's going to pay would have always more power in the end for accessing resources than someone that, that doesn't have money. So um, it, 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 in some sort of way, it's a, it's a natural pyramid that, the, that I think if you put resources uh, and on, one, on one dimension and if you put accessibility on the other dimension. Um, so I think when we talk about quantum by room and for room, we should discuss on which level of this pyramid are we talking about. Otherwise, I think this might lead to, to, to some uh, um, misunderstanding, I think, uh, and uh, also different in using certain words, so vocabulary. I hope I, I didn't misinterpret what you said. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, I think we'll uh, my uh, Yeah, so, sorry. Like, we mute ourselves and you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, it's just also picking up on some of what, what um, Fabio said. Um, and I think that. What is also interesting is to look at how our societies are organized. So what is quantum within that? And I think one of the things that is significantly different uh, from, let's say, back in the 50s, where we saw a lot of investment in semiconductor technology, which then has driven uh, the IT development so on later on. Uh, but back then, uh, it was mainly uh, a government-driven investment in basic technology so or base in, in basic science which then down the road led to technology and down the road led to uh, an immense economic boost uh, in the private sector um, what we see now is a quite different picture we see government investments but i think that the 
main economic resources and the other data resources and other infrastructural resources that are needed for quantum is largely on the side of of private corporations who have uh, you know have the power economic power to actually really uh, invest in this um of course the knowledge power the the people who are trained in quantum i think it, as far as i understand from the last meeting we had is still uh, largely uh, in the universities so we will of course see uh, skills and competencies coming from universities then being hired into uh, the private sector uh, and we will see collaborations across which i think you know uh, it, it's not a bad thing at all uh, but we just need to consider that the fundamental tools for as nation state or for us as a people uh, to control what will happen with the technology is just different from what we saw, uh, let's say, 50 years ago. Uh, so this also means, and I think this is also something we see a reaction from large corporations on, is that the distribution of ethics and corporate responsibility is also largely different because big corporations like, let's say, Google uh, or IBM for that matter, um, they will have to take a different responsibility because they are now acting more state-like in certain affairs uh, than we used to see corporations do that just 20 years ago. Uh, so I think this is just also a very interesting aspect of what we can learn from quantum and how we have to think about quantum is that the playing field is just different from what we know of historically. Um, and we have to understand the role distribution in different ways too. So who gets to decide what and how and what is a right approach and what are the problems and how do we deal with that? That's something we actually have to figure out in the present. Uh, and we can't really rely too much on the past in the sense that the, the powers just distribute vastly different now. Thanks. Yeah, can, I, can I say something just very uh, a little bit? Yeah, sure. And then, and so, Terry, excellent. And then we will go to that. Cool. Yeah, just again, like two sentences. One, one thing that we might be, that we should, we might be able to do here is learn from what happened recently in AI regarding this. Because again, it's very like corporate driven, right? Like not, there is governmental investment, yes, but it is very corporate driven. And they have done a lot of things and a lot of those have been the wrong thing. At least, I mean, this is my own personal opinion and hindsight is always twenty twenty. And so like, can we, can we look at sort of where AI ethics is now and use that as like a, a scaffold for, you know, how we can increase sort of democratization ethics, RRI in, in quantum. So, yeah, so I wanted to react on what Joachim said about the fact that uh, we, we need to analyze the different stakeholders that are at stake. Like, it's not like one person is going to make the decisions about the future of quantum. It's not going to be the government. It's not going to be multinational corporations, certainly not going to be the physicists. It's going to be some kind of coalition of different stakeholders who somehow are going to articulate their narrative with their interests. And that's why I think there is a lot to, to learn from what sociology can tell us about, well, the, the different structures of society and well, the, the stakeholders that are, sta that are here at stake. I mean, I don't know exactly the list, I think it's a very difficult exercise, but yet it's it's fundamental if we want to understand by whom and for whom quantum technologies are being developed. So at the end of the day, I think that uh, quantum technologies are uh, uh, so, um, sorry, how does the term again? Techno-scientific promise. At the end, that's what it is. We're not putting forward a scientific talk about why quantum technologies are going to be a good thing for society. We're making a promise to society and everyone has a slightly different promise that aligns with what they want to gain at the end. So if, I don't know, certain corporations align with certain scientists and with the support of the proper governments uh, can manage to get their own narrative of quantum forward, well, I guess they will be the one to make the decision. Yet, I don't think that everyone's on board with that. And that's why everyone here is calling for more inclusion of uh, social actors, of people from civil society. So it is not the same people, uh, basically physicists, 
government and corporations that call the shots on quantum. Yeah, so I think that you also want to say something and then Anna, Anna, can I get you here? Because apparently, you know, we can hear you online. All right, so, so while it's turning around, it's five o'clock and I'm a simple guy, especially at five o'clock. When I look at this title, elitism, inclusion, public good, I was trying to think how to make sense of that. Like I always do is turn it the other way. Um, exclusion, use the term exclusion. And so when I was listening to the panel and, and Joachim as well, um, I was thinking, well, what are the forms of exclusion and processes of exclusion that you've been talking about? And you start seeing, well, there are these different lines, exclusion on minority-based or gender-based or nationality-based or rich for the rich or left out. You also mentioned a little bit about disconnects, disconnects, disciplinary disconnects, uh, policy and the lab disconnects. And when I was wrestling with this, I was, I was thinking about, um, okay, who calls the shots here? Who is deciding? And then Alexander came in just now and said, well, it's gonna be some kind of coalition. So my question is, um, what forms of exclusion should we be looking at in um, previous or other areas that we can learn from? You mentioned AI. Uh, carry so different types of exclusion and how that manifests itself and then do we collectively and who's the collective decide on how to tackle inclusion based on forms of exclusion I'm not sure i'm making sense of that i think that makes perfect sense yeah. yeah. and i'm turning this to fabio for obvious reasons <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yes, perhaps only to second. <laughs> I guess uh, the Avian perspective is interesting. <laughs> um, I think uh, at some level, uh, I mean, the, the number, the, the list of, uh, of possible way of excluding part of the population that you made, it's, it's, uh, uh, as well, I think very, very good. It's like if you, you you capture almost everything that at least I had had in mind that heard today, and it's um, it's almost uh, um, unavoidable that some part of the, the population is excluded at some level. Again, just to uh, refer to what I was saying before, it depends at which level you're talking about. But at some level, there will be some exclusion, and I think it's uh, unavoidable. Uh, we should definitely learn from uh, uh, the past mistakes, but it also, I maybe more than answering, I would like to be uh, uh, provocative, if you want, or somehow looking a little bit uh, uh, a, a different perspective. Yes, we can learn from the past, but the exclusion and inclusion, of course, on the other hand, uh, means something different now than 10 years ago. So the mistakes, uh, or somehow what was what went wrong, if you want, uh, 10 years ago with some technology, 20 years ago, it's definitely, I think, different in some ways, or for, at least for some aspects, uh, than what could be done wrong in terms of uh, inclusion uh, today and in 10 years ago. Because 10 years, 10 year, uh, 10, 10 years from now, sorry. Because 10 years ago, what the discussions we are having right now, we probably, some of them, we couldn't even picture, we couldn't even imagine that we were discussing some of the things that we are actually discussing right now. So what, what in 10 years? So yes, it's a learning process from the past, but I think it's, uh, uh, we can not only base uh, on what happened in the past uh, to, to tackle the challenges that we have, we have right now in the present. Unless other panelists want to just, comment. Just, just very briefly. Um, this is something that I, I thought about actually during the first panel, um, and we'll bring it up just sort of in terms of lessons from the past. But one thing that was brought up in the first panel was like, you can't stop technology from being developed. And to some degree, you can't. And to some degree, you can't. And one thing that came to mind um, was, the, was nuclear prol proliferation. And I'm not here saying that quantum computing and building nukes are the same thing. That's not what I'm saying. But is there, 
is there something within quantum that, I, I mean, I honestly can't even dream of something along those lines, partially because I like to help myself sleep at night by thinking of the good things that I'm trying to do with my life, as opposed to like the, you know, people that can be killed type of aspect. But like, is there something within quantum, and one could even make an argument with, you know, pre-quantum cryptography, post-quantum cryptography challenges, um, that where the damage that can be done is so great that governments, because that's what it was during the Manhattan Project, um, governments have to step in, and even after, you know, uh, have to step in and basically say, like, you can't enrich uranium, and if you do, we're going to sanction you. Um, like, does something like that happen for quantum? I don't know. But, like, that's a form of exclusion. And was that a bad form of exclusion? Like, how far does the democratization of science go? Hopefully we never have to think about that for quantum, but, like, is that something that we need to keep in mind? The bad panelist, I'm asking questions. I want to react on what you said, because I really like this comparison between, you know, uh, nuclear proliferation and quantum technologies. Of course, they're very, very different things, and I don't want to draw technological parallels. But in the case of nuclear proliferation, there was a stakeholder, which was civil society. They were people protesting in very large numbers. There was pressure put on the governments to enact in the direction of controlling the multiplication of nuclear weapons. There is nothing in terms of civil society on quantum technologies, and for the simple reason that it is impossible to understand. I mean, even you know, physicists, specialists, no, not one of us here can claim to have understood everything about quantum technologies. And when you look at the portrayal of quantum technologies in the media or in series like like there is a quantum computer in the latest season of Black Mirror. I don't know if you've seen that episode, but when I saw it, I wanted to throw myself off a cliff. <laughs> because it was not addressing a single issue, real issue of quantum technologies. It was making up new ones that had nothing to do with quantum computers. So how can the civil society be engaged and put pressure on other stakeholders if they have no idea of what's happening? Or they're being fed false narratives. Yeah, exactly. I would disagree on that, but I'm, I'm the moderator. I want to ask you. Uh, uh, so uh, I think the follow up question was from Anne. I'm tempted to change it to what was the Black Bear episode? Um, no spoilers. As long as the pump creature. But what, what I was going to ask was that. When, when I hear these discussions about increasing um, public engagement and how the quantum future will look like, uh, I sometimes think, well, if I were someone who, you know, let's say works in a bakery, uh, builds, repairs cars, something like this, and then I'm living in this world where I'm being asked to engage in future AI development, future quantum development, future um, X, Y, Z, uh, I'm not sure I would, you know, want that. I'd say I prefer to not have it. I don't know how to engage with this. Um, I guess to some extent, I'm just referring to the typical question of how do you deal with increasing complexity of topics and bring that together with public um, engagement, but maybe a slight nuance is just, is that uh, what you want, like, do you want to compete with AI and all these other technologies uh, and get people engaged? Do you think it's more important? Or, yeah, just what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, so some quick remarks because we have three follow up questions. Akim or anyone? I can take and go. There you go. Well, I think yeah. In the average person indeed doesn't have a clue about, I would assume doesn't have a clue about what we should do about quantum technologies, but I don't think this is how we should phrase the question. I think everyone has some idea of what kind of future they want to live in. And I think this is more about that. We, we don't want them to enact, I mean, to tell us what policy we need to do, but we need to involve people from civil society and every stakeholder to give their opinion of what kind of future they want to live in. 
And at the moment, I don't think they are given so much this opportunity. In spite of the many efforts done, for instance, by IBM to include as many people and have a conversation going. Uh, yeah, Kim will add something and then we can. Yes, very, very briefly. So, so I think it, it's likely that we will look into two scenarios. One is, is currently and then for the next couple of years where quantum would be a little bit like the Manhattan Project, where it's happening in very quite a few places, uh, but with very high technological capabilities. Um, and then there might be a different situation uh, down the road where quantum technology will be widely distributed uh, in a different way. But I, I cannot say how that would happen at the moment, but it could also just be access to quantum computing and not so much having the quantum computer yourself. Um, but I think that the right question is this, I, I would follow the same line as Alexander here is to say that people may not know exactly how it works or how it will end up, uh, but they do know uh, or they should know something about what kind of society, what kind of future they want. And I think it's very important that we find ways to address these things that are about the normative direction of society. And then we can align how we approach things like quantum quantum computing and quantum technology in ways that are more or less aligned with these ideas of the future. And at the moment, I'm not really sure exactly uh, for what we are developing quantum computing. On the one hand, it seemed like it's for economic progress, uh, but again, for whom? And then on the other hand, we also have these military applications. We have the cryptography issues and so on. So it also seems to have this other side, which is not as debated in the same way um, and I think at least we need to open the debate about why do we want this technology and also if this technology will happen, how do we ensure that we have a stake and something to say uh, in the direction of the technology and how we will continue with it. Uh, so I think this, this is a question of practical uh, inclusion at a level where at least on the normative level, uh, people do have a say. Excellent, Fabio. Yeah, I, I think I see a lot of interesting opinion, uh, or just say my personal one. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of a, a maybe different perspective. Do we want to engage everyone? First of all, why? Why do we want to engage everyone? I, I personally don't think we want to engage everyone. What I would like to be able to, to do is to uh, put out there, the tools or the resources that are able for everyone to um, have a, a certain grasp, a certain, at least a, a minimum understanding, not of what the technology is and what exactly, how you build a quantum computer, but what the technology does. That's, I think, also what, uh, what for me, it's a, an important distinction. What is the technology? I don't think, the majority of the population uh, needs to know what is a quantum computer and how it works. I think a lot of people should know what it does or what it will do in in, in few years. That's, I think, a, a distinction I would like to, to bring maybe up to discussion. And, and the second thing is that based on that, uh, do you want everyone to understand what the technology is? I think not. I think you want a lot of people to understand what the technology, the capabilities of the technology. You don't want to have everyone developing or a, a, a people building their own quantum computer. This is not, I think, interesting. This is not the, the final goal. You want people to be able to not be scared and to be uh, not uh, wandering around and uh, believing what black, the next Black Mirror episode will tell them. So this is for doing that. You just need people, just sorry, just need people to understand a little bit what a, what actually this technology can do. Any comment or uh, there are other questions? Yeah, you can. Uh, we can continue during you know. Uh, so was it uh, Alexander or Natasha? Yeah, I had a question, but actually, uh, I think Fabio is made the comment that I wanted to make, which is there is this really important distinction between people being able to be informed about what the application is and how it will impact their lives versus um, starting with the kind of fundamental principles of physics. And actually, I think that presents a real barrier 
to people feeling like they can be involved in the democratization process. If we're starting with entanglement and supervision and trading as cat, it's going to scare people off before, way, way before they have the capability to understand what the societal applications are. Um, but yes, <laughs> have you already very nicely with that point. Um, and actually, Carolyn, um, who's speaking tomorrow, Mira and I are uh, writing a paper on, on this exact topic. So. Yeah, that, that's great. Looking forward to it. And maybe it's a very brief comment um, that, yeah, it, you know, I, I was when Fabio was speaking, I was like, oh, this is a lot like, you know, my understanding of like an internal combustion engine. I have a PhD in quantum physics. I don't know how my car works. OK, I don't have a car, but if I did, I don't I wouldn't understand how it works. But, but like I sure do enjoy driving it and going from point A to point B and, you know, having that control that it, that it provides me. Right. But I also understand like the implications of it, right? I shouldn't be driving my car if I've had a few drinks. You know, I shouldn't be driving a car if I want to, you know, have a carbon footprint that isn't the size of the state of Texas, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and I think that you can sort of find, we need to find level, levels of abstraction that don't scare people off that think that I have to know what a qubit is to understand the implications of like a quantum computer that can factor primes. You don't even know, need to necessarily know what a prime number is to understand that, you know, the thing that makes quantum cryptography, or sorry, that makes, you know, credit card transactions go is the fact that there's a problem that's very easy to check the answer, but very difficult to find the answer, you know, and there's actually, you know, you can give people examples. I, I was, I forget what it was. I was somewhere, it was pint of science. That's right. And I just picked two random primes. It's like 31 and 73, and I multiplied them together. And I was like, all right, factorize, you know, whatever that turned out to be. And everybody just sort of looked at me like I had three heads. And I was like, there you go. Like, <laughs> this is a really easy, but it was really easy for me to take out 31 times 73 equals whatever. And so, like, yeah, where, where do these levels of abstraction lie? And where are they necessary for people to understand what, what quantum technologies are and what the implications are? We'll see this brief follows me, sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one uh, question for you. Oh, okay. um, yes, thank you very much for the discussion. I think it's very, very interesting. And also the discussion about democratization of technology. And um, I also wonder what, what does it actually mean? Um, because I agree that we cannot ask the everyday citizen, whoever that might be, to be informed about emerging technologies and have a vote on that. But then we would probably end up, uh, as you said, we would all fear of the like mirror and with everybody would say, no, we don't want quantum because quantum destroys the earth that I saw on the from sci-fi movie. I think democratization would probably mean something else, namely to have the opportunity to participate in the development of the technology. And this participation, however, is not given in every aspect of the technology for several reasons. I mean, but the topic of inclusion popped up. If you're living in a certain country in the world, you can become a quantum technology engineer. If you're not, you, you cannot, easy thing. Uh, I think the other problem where I do not get my head around, but I think, it, I, but I think it's something to, 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 to attribute and to articulate here is the, the problem of proprietarity. So on the one hand, you have private, companies, or maybe let's put it differently. Um, you were comparing quantum technologies to nuclear bomb. I think this is a wrong comparison. They're interesting comparison, but I think this is wrong. I think the, the better interesting comparison would be to the metaverse. What Facebook, or now Meta, tried to do was to say, we build a platform, the metaverse, and this platform will be the future of the internet, but it will be run on a Facebook computer system. It will be run on Facebook, blah, 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 blah. blah. So Facebook basically, took over the things that were already happening in things like Decentraland or in the whole crypto world where they tried to build metaverse and they, they brought, they tried to took it up, put their stamp on it and put a proprietary lock in front of it. So that means whenever you want to contribute something to the development of this technology, you have to go through the store, meaning you have to pay us, you have to do licensing, whatever. I think the same is happening here with quantum. And I really like the activities uh, Fabio explained with, with uh, what IBM is doing all around the world and how they educate them, uh, what's called uh, his kid. But at the same time, this is a strategy to 
position IBM as the major player in the development of quantum technology, which holds the risk of that other participants, other actors cannot contribute to that when they're not going through the IBM. So this is why we have ideas of open source, for example, so, or, or open science in general, so that we have an accessibility to, uh, to the development of technologies so that everybody can contribute. And here now, I don't know the answer to this problem because what I see is that private companies need to go forward with it. Private companies need to put patents on the development, otherwise they are not. They are not uh, in, in more. Uh, they are not uh, motivated to work on this. And I can see that. But I think here we come to the problem that transparency only goes so far. It only comes to a certain point. And this means also uh, participation in technology development can also go can only go so far. So, yeah, now I think I kind of lost my train of thought, but yeah, what I want to throw in here is maybe it's not democratization versus uh, uh, open access or open, but I think maybe it's a, it's a question of proprietary and how we deal with this. Yeah, just to remind you that we have a paper on that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to read it. You should, that's exactly on the topics that we described. So, any common feedback if not i will again <laughs> thanks for this comment and uh yeah so um yeah uh, well actually what about the but then it's also for you um, so you said that, for example, with the car and the engine, you don't need to know how the engine works to drive the car. And I agree with that. I mean, I don't know how my phone exactly works, but I can use it. But there's this paper by Grimbaum. I don't know if you've read it, but he says if we just skip over, like, not explaining what superposition and thing, and like the underlying physics is quantum technology will remain a black box. They don't know exactly, like, people won't grasp what physicists and engineers, what they are doing in a lab. And this will be det detrimental for the trust that people will have in the technology. This is just like a statement that he made, but that's what I wanted to ask you. Like, if we skip over superposition and then with all the physics concepts, do you think it might be detrimental for the trust that people have in the technology? Maybe I can add something to this while uh, referring this, uh, to it. Would we get something like people burning down 5G towers, uh, people burning down quantum computers when the next pandemic is? That's uh, the best thing. Well, I'm sitting in my lab on the Okay. I really don't think so. I, I really don't think that's. Uh, um, even when you study algorithms, there's something that's called a black box. <laughs> so even at some, okay, this maybe goes a little bit off topic, but at some point it's fine if there is a black box. You don't have to be able to understand everything to uh, being able to handle it. In a way, handle it, of course, depends on what would end in this case. But taking exactly the example of the, of the car, how many, how many billions of people know how the uh, combustion engine works? Not that many. They can still, they don't, don't destroy the car, they don't overreact to it. If there is a certain level of trust on the technology, in this case, it's a, a, an old technology, um, and there is no uh, fear of that technology. Now, I guess the question is not so, so much of, is it fine to be a black box? I think the, the real question is, how do we build that trust? Because I think from, from my personal perspective, absolutely fine if it's a black box and almost no one understands, almost no one, because it's 0.1% of the population is almost no one. But how do we, how do we build as an as a ecosystem, as a quantum ecosystem, that trust in that technology so that uh, the next circuit of Black Mirror or Quantum Mania, what, uh, the, the, the Marvel movie that we've seen before, don't... Uh, create that, uh, don't push even farther this uh, aura around quantum uh, and the mystery around it. So how do we build the trust? That's, I guess, the, the real question is. Can yeah. I add something? Uh, sure, and then we will go to Yakim. And Marisa uh, has her 
and up, but I don't know whether it's a comment or a question. If it's a question, let's just or after after this. No, it is. It is. It is. It's, it's a small comment of this because, uh, and and I'm sorry, but it, when we say something like we just heard about we need building trust and a black box uh, and, and loving arguing for the, the, the nature of argumentation itself. Um, it's not who knows and if it's a really small percentage of people that know. Trust is a, 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 of, of the capacity of generating transparency exactly with the ones that know. And when I hear about black box, even from the aspect of regulators and all of that, when we're talking about this black box, it's not the black box of the planes, that when it's found, it's open and it's understood. What we are talking is another era of black boxes that we use arguments like, uh, well, nobody understands, but we need to trust. And, and we start talking about this 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 formulas as something that is not up for our understanding and we should be uh, uh, okay with it so the building of the trust especially for systems that are regulated as well is that you are able to monitor you are able to uh, to to know how it works and not uh, go into a world that sounds to be honest almost like a religion trust because we tell you right so it's it's i think if we want to build trust boxes need to be open and and that's what i want to leave as as a comment yeah thank you and yeah Kim, can you take over yeah thanks um so i um I, I was going to say something uh quite similar um and i think that it's it's dangerous to um, try to think of a society in which we leave uh, the inside knowledge uh, to um, a, a, a small, uh, you can say, expert community. And then we say the rest should just be concerned with the application and the use. Um, I think that, that it might be impossible to get everybody to think as a quantum physicist. And I think that's not the scope at all. Um, but we do need to think about what is the minimum uh, amount of knowledge uh, that we need uh, a public to have in order to be, um, you can say, equipped to engage with a critical discussion about these things. So I think that should they be able to see through uh, the black mirror and see that that that's a complete, utterly, uh, sorry to say, BS perspective on, 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 on quantum, uh, or should they uh, be able to see through uh, some of the claims being made on part of the technology and understand that uh, that this is kind of a commercial interest speaking uh, or to what extent uh, do we really need them to to be able to see this so I think that um, democracy works uh, not because everybody is experts uh, but because we have a level of transparency and we have a certain level of knowledge uh, and information flow that means that we have governable objects uh, in circulation and uh, the question is, of course, where are these thresholds and how do we coordinate between different expert communities so that uh, what is going on inside the lab of quantum physicists is also coordinated uh, both with how politicians are making uh, potentially quite important decisions, um, but also how uh, do we want all of this to be responsible towards a public. And I think that that public has to be knowable. And we have to consider the public as capable of being knowable, but we also have to figure out, of course, what exactly that means. Uh, so for me, I think that it's always about being practical, uh, but uh, we also need to be practical in a way where we don't uh, idealize certain distinctions in society that may end up being extremely problematic down the road. Okay, so Rob also has his hands up. Uh, Kerry or Alexander? So. Yeah, so Alexander, and then Rob, and then we will come back to you, Kerry, and then we will do the closing rounds. Yeah, I very much agree with what has just been said. I just wanted to add a little talk a lot about the building trust and engaging the society, but I feel like there is like those undertones of defiance towards the general public somehow they would be, you know, 
just an angry populace that has irrational fears and we don't actually engage them genuinely and don't want to actually listen to whatever they have to say, whatever, whatever future they want for quantum. So I think we also need at some point to, fa to face the fact that this defiance needs to be fought against. Yeah, and Rob? Um, yeah, so can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I guess I, I was just thinking about the analogy with cars and telephones. And what I realized is part of our trust, particularly with cars, is that um, probably all of us know someone who repairs cars. We know the person who repairs our own car. Um, and probably many of us in academic circles also know people who are became, you know, engineers for different companies, uh, designing and building cars. Um, but probably almost everyone has that experience of knowing someone who knows a lot about cars. And I guess the same for computers. Almost everyone knows someone who knows how to, you know, fiddle with the operating system of their computer and get rid of the viruses or whatever. So somehow it seems to me that there's a strong connection between even if I don't understand the technology, I know someone who does. So this idea that it's a black box for me, but I know someone for whom they have seen inside the box. Uh, is somehow important uh, for getting society to trust the technology and to trust the people who who develop it. Um, how we so I guess that's what we have to do in quantum as well, and it will happen naturally as more jobs are created, more and more people will start to understand it. But it's good to think about how we can uh, make that work well. Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you are proposing we should have a meet your quantum physicist day <laughs> and like open public and ask your questions. Uh, so I will just get some yeah. comments from Kerry, yeah. maybe. I have a direct comment on that. Um, I, I disagree with the statement a bit that we, everybody knows someone who actually knows something about a computer. I don't know how a compiler works. I know maybe an operating system, but really deep down, how does a computer work? I have no clue. I can even write code, but I don't know how this code is at the end to stay to actually running on the machine. It's already living in this world of the black box. Like not many people know how actually deep down the code gets translated into something that's actually running on the machine. So, and we also don't argue on that. It's just the, the, the majority of the technology, everybody trusts in it. So not, not the black box is a problem. Everything is a black box if you just dig the AI, if you dig deep enough. Can I make one tiny as well? Maybe you can come here and make it because I think it would be harder with the background. And we also need to move to the next panel because, uh, yeah, we have been talking about this for the last 70 minutes. <laughs> one tiny comment. And I wonder how much of this trust in cars and computers is the fact that they are well established. We've been through many, many iterations of, of using them and we've all had that experience. And we same with planes. Like, I think planes are possibly even even better example in cars because we have it's very hard to have an intuitive idea of how a plane stays up in the air, um, and yet we we all fly and we've taken. But because the the aviation industry has been going on for decades and we we've seen the work and it's more a question of empirical um, verifiability that these systems work. So maybe that's part. Of it. Um. Kerry, you had the last word. I think I get to have the last word, which feels almost unfair. Um, but I, I think there's been a lot of really nice discussion around this. Um, and I think that one of the fundamental differences um, between kind of the, the discussion that's been had and some of the comments that were made was that there's, there's a level of trust, but trust and faith are very different things. Um, and when that was brought up, I, my hackles raised. And I think it's it, it, honestly my religious upbringing and there, that has nothing to do with anything other than myself. But like at some point, every time I've gotten behind the wheel of a car, I've been able to know that there was somewhere I could go to learn how it worked. And, you know, I fixed my car because of a YouTube video. You know, okay, it was the window, the automatic window thing, not like the engine, but still. Like these resources exist. And I think there's an, 
one of the ideas is sort of the at what level down to what level of abstraction are you willing to go you can write code but do you know like how the transistors flip in the chip right like there but you could you could if you wanted to you, you probably know where to go to, to learn about it um and so what i think we need to do in sort of a democratization process is to, is to have those layers and in many ways, your ability to dive down is going to be a function of sort of your day job, where you sit on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and like where um, and what your own personal interest is. Like, I don't know how an internal combustion engine works because I'm too busy shooting lasers at things. Um, and to some degree, honestly, I can't tell you how the laser works. To some degree, I can. To some degree, I'm like, yeah, I don't know, I'll learn it if it breaks. Um, but like, but, but the thing is, is that that knowledge exists. I, we can, we, there's the knowledge, you know, we, we need to be able to make sure that if somebody truly wants to know what's under the black box, you know, when you, when you should be, you've got these chandelier like computers, right. That IBM loves to show around because quite frankly, they're extremely cool. Right. But like, we need to you know, pun intended also, um, the, um, uh, but we know where to go to learn more about them. And what we need to make sure that we can do is point the public to where to go to learn more about it. And one place, again, opening another can of worms, and you can yell at me at dinner for this, but like one place we can learn from this are, uh, is, is the, the vaccination community, right? Like how many of us just kind of had to trust what an mRNA vaccine was? I've had three. I know roughly how they work. I know they allowed me to get my life back. That was sweet. But like, do I know the like nitty gritty? And it was a new technology and a lot of people freaked out about it. And, you know, should we be disparaging those people or should we be helping to educate them? Like it just, again, lots of things to think about. We need to move on. I'm done. <laughs> thank you. And so let's thank to our panelists for a vote. I know it's hard, the last session, and these folks are sitting between you and your dinner, so their job is really tough. Uh, but this will be an interesting session like the other ones. So we have three panelists, uh, Clarissa Ayileng Lee. Hi. Butchered it, or say it right, correctly? Yes. Excellent. Yes. And we have Marissa Montero Borstom online. You see her up there. Then we have Rebecca Coates, whom you met this morning. All of them have very different backgrounds that they're going to share with you in a minute. I will give each one of them up to five minutes, five, six minutes, so that they can start telling you what they're doing, although we know a little bit of Rebecca. And then I'm gonna ask a question and get the ball rolling. Uh, let's have another fruitful uh, collaborative discussion together. So, Clarissa, let's start with you. Okay. Just introduce myself or just what I'm going to say? Uh, introduce yourself and okay. I want everything, you know? I'm not sure. I want everything. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Clarissa. Well, you already know my name. I'm Clarissa Eiling Lee. So, um, I'm technically not a newcomer to quantum technology, but also a newcomer in the sense that I actually left uh, the study of this area uh, for quite a while because my original uh, PhD dissertation actually was focusing a lot on high energy particle physics pertaining particularly to discovery of the Higgs boson and I was also very interested at that time in the concatenation between quantum information and high well kind of like elementary particles because they're kind of quite connected and then when that left it aside because I went back to the third world, right, where it's kind of quite difficult, since where we talk about questions of access and democratizing knowledge again. I actually went to look at more established uh, technology, which was nuclear technology, but rather than looking at the sexy part of making weapons and big uh, nuclear power plants that can blow up, I was actually looking at the more mundane uses of nuclear technology in developing worlds. And this actually got me very interested in the questions of risk, and the question of security, also the question of like, you know, scientific diplomacy is a form of bargaining chip 
in a political, um, how to say that, negotiation and the things they do behind closed doors, right? And I, I do this is actually one area of my sort of like more boring interest. Well, maybe it's not really that boring. So like more technical interest. My other area, actually, I work a lot actually on art science. And the reason why I'm so interested in education is because I'm actually very interested in how do you liberalize STEM education and of course to the utilization of the arts. Well, okay, this instrumentalized arts. But pretty much how you can actually use art as a sort of like equal and um, equally valid approach to approaching science. Because one of the things I'm thinking a lot about, for instance, is the idea of math literacy. I think we, can, we tend to forget about this when we talk about quantum mechanics, why, a lot, why there's a huge dropout rate in physics education, mathematical access. Good math education is the really bad math education. So these are sort of like, uh, things I'm kind of very interested in. And uh, the other thing I actually do a lot of work on is actually, in a way, it's kind of speculative design and science fiction as well. And probably I'll bring some of that into my discussions of narratives as well, because whatever we had to say about emerging technology, which is actually not really emerging, I mean, technically, quantum tech has been around for as long as um, nuclear technology. It's just that, you know, the same people who, who created the foundations for nuclear technology or also the same people who created the foundations for quantum technology. It's just that obviously there was no policy interest, there was no industry interest, there's some military interest, and it was pretty much a well-kept secret. So, and obviously there's no kind of proliferation of this capability of what it could do because for a long time, a lot of this original ideas were also kept under uh, lock as well. So, so yeah, so that's uh, kind of like a very interesting thing to think about emerging. Like we, we talk about AI as the emerging technology that's no longer emerging, which also has an extremely long history. I'm not sure if you actually read this book by Roger Penrose, where he wrote about the emperor's new clothes. I think that was the title of his book, where he talked about, about AI and quantum computing together. And basically, kind of like, which demonstrated how intricately connected they are as, and it all kind of boils down to how you actually um, how structure the logics of the mathematics they are using, right? Like, you know, like algebra, how it could be used in the classical uh, setting and how it can use in a different kind of quantum logical setting. So, so these are some of the things I'm interested in, not all the things I'm interested in, but I think the most pertinent to this discussion. Thank you. I didn't go beyond five minutes. No, it's just three minutes. Oh, okay. Can I continue? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move to Marisa. Uh, I will also try to be in the three minutes because then we spend more time for the rest. So my name is Marisa Monteiro Borsbaum. Unfortunately, I'm not there with you. Uh, very, very envious uh, from my side, but I couldn't. Uh, I'm a little bit different from most of you. I'm a lawyer. I come from humanities uh, and uh, my path was quite singular. So I was um, more free agent of my own life. So I've been in many uh, different industries in many different roles. And um, as I matured, I understood that there I had a question in my mind always. And it was very simple. It was, do we know what we need to know? So I started thinking about literacy and the 21st century emerging technologies. I'm very curious. My hobbies are seeing uh, documentaries on science and physics was always one of my passions. And you think, well, I, do, I cannot explain you, but I can understand, right? And that's very interesting to start what we're going to talk next. So I can spend hours understanding or listening to others without being able to go to, to the depths of the, the, the knowledge, but understanding, interacting with that knowledge. So Humanity of Things Agency uh, was created to be the other side of things. We have Internet of Things, we needed to have Humanity of Things and to bring the power of humanities to the, the table. As we move forward, nothing will be more important than what we already know in the realm of humanities and we need to create this bridge uh, between knowledges and we need to be more quantum beings on itself. I think we are very, very uh, um, 
engaged in the silos type of mentalities who are quite stuck in wills uh, because um, the last little stretch of history uh, drove us to what is now all these experts and specialities and all of that. And we forgot the capacity of people to be more Renaissance minds like, meaning we maybe are not experts of things, but we have license to think and to be scholars of life on itself, be curious, be interested, um, and be what I believe a need in free societies, active citizens. So Humanity of Things Agency is now part of a task force of the Center of European Policy Studies in Brussels on quantum computing and cybersecurity. We've been part already in a previous um, task force on AI and cybersecurity. And, and I believe that that's also the table needs to have people that are not only the vendors of the topics, or the builders of the topics. And that I think will have a benefit for us all. So I hope that to have a very interesting um, experience today, giving all that I can give you and learning as much as I can. Thank you, Marissa. Arabica, let's see about you. Do you want a, an introduction to myself or a response to the topic? Uh, maybe a response to the topic because everybody knows you yeah, since you were the first. Topic. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. So um, you'll, I'll introduce myself already this morning. Um, so in terms of the topic that we're going to discuss today, can we um, really understand each other is my take on that. And I've got two perspectives on this based on my research, one around public engagement and the other one around what I call inclusive collaboration. But before I go on to those, I just wanted to, I guess, um, raise two things in response to the discussion earlier and to keep our focus. The first one was to remember the stage of development that we are at with quantum computing, which is my focus, and also say quantum technologies. And this is the frame and the context. I think that it's really important particularly when we're trying to um, draw parallels with other technologies that have been around for a much longer time, have far less um, unknowns and, and far less risks. So that's one um, point. And then the other point I wanted to use to frame my, um, my contribution here is to remember our objective that we're interested in responsible quantum technologies. And that we, we have frameworks that we're using from responsible innovation or responsible research innovation. And responsible technologies means considering all these questions of, um, you know, how much does the public know? Does it matter? Does it matter that there's a lack of transparency? All of those sorts of things. And uh, I th I th yeah, I think that's really important to, to consider when we're, we're debating these topics. Um, so back to public engagement, the, the first thing uh, that I, I think is important when we're considering can we really understand each other from the perspective of scientists and the public, the first thing as a social scientist I would say is that we don't actually empirically know what the public think or how much they know about quantum. Everyone keeps on talking about it and saying the public know nothing um, or the public don't want to know, they just want to go and do their own thing. But that's just your opinion. That's not actually a fact, it's not a scientific fact. You haven't done research on it. And I know, because I've looked quite a long time, there is very few or very little research done empirically on how much the public know about quantum computing or quantum technologies. To my knowledge, there's been one report done in the UK by Cantar Republic. And I haven't found anything else, but that's something that I'm trying to rectify soon with my own research. So that's an important thing, because as a social scientist, I don't go about just saying commonsensical things and acting like I'm some expert of nothing that I know nothing about. You've got to base that in some sort of fact. So put that to the side. So then we come to the idea that how can we know the public's perspective if A, we don't know it empirically, and B, they don't understand the science enough or we can't explain it to them. That, that creates a bit of a problem. And why does this matter? It matters because the public need to be informed 
to have the dialogue that responsible innovation needs so that we can ensure the dialogue and the technology is ethical. Without that, we can't say it's responsible or ethical. Um, and so part of that too is understanding that the, the public don't necessarily need to understand, you know, how quantum entanglement works. They need to understand the parts that are important to them. So that means the implications of the technology on their lives and the risks and the benefits to them at a minimum. Okay, so the other part of how can we really understand each other that impacts on my work is around this concept that I said of inclusive collaboration. So I've worked um, over the last few years that I've been doing stuff on quantum. Uh, I've worked with people from a number of different disciplines and had first-hand experience of how challenging it can be to try and talk about something when you come from different you know, disciplinary backgrounds. And the things that I've learned from that have been that we need to have respect for each other's knowledge. Um, we have to uh, recognise that there's a level of dependence in that collaborative relationships um, and that the colleagues need to, we all need to recognise the need for responsible innovation. And that's one thing I think has been really helped I'm working in cybersecurity, where there's a lot of concern around the safety and the implications of quantum computing on cybersecurity. Um, so they're seeking out responsible innovation as a way of tackling this problem. And part of that's based on this uh, human-centric approach that the people I'm working with have. Uh, and lastly, it's to think about that inclusive collaboration is ongoing. It's not something that you just do once and, and you forget about it. It's an ongoing development thing that you can do throughout. Like I see this as going forward, like the technology is such a early stage now. At each stage, this will all change. We'll have to keep on having these discussions. And so in closing, I wanted to say that my perspective is that we can never really understand each other due to our unique experiences and our differences in training. But what we can do and we can try to do is find the center, the part that overlaps in our knowledges. And you can you know, try different processes and ways of doing that. And if you find that overlap, that's the zone that you can collaborate in. And that's the place where you need to, to respect. So that's my um, yeah, statement on can we really understand each other. Thank you. Uh, let's, okay. let's continue because I saw you were nodding a lot, so and reacting yeah, um, a lot. So I, I think it would be nice follow up from you. So yeah. Clarissa, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Actually, what you everything you just said is actually a very nice segue to my approach to thinking about interoperability mm -hmm. as well as narratives. I'm actually going to wear the hat of the humanist uh, who also works with physics a lot and so to bring in some imaginaries as well as metaphors on this topic of the operator because we all know that I mean for there's since half the room are people with physics background I'm sure most of you know that the operator is a very important uh, it's, it's, it has a very important identity in quantum mechanics and pretty much quantum mechanics would not have existed without the operator and then the operator is kind of like, you know, how you actually manifest observability in quantum mechanics, right? So let's start from there. And then going from that particular perspective to think about the kind of explanatory narrative that could actually be constructed from this idea of the operator or interoperation from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic scale. So the first thing I was thinking about is interoperability because the operator pretty much translates something that is uh, originally uh, not really observable and potentially not measurable in the direct sense that you think about measuring in, you know, in classical, in non-quantum physics. Then thinking about how you actually would then translate um, what is what is not measurable to something that's measurable. So, and we talked a lot actually about standards and measurement throughout today of certain ways of thinking, right? How do we think when we talk about uh, non-quantum computers versus quantum computers, right? Non-quantum devices versus quantum devices, even though um, 
physicists, uh, computer scientists, uh, engineers as well have actually been working with you know quantum mechanicals. I mean quantum systems on classical uh, on classical devices for de several decades, right? And to think about what how does how does that actually change the way in which we perceive the outcome of doing computational work on such classical devices, I put in quotation marks, when they are ported into the so-called uh, quantum computational or quantum computer, quantum computable, uh, quantum computable devices, right? So, um, so, the, so this quantum system and quantum technologies is also about how these ways of thinking, we think about prob probabilistic way of thinking about what were essentially microscopic qualities become measurable and become obvious in the classical sense. And I think this is actually this point where it becomes very important in our attempt to communicate what quantum systems or what quantum technology is to the public, right? Because this is actually where they can actually observe. I mean, even for physicists or any other uh, physical scientists who don't have to do not um, mundanely work with quantum systems, this is also something that's uh, where they actually could have a handle on what's going on behind the operations. So I'm using this term operations, not just in terms of the observable now, but also in terms of the inner workings. And we were, we've been talking a lot about the black box previously, so I want to bring the idea of operation into the idea of how does the black box operate, right? And when we talk about the Schrodinger cat, which came up a lot as a metaphor, right? And the idea how uh, the Schrodinger cat is a manifestation of the collapsing of the quantum system once measurement actually takes place. So for me, if I want to do a sort of like a very liberal extrapolation of what that means, it's like, we probably do not know what happens in the black box, nor do we care until something breaks down. Like we don't really care about what's wrong with our car until it breaks down. And when we have to figure out how expensive it is to repair it, then we actually want to know how much, I mean, what are the parts that break down and would it be cheaper to buy a new car or to repair all these parts? So that means this when you actually start unpacking the black box. So, so this is actually one way I want to uh, get us to think about measurability as well in terms of how the black box gets um, unpacked. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is also uh, inter interoperability. And I think this is something that moderator has a lot to say about across disciplinary priorities, right? How this quantum technology looks like. We talk about disciplines norm normally or normatively allude to disciplines within academia. But what about the less clear-cut disciplines that operate outside of academia and the people who operate you know, in industries who are uh, policy makers, who are nonprofits, who are part of civil society, right? What would their priority be? Like for instance, if I as someone in civil society or I'm a policy maker, I want to unpack the black box of quantum technology, what is my priority in wanting to understand how it works and what is my end game? What is my goal for understanding its operation? So, and this is actually part of uh, something I've been observing for the last few months because I managed to kind of like join a quantum biology research group. Um, as a non-quantum biologist, as neither a biologist nor a physicist. And one of the things that I actually found very interesting in being part of it is like, you know, a lot of things we were talking about in terms of like, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals in terms of solving very mundane chemistry problem or very mundane uh, neuro, uh, neuroscientific problems, right? Using quantum systems um, for them. One the question that emerges again and again is that how will you port a biological system into a quantum computing system? And how would that have to change the way they think about biological systems in the process of doing so? And how would that also change the way they do biology experiments? And there's this idea that, for instance, molecular biology potentially will benefit the most from you know, the rise of quantum computer well, quantum systems for now, because uh, no one is actually using a quantum computer at this point. The rise of quantum systems in terms of how you know some of the um some like how can how they're able to sort of unpack 
the, the foundations of their field because at this point, they're still pretty much operating at massive scale. So how do they go from the massive scale to the kind of macro scale? And in the process, like how much, for instance, quantum mechanics would they have to know to be able to do what they need to do, right? And how would that knowledge itself help them improve the way, for instance, if they're calculating new drugs, for instance, or change the way in which you will assess for instance, the quality of those, uh, the chemicals, you know, the combinatorics that go into the uh, development of those drugs. So that's the other area of operation. And now I want to actually also talk about the next stage of interoperation or interoperability, which is the policy question, right? So what kind of language, right? And I also think about language in kind of like multiple sense, in multiple ways. So we talk about programming language, I think because there's so many uh, people with that sort of background here. Programming language, if you look at you know, this either Q language, Quipper, uh, quantum computing, uh, code, quantum programming language, uh, how is it supposed to be different from any existing language that's out there? Right now we use Python for a lot of things and Python works across you know, different technologies. And we also think in terms of um, language, in terms of just now, there was this idea of word selection and terminologies to use. So in trying to find the most suitable and most friendly version or less uh, confusing version, so what sort of messaging are we actually also presenting to whoever we are targeting those particular language to, right? And then what kind of conception and what kind of uh, idea are we kind of like creating or the imaginary that we're kind of creating by that choice of the language. Knowing full well as well that, you know, now we're talking a lot about the English language, but actually when it translates across different languages, particularly non-European languages, it gets even messier and a lot more com complex as well. So, and the final thing for this part I want to talk about is also to think about, you know, the idea of um, the idea of probabilistic way of thinking and how potentially that could operate beyond the threshold of you know the technical aspects of quantum computing and how that can also kind of infiltrate into the way in which we think about how technology interacts with society. For instance, because there's always this idea, oh, you know, if you kind of escape from the quantum level, right, we are not, we are immune to so-called the quantum rules. So it doesn't really matter once you are kind of at this macro classical world. But I would actually like back to differ in that because there's obviously a lot of probabilistic aspect when we think about risk management, when we think about, you know, how do we decide what security means in this instance, whether it's AI, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's nuclear or whatever new emerging technology that comes up after quantum technology that we have not even considered at this point. And I think I would actually suggest, I mean, we, there's a lot of bad attempts at science fiction out there. I know Black Mirror is a good example that we actually brought up, but bad representation of science aside, I think what is more important to, is look at what science fiction is trying to convey in its message. Even it may not necessarily portray the science accurately, but what sort of sentiments is actually sending across. Also, what kind of, not just sometimes, because science fiction is not just written by, you know, the lay person who just wanted to use science as a metaphor, as a plot point, or as a uh, protagonist for the story, but sometimes they're also kind of re written by scientists who themselves are also grappling with great areas in their work which they cannot articulate in their professional lives, right? And actually, that was actually one of my areas of my research when I was doing my PhD, where I spent countless hours going through, you know, published and non-published manuscripts. Actually, I remember reading this poem written by one of the very early quantum physicists, uh, the, the, who were actually, who I can't remember his name, he's actually a peer of Schrodinger and Heisenberg, right? Where they were, this was around the period between the second and the first, First and Second World War, and he actually wrote a little ditty, like sort of like a little poem, where he was actually talking about, you know, the quantum world, right, in relation to kind of like um, the everyday regular world. Unfortunately, I don't have access to it, and it's also not published. It was actually one of the papers that I actually found in the archives of quantum physics that was collect collected by John Hilburn and uh, Thomas Kuhn. So, so yeah. 
So, so yeah, so these are some of the main stuff that I actually want to talk about. I mean, there are other things, but I think that can come later. Yes. Thank you. So, Marisa, let's hear about you, hear from you. Um, so let me give you a perspective, someone that listens to you from the outside. I love Black Mirror, by the way. Imagine that this is an episode of Black Mirror. We talk about understanding and languages and narratives. Let's imagine a narrative that this is a Black Mirror episode. I have the best experts in the world in the topic. I am a person and I'm going to advocate for what people see when they see you, the experts. First, we have a narrative in, in the last decades of the so-called uh, uh, separation between people in these groups. The narrative is always very patronizing. The public. It's like science, the scientists, separate now themselves from civil society and public, they are a different entity. So being raised among religion, sometimes I cannot uh, 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 lack the, 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 the laugh of thinking that I am in a service, in a religious service that someone is preaching to me from here to here. So that makes me see a group of people that are now the erudites of society. And if, uh, uh, as my colleague that is in the panel loves sci-fi and movies, I am a big lover of all the human creations. I always imagine that movie Divergent, where the society had this amazing people that thought they, the erudites, should determine what everybody else should do or not do because they were the erudites. So when this panel, when I look to this panel question and from my humanity side and being a lawyer um, myself, um, I question the question, can we understand each other or do we want to understand each other? I don't think sometimes we do want to understand each other. And I'm going to give you my proposition of thought. To understand, we need to communicate. To communicate, we need to interact and engage, meaning it's a mental fencing of going back and forward of ideas and arguments. Not only what we can advocate, but what we can do prove, but there's many things we cannot prove and we cannot reach for the research. There's a part of the human existence that is not researchable and is the matters of also our own human nature. The field of humanities that focused for centuries in thought and pure so thought. The last time I checked, Socrates did not have a PhD, neither Leonardo da Vinci, neither many of the great minds that didn't even went to academic fields and they were pretty much big genius in their fields. So the question moving forwards in quantum or any emerging technology is also in the communication either the communication in languages, being myself, for example, native Portuguese, speaking English, understanding the lost in translation that many of us have, but also the multidisciplinary situations that we need in order to create policies, regulations, and uh, uh, the management of the fields that we have either in the industry or the commerce. But hearing everybody, and if this would be, again, a Black Mirror episode, I invite you to think, when was the last time that you saw a serious debate where we would be as humans mental fencing each other with arguments that you, we would provide ethically and morally because we are not here to destroy anybody. We are, we are here in order to debate, to grow and to go to a place where humans, hopefully much more enlightened, can have a life 
where they are pretty much equal also in thoughts and in the way that they are respected for their thoughts, no matter what they have. I see lately this idea that also an opinion can never be invoked as an opinion unless it has, as I said, some form as measurement. I'm not the first and I'm not going to be the last saying that we have now an obsession of measuring everything and everything. Is this the society we have when we know that human nature is not only made by science? We know that for centuries we talk about soul and spirits and consciousness. And when we talk about good or responsible, we are in the field, again, of virtues, principles. Do we want the general public to know more about technologies? Yes, but don't we know also that the scientific community knows very much the ABC of their own humanities and the principles that guided us for centuries in order to obtain a so-called civil society where we are in principle free in a democratic system in the place we are talking now. And how can we move forward if every time we are in a table, we need to invoke, almost sometimes, unfortunately, as the producers of what others said, in this copy-paste of an endless thought, and forget that we are in the ex novo world, where everything needs to be think for the first time or rethink what we did till now. So how can we, I question, do say that we want to understand if the narratives that we put in the table are con constantly diminishing the way we see other people? And how can we, in fact, have conversations and debates and not lectures or imposing a so-called expertise because someone said so. And I give you an example. I saw it recently that a very, very prominent uh, um, academic researcher was put in, 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 in a bad, bad place because someone had the nerve to go and see all the research that the, that person in particular and other colleagues did. And the data was not correct. So also as we move forward, how can we really also honestly say that we want to communicate with people that say, I did something, therefore you need to believe. The era of dogmas should have ended when, as Nietzsche said very well, we killed God. Are we inventing new gods? As, as I hear also scientists saying that they are inventing things, I'm much more concerned about the meaning of what we are inventing. And the so-called mundane activities are our activities as humans, as I am, as anybody in this room is. We are not different from it, any of uh, others. We are going home today, we're going to sleep in a bed, and before we're going to have a meal, hopefully, because we have our needs. So as quantum or AI or any emergent technology comes, what we should as humans is also to have the capacity of talk with each other in that sense and start having uncomfortable conversations of the structures that we did build in the last decades of thought itself. Science without humanities is nothing. Humanities with, without science is also nothing. As the alchemist should, used to say, what is above is also below. So this is one side of the same coin. And this is something that we need to keep bringing into the tables where we are and promote conversations and promote debates. Because we will not, or, or else, of course, we, we, we can go to the other episode side where this becomes the new religions and people talk for themselves about their own uh, 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 views of the world and everybody's in a room because they are in that room and others are in others. 
Is this human progress? And as we move forward, where all the information and knowledge will be accessed to us so easily in a world that I would have a chip in my own brain that I can download all the researchers done by all the experts in the table, what is going to be our role as well? So responsible or good means that we move forward with the courage to bring people to the, to, to the table, that we don't diminish them because we think they are the public. We all are the public. We are the agents of what we are creating all by action or omission. So my question to you is, if you go to other fields, and sit in other conferences and people treated you like you are less because you cannot understand a few equations or algorithms, would you want to communicate with them? And the second, what are the tables that you are promoting conversations and debates? Do you see a lot? And I would like to end up with my favorite topic, literacy. In an event of quantum, I said the sentence is never too early to engage with knowledge. I keep saying that is exactly the same. We need to break knowledge in a way that people can understand with metaphors, with visuals, every bit of the ability that we have to communicate. As I said, in quantum, for example, I now, everybody that I know, I say, go and see the Black Mirror episode of Salma Hayek destroying a quantum computer uh, uh, in, in a total surreal uh, future. But those images will allow us to communicate with each other, not because they are true, but because they give us significance and they give us images and it's how humans also communicate. So can we or do we want to communicate? is my question for all of you. Well, thank you, Marisa. So now, all of our panelists showed their hands. And if you're playing poker, it's your turn to show your hands and, you know, start disagreeing with them or asking questions or grilling them and they will respond or maybe you want to Say you want to say beautiful stuff regarding their arguments, but I'm hoping some pushback. Uh, I love tension. So, Kerry, please let's start with you. No, I, I want to use Talk. this because I feel like I'm I'm using a Hobbitzer cannon. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you communicate? in the face of something that's just clearly a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> that's my question. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to fight against something that's just clearly wrong? Uh, you, you're saying everybody go see the Black Mirror episode. Not gonna lie, I haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> don't really feel like wanting to throw myself off the cliff this summer. I'll save that for the cold, dark British winter. Um, but like, you say everybody go see the Black Mirror episode and then we have a, like a common base on which to start. But like, that's not a useful common base. That's like, that's like me telling somebody to go watch Spectral and then they know something about Cold Atoms. Um, which if you haven't seen that movie, it's apparently Cold Atom Creatures. Like, our um, I watched it recently it was about, I died a little bit inside. But like, I mean, like, how do you... How do you communicate with somebody who quite literally is just coming at you like, oh, the technology you're working on is like, they, they completely misunderstand it. Um, and they, or alternatively, they think that they, because they saw a video on YouTube or a 50 minute Black Mirror episode, they know as much about something as I do, having spent, I don't know, my entire adult life working on the project. Um, in, in some various shape or form. Like, 
I know this sounds really, really condescending because it is, um, but like there, there has to be a point of like, like I, I listen to people that know more about certain things than I do because they know more about certain things than I do. Like I don't claim to be an expert in, I just to bring it back, like vaccines because I'm not, but I do know a couple of things about quantum mechanics. A few. And so like I, I I think that there's a balance between like between sort of striking the like the need to educate and the need to speak a common language. And like both like a physical language, English versus you know, whatever. Um, but like also the need to, to actually like avoid jargon and get around using jargon. And like, you know, if you need jargon to explain what you're talking about, you really truly don't understand it. But like, if I'm talking to somebody that's in my field, I'm gonna use jargon because it's a heck of a lot easier than like explaining how one laser tools an atom every time I wanna mention laser tooling of atoms. Like, like jargon has its place. And like, I, I agree that there's like, and I also agree that like talking down to the public isn't super useful, but like, should our should our point of commonality be Ant Man and Quantum World? Like, I don't necessarily think that's a useful point of commonality. I'd rather commonality be like somebody. Like, I'd rather a point of commonality be I don't know anything else but that. To be perfectly honest. Okay. Thank you. This reminded me of a caricature. Is this the react? <laughs> sorry. Is this to react or because I, I'm sorry, it's it's very hard for me to 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 listen uh, the 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 sound of the the room, but I was trying to take some some notes. So, is is it to react or are you going to continue? I ask. Uh, I think it's to react for anyone to react. Uh... Of course, I want to react to a person that said uh, in an open room in a conference that the uh, <laughs> the, the BS words, I think it's uh, first very good because I, I started my um, um, exercise as an exercise, if I would uh, uh, remind you all. I said, imagine, right? So I didn't give you anything besides an exercise of imagination, and I'm pretty happy to see this first reaction. The first reaction shows me, if you study communication among humans, that humans, in order to communicate and find common grounds, cannot be in a defensive situation. And feel attacked by someone shows that you were perceiving as an attack. I didn't attack you at all. The second also that I think is very a condescendence is not understanding what others know. Assuming that we know a lot because we work so many years, we bring the years, of course, because years uh, uh, are a measure of knowledgeable uh, people, and also diminishing immediately the knowledge that others could have. That, for example, they could uh, had research all their lives areas that they don't have um, uh, again um, courses or something, but they they are passionate about, for example. Uh, maybe in this room you have a lot of people that love poetry and they don't have a, a master degree or PhD or anything, but they know they devote a big part of their lives to, to, to know all they can about their favorite poets and the poetries they love. So for me, as a, a, a social experiment, this reaction is already a illustration of difficulties that, for example, in rooms where we're trying to do policies, and regulations we face because people feel attacked instead of having a, an open mind and thinking, well, nobody is saying anything. Maybe I'm perceiving it wrong. How can we move forward as humans and communicate if you also say that, oh, I prefer that the communality will be A and B and C. Commonality is not preference. Of course, I would also prefer the commonalities to be many others. And in different tables, I have different common uh, points. If I'm talking from my expertise in legal, 
and the topics of privacy and cybersecurity, of course, I also use jargon of my of my uh, field. That is not in the question. The question is, what narrative do we want to build as humans? Do we want to build a narrative we where we feel equals and capable to think in any table and be able to learn with each other? Therefore, having the care to find ways to explain. And I give you an example. This morning, I gave a class in a summer school on digital platforms for legal uh, um, use. I had uh, uh, young students. Many of them never enter a, a room, a, a, a law firm. So my, my sole concern was to nurture their curiosity to go and try to find more for themselves, but also to find as much illustrations possible for them to understand something that for them theoretically would be difficult to grasp at least fully. So that is my proposition. But as I said, I think it's it's quite uh, uh, on itself worthy to see how easy we get um, defensive and how unused it's so unusual for us to have different ways of talking with different uh, people that that we have that. And if you felt that way, I feel uh, uh, that is uh, not positive for you. And as I said, this was an exercise. And, and, and for that, I think I already understood a lot as well. And I love to be in these areas of quantum because I do, I am very passionate in hearing physics talking about their fields and learning every day. Thank you, Marisa. So anyone else who would like to continue or we have jump a new topic? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, we have 10 minutes, so we can squeeze in a little bit more. New questions? You're moving, so you're on my radar now. Don't <laughs> <laughs> But isn't then the, the problem, after all, that science is not sincere in communicating what they are doing and what they want? Maybe they have to lie a little bit in the proposal for the grant. They're not exactly saying what they're doing. Maybe they keep the secret in front of the other side is that they don't get the same idea. Maybe maybe we can get you somewhere closer because we might yes. have to get that. So it's about... I think that that's what I got a little bit out of the law from Marisa, that there is a lack of sincerity in the communication between science and uh, everybody else, or that this kind of division, so they have to lie for the proposal. They say, ah, it's my curiosity to lie to themselves, maybe that it's not like useful for military uses or other purposes that they are more like geopolitical. That uh, um, governments have to lie. No, we have to do this. Maybe we solve all the, the food problem. But in case it's they're just afraid of that China maybe gets the first there that we have up in billions that we get that we have the, the disadvantage of our. So there's like this continu continuity of lying to oneself and to all the others just to pursue this uh, scientific budget, especially when it comes to this high-end scientific uh, endeavors. It's not about like, how can we, you know, like uh, make a better car that's better for the environment and, and really fits the need because you're just like 80 kilo person. You don't need a, like a ton car. You know, it's not like solving this kind of problem, but the, you know, the problem that brings uh, uh, societies ahead in front of other societies. And I think there's a constant insincerity. Yeah. Okay, that, that's a piece of work. And maybe think, could we address that actually? Uh, one minute, Marisa. Wenzel was going to attend, Natasha was there too. So, yeah, uh, I, I would like to pick up uh, what Günther said regarding the lie. I think the lying is not so much with the scientists, but it's rather with the sci fi author. And here I'm uh, taking Ursula Le Guin, who said the sci fi author is the biggest liar because, or he or she is the biggest liar. Because they are telling you stories and they're telling you that those stories will become a future. And I think when 
referring to science fiction to have a serious discussion on technology X, for example, quantum technology, we have the problem that we think just because the author used the term quantum technology that it has something to do with actual quantum technology. And we ignore that science fiction is a piece of art, and you mentioned that earlier, authors use technology to make a statement and use them as a metaphor. William Gibson and Neuromancer use the whole idea of uh, uh, neurochips and neurointerface as a metaphor to criticize uh, capitalistic systems, but it has nothing to do with the actual technology. So I think when having an, a debate on whether or not we want technology on an eye level, sorry to say, we have to first do something like a media literacy ground course <laughs> to make and here I'm referring to the stereotypical, very, very stupid citizen, whoever that might be, I've never met him, but you know, he's in the room somewhere, uh, to this person that reads sci-fi and thinks, oh, that's the actual future. And you know, it's not the future, it's just a depiction of the future. No. That person was me, so Natasha, let's hear from you. If you can come closer a little bit. So, um, slight, slight change of, of focus, um, but Rebecca, I really liked your point about um, not being speculative about public perception of, of quantum technologies and making sure that we're actually speaking out um, what, what the public's, I'm using plural, because uh, acknowledge the point that, you know, the public isn't this uniform blob, and I think it's a really good point. We don't want to separate ourselves from society. We are all part of society. Um, but specifically, I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts on the Cantar public dialogues and whether you think that there's been an evolution um, since then and how you think that public perception might have changed and how kind of narratives have fed into that. Okay. Last and first out. So let's start with Rebecca. Thank you for the question, Tisha. Um, I think uh, it's important that we, we we do seek out empirical studies of um, you know society's views. Um, as a social scientist, as a sociologist, my um, training was very much um, embedded uh, in empirical ways of knowing. So I'm always going to look at measuring things in one way or another. Um, since the current dialogue report, it's not a very long report. Like there's not really a lot in there. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's sort of hard to say, but just from my own um, perspective, given there hasn't been any more research that I could compare it to, um, I don't think it would have um, progressed much further. I can't think of anything that's been significant in, in Australia, at least, um, that would have sort of caught the public's interest. Um, you know, like chat, it hasn't been something like chat G, G2P, for example, in the quantum sort of world to um, increase public uh, interest or knowledge ab about that. Um, but in having this discussion with some of my colleagues about whether we need to do some more research on this, one of them said to me that the impact of quantum computing on the public is still quite a long way. And initially, first, it will be like the finance sector, for example, um, that will be most impacted. And so we should put our, our attention to, to those parts of society first before going to the public. But I've decided to do both. So I'm doing it. I, I forgot to put it up in my presentation this morning. I, there is going to be a, a brief survey also on perceptions of um, quantum technologies from different sections of society. So yeah, thank you. That's a good question though. And um, I sincerely hope that there is some more research because I do believe having a dialogue between meaningful dialogue between science and society is really important um, because, uh, yeah, that's what, as I said earlier, that ethical and responsible, et cetera. 
Thank you. Probably I'll speak more on the political dimension of science and technology policy from the perspective of someone who comes from Southeast Asia, right? Where the idea of deliberate, deliberative uh, policy making is pretty still a pretty alien concept, and where a lot of policies tend to be top down. And recently, I've been actually observing, you know, policies with, I mean, there's no policies with the QT at this point coming out from that region. You know, I would say that in terms of Asia, um, probably China and India, actually for Southeast Asia, is more of China that's actually kind of like driving the discourse around it. And it's because China is also the same superpower that was also driving this cost around AI as well. So there's this idea about creating this indigenous AI or the Southeast Asian AI, right? And this is pretty much what they conceived AI as representing that it actually has a sort of like an identity. I mean, the technology uh, and the technical aspects of it aside, right? And a lot of this writing actually do not necessarily come from the, the scientists on the ground. Uh, or the engineers, they normally come from uh, security experts who are trained in IR and political science who decided that they had to have something to say about science and technology despite not really having really anything very concrete to say about science and technology due to the fact that they have not sufficiently actually engaged with um, scientists or uh, engineers or anyone within the STEM spectrum. So that's one thing. And also another thing in terms of deciding what kind of science to support versus not is always, I think someone brought up the idea of how maybe application, you know, knowing how things are applied is the way to go. And unfortunately, I've seen the consequence of this actually on many developing countries, including my country, for several decades, because the policy that originated actually from um, international uh, aid um, organizations, which is this idea that you know, science is for development. So this whole idea of science and technologies is centered around a very problematic development-based discourse. And the idea of development is that you don't actually have to be driven by curiosity, whatever the idea of curiosity means. You don't have to be driven by you know, the understanding the black box of all things. So they're probably worried you know, somebody may actually figure out how to create the next nuclear weapon in your garage or whatever, right? So the idea is that we hand you the technology, you play around with it, you tinker around with it, you apply it to whatever it is necessary for industry. And that actually has been kind of, unfortunately, that's the prevailing discourse that actually also shape um, R&D in universities as well as the institute, um, in research institutions as well. So, and therefore, because of that, like, you know, when talking about QT, I mean, they are obviously physicists and also some computer scientists, less of engineers at this point, unfortunately, who are kind of like very interested and still very much a theoretical endeavor at this point, but they have very little to say, you know, about you know, the, the development of the field or within their own country or their own region. And a lot of times they're also very dependent on support, both in terms of funding, infrastructures, and even expertise on uh, foreign scientists that come from us, where we, I can use Singapore being the most developed Asian, sorry, most developed Southeast Asian country on par with uh, East Asian, um, the East Asian countries who actually imported a lot of their know-how in quantum tech into the country. And then the entire research around that is shaped by the people who come in, who then leave mm -hmm. after that. Yeah. And that's that. I, I really thank you for making that point. I think it's really, really important. And it's one point that I think also would be, and I'm speaking very much uh, from my personal point of view, not so much from my institutional point of view here, yeah that kind of also when we're thinking of kind of technology as a, and also tech ethics, to what extent of being sort of a neo-colonial project. And I think this is kind of something, uh, you know, coming in late, but I think that we're not falling out now. Um, and especially, I mean, we're seeing that in the AI space where we have like this, the presumption of like universal values. And I guess, of course, everything, everyone will want to have transparency and we're not reflecting that transparency means A, means tons of different things and be that that culture of transparency is not valued in the same way that it might be, say, in Germany. So I think I really want to sort of say, I think this is a hugely important point. Um, and then also um, initiatives like 
we were mentioning earlier, like the Open Quantum Institute with Jester, who are working with um uh internet actually they're working with UN organizations. So like in uh you know by inference also then with uh development organizations. And I think it would be really, really, really important to make your point, kind of emphasize your point across that uh region as well, because there is a I think there's an initiative to reach out to other countries um, and ask them, you know, what are your actual needs with quantum technologies, rather than sort of the, the developed countries or the West or whatever you want to say, defining you here, this is what you should be doing with quantum technologies, um, and ask them for the needs. So I really get yeah, to say that was a very important thing that doesn't get mentioned often enough uh, at the moment. Okay, so I, I need to intervene and we need to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, thanks to our panelists, thanks to our other thanks to all of you. Thank you. And now we will be going to dinner, which is like five to ten minutes of walk uh, from here, but you already have the address. Uh, we will be there at seven. And tomorrow we will start at night. So uh, it's entirely up to you if you want to join after dinner. But if you do, I believe it is free. So I invite you to go. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you so much for uh, for and enjoy your dinner all. Uh, and tomorrow I will try to see if I can listen a little bit. Enjoy your program. Enjoy your night. Um, thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.